Welcome in to yet another edition of Inside Carolina Signing Day Live. It is Wednesday, December 20th at 7 a.m. Live from the Man Tower. Great view of the sunset. Yeah, we're going to turn this light off in a second. We are uh, a little chilly. <laughs> Sun's still up, but we are here with you all day. Well, most of the day as North Carolina's letters of intent come rolling in. If you're in the chat... Let us know what you see, what you hear. Um, you know, the audio is not great. We'll do our best to get it great. Well, let video. us let us know what the audio what the audio is like. Tommy's paranoid. Yeah, I I, uh, I tend to like perfection, as do the people that watch and employ us. So we're about to have a cat walk through, but it's going to be that kind of day here in the Man Tower. Don, um, obviously, some news came out yesterday. We'll go ahead and get this one out of the way. North Carolina's 27-man class is now 26. We're 20, yeah. I'm trying to think, because we've made a couple of different, there was an addition and then a subtraction yesterday, Tuesday. Right. Poor, or a so JUCO addition. JUCO addition, and then, which counts towards this class. So are we at, I'm so going. So it's 27 now total. Yeah, so it's 27 total. So, of course, Weddington's Keenan Jackson. That's what you're getting at. Yes. Decommits, goes to um, school down the road in West Raleigh. Um, good luck to the young man. He, he certainly um, made his choice, and we'll see how that works out. Um, Tyran Stewart, mm -hmm. junior college commitment out of East Mississippi. Shout out, last chance you, um, which I think is hilarious. But he is a young man that will come to North Carolina and help in that DB room. Don, just give us a little bit of an overview about what to expect for the day. We've got folks in here already, and, and shout out to the people that come hang out with us. I mean, that's some dedication to be in a YouTube live chat on Inside Carolina at 7 o'clock in the morning, so we appreciate everybody that's here. Um, dip in and out, ask questions in the chat. We'll get to them as much as possible. Greg Barnes will join us in a little bit. With Bojangles. He, is he bringing Bojangles? Well, he... he he was tasked to bring Brody. Well, he sent a text asking for our order, and I was working on that, and then we went on air, so I never finished my. So my I order. have. Uh, I want ham, egg, and cheese. Okay. All right. Um, I do not like Bojangles chicken anymore. Um, Preston from Greensboro is asking where the Bojangles is. Well, Greg Barnes will bring a bag of it. We uh, we um, door dashed it or Uber Eats it last yeah. last year, and uh, they had it on the doorstep. But Greg will bring that in. Greg will bring in his insight and expertise <laughs> with. Uh, you know, everything he does with Inside Carolina and just his knowledge overall. Um, so expect a um, full allotment of recruiting discussions. We will go by each individual player one by one as they come in. We will put them up on the chat. Shout out to Johnny T-Shirt and Congruity, of course, our sponsors at Inside Carolina. And again, shout out to the things, uh, to uh, to everybody that's in here. Don, let me ask you a question. Okay. Um, you cover this recruiting stuff. And people think when the season ends that everything slows down at Inside Carolina. No, um, just not. just sort of detail your days here. Uh, you know, over the last month or so, I, it's it's a constant. Well, so the two times a year that are the busiest for me, June, because that's when all the official visits take place, and there's camps going on, and uh, there's unofficial visits during the week. And then this, I guess, first half of December is absolutely nuts because December 4th is when the transfer portal opens up. And you're, just, you're also tying loose ends for the high school class, which formally signs today, December 20th. So these past couple weeks have been absolutely nuts. Now, the focus really is on the transfer portal, which – Every day things are changing, but as we saw yesterday with the Keenan Jackson situation, I think we should wait for Greg to get here before we dive deep into that because I want to get his take on certain things. But um, just to kind of lay out just how crazy things are and how things change, the middle, you know, there's, there's been some rumblings about Keenan Jackson potentially flipping, uh, but they didn't seem like they were actually going to go anywhere for a while. And then really, you know, I talked to a bunch of people in the middle of the day, and it seemed like a dead issue. And then it just all of a sudden, I got a tip where 
it was it was done deal. It was going to happen. He was going to decommit from UNC on um, Tuesday night and then sign with NC State today. You know, and I know people kind of jump on certain people because they reported that nothing was going to happen, that it was dead. But at, at one point, it was dead. And um, but that just kind of speaks to just the minute by minute, hour by hour, how things drastically changed during this time frame. And really, you know, I kind of sat back when it happened. I was a little, little frustrated because it, it altered our our plans for today and for yesterday. But it was reminiscent of old signing day. Mm -hmm. I mean, did you get that feeling? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, back in the day, we used to do the, the bash and the signing day thing with Inside Carolina. And I remember, if my memory serves, and I can't remember the year, but you're waiting to the last minute for news to break yeah. and all that kind of stuff. And I remember, I think, Quinshot Davis committed to Carolina during the show, so everybody yeah. was happy. So, you know, it's just – it's a different age. Um, but, yeah, it's always nice to have a little bit of excitement. By the way, what's your cat's name? A gritty. Gritty the cat. Do we – is if he's but he's very 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 friendly. My other one hides. He so, so Don um, wanted to know that I want to. Uh, Do you want me to stay in the area? <laughs> and uh, I said I can't sleep in the house with the cats walking around everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Do who if he bothers I, it you? It doesn't bother me. Does he bother folks? I'm a dog person by the, by the way. But it, anyway, so here's my theory with decommitments and guys that never show up and all that. Worry about what you do have. Yeah. Not yeah. about what you don't. And I think for North Carolina, especially on in the skill position, mm -hmm. they'll be fine. Well, yeah, and we have some things coming up later today content-wise that kind of lays this out that this really – if you're just looking at this in a vacuum as far as just what North Carolina's positional needs were for this class, and I'm talking – you know, it, it's hard to kind of look at it because we have the, the um, you know, the hindsight of knowing who's going to en enter the portal and all that, but really, a year ago, if you were going to say what was North Carolina losing, you would expect Tez Walker. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, you there was no one else that you thought you were going to lose other than just the typical attrition. So, with with that information, you said, okay, let's sign a class. I would think of two. Why receivers? Well, at one point they had four committed, mm -hmm. and the reason why they made that ch that change is they looked at the in-state class. They saw, and this gets all laid out later on in, in, in a piece of content we have coming out this afternoon. That um, <laughs> that it is one of the it is the deepest, but just about any measure the deepest in-state class of wide receivers that the Tar Heel State has has probably had ever. You know, we could only really truly look back to the, um, the what we call the internet error, which is basically right. the, the uh, 2000s. And so UNC made a call and said, hey, let's let's go all in on this. And then in addition to that, I mean, a lot of those guys, North Carolina had a really good shot with. Even the guys that they, they didn't end up getting, there's a, there a few of them, I'm sure, if North Carolina pushed a little bit harder, they could have got. So they got the four that they liked. One of them, the, the lowest ranked of the four, ends up going to NC State. And so – it is what it is with that, and I think from a roster standpoint, this is, you know, this is not going to impact things at all. Yeah, a couple things there, and, and um, Emily in the chat asked where you can get the Team Zero Double Zero hat. That, of course, is for Eric Montrose. Back when Eric was diagnosed, they they ran a uh, they had a fundraiser deal where you could order these hats, and of course, I ordered one. Cancer's been a big deal in my family, big deal everywhere. And, of course, with Eric passing, I wanted to put it front and center. Um, on this show, last year we had Carolina football helmets. It seems more relevant to have um, Eric Montrose. This cat is going to bite something. He's not going to bite, I promise you. Have y'all seen it. Christmas Vacation where the thing is a squirrel gets nuked? So he the won't, he tree? won't, he won't <laughs> bite you, I promise you. So, um, Emily, I'm not 100% sure if they're still available. It's something I got back in March, April. Um, when it was, uh, you know, after Eric was diagnosed. But, yeah, it's definitely uh, something that's been on every Carolina fan and every human being's mind um, since Eric passed this weekend. But, but uh, yeah, so that's that. Um, but, Don, as far as the talent level, 
you mentioned the, the high level number of receivers and of course number number one North Carolina ha has been a school that has gotten that talent level in the wide receiver room but the interesting thing and you mentioned just a second ago you mentioned about Tez Walker I mean Tez Walker the belief was that he was coming back yeah I'm until talking the about very end. I'm it, talking about if we were looking a year ago. Yeah, okay. A year ago, and if you're thinking, okay, and you're trying to project and you're looking at North Carolina's depth chart, and you're saying, okay, Tez is coming in. He's going to have a great year with Drake May, a full season with Drake May. And then you expect him to be gone. And, and sure. then his, yeah, his, direct, his draft stock will be so high, he's not going to want to come back because that was his plan. But everybody else, you expected to come back. Now, you know, Andre Green and also uh, uh, Tyson Chapman, um, they left. Uh, through the portal, um, but you know, I guess you can kind of classify that as normal attrition. Yeah. Were you surprised by wh what either one of those guys? Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, a little bit. I mean, so with with Green, you could sense that there was a little bit of frustration, but um, you know, I, it's just so hard. I mean, I I don't know. I'm not on. I'm not on the beat with like you guys. Right. You're going to practices and seeing what I'm sure you can probably pick up a lot on the sidelines and everything like that. Yeah, I feel like Chapman, and you can kind of correct me on this. I mean, wasn't he kind of playing a lot better during? He got some opportunities yeah, later in the later season. Later in the and season, of course. He, uh, I believe it was a George. Are State you cold, game. by the way? It's always cold. Okay, let um, me go. But no, fix it's this. A, leave it. This no, is no, no, I feel this is a lot. Are you cold? I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little cold, which I typically. So it gets really hot up here. <laughs> I, I, th the heat usually doesn't come on up here because, yes, hot air rises. And then I think this is they did a really good job of insulating up here. Way. And so it just kind of holds the heat. So usually I have to crack the windows even when it's 30-something degrees outside. Yeah, I'm fine but, with it. Uh, but I, you maybe know, when because you of where I'm sitting, it's like blowing right at me. So I'm going to fix that real quick. Well, you have, you know, when you've got like 400 inches worth of TVs, they put off heat and uh, – We've got them all on. So we've got one, two, three big screens. We've got three computer screens. Greg will bring another one. We've got a coffee maker going, refrigerator. So I'm surprised it's not hotter in here. But, uh, yeah, it's just a, a cold morning in North Carolina. And, and but, but back to Chapman and Andre Green. I mean, guys want to play. Mm -hmm. a and, of course, the transfer portal is you can move around freely now. And, and everybody that follows this stuff follows the – the um, lawsuit and the injunction or, or whatever you want to call it with the NCAA that basically granted free-for-all yeah. um, with the portal and the NCAA. And Greg Barnes wrote a great article on the restitution rule um, being really non-existent anymore. Restitution rule um, with the NCAA, if folks are not familiar, is where if, say, you get a injunction or a restraining order or something and you uh, – you play a – you're allowed to play at the moment an ele ineligible player. In this case, well, a transfer, a two-time transfer. Well, do we want to save that for I – mean, we're going to have the man here. I'm going to talk to him about it, but I'm teasing the chef. Oh, all right. Well, I'm just making Don sure. Don is uh, – well, well I, we also have a letter of intent in. Uh, we do? Well, let's get to that because that's yeah. why we are here. Well, that's Who's why I was first? trying to – I was trying to – so it's Ashton Woods. Ashton Woods, the first So letter of intent. If Let you – there is a we have a running thing going right here, but so Ashton Woods, linebacker from Walton High School, Marietta, Georgia, basically that greater Atlanta area that just constantly produces talent at a, a extremely high level. He was leading tackler for a defense that just seemed unstoppable until it loss in the state championship game and he was I mean he was getting double digit tackles and just playing a, a half of football because they would pull him because they, they would be blowing teams out but he's also the, the the there's a couple of cool elements to him so his brother is um Blaylock is the I'm going a blank on his um first name plays for Georgia Tech played for Dominic Dominic Blaylock um, played for Georgia Tech this past season, started his season, started his career at Georgia, was a big time recruit. That's his half brother. And um and then the other thing too is that Ashton is young for his grade. Mm -hmm. So um if you talk to people around him, they'll just say just how much 
he has developed, how quickly he's developed, you know, the um, you know just the last couple of years, and how the expectation is for him to develop even more than most, just because of the fact that he's so young for his for his uh, grade. For his, which that contrasts a lot of times. You see guys that are much older for the grade, yeah, because parents will hold kids yeah, back they'll in do the kindergarten yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So Ashton Woods, linebacker, six three, two ten. You know, that's me. I wonder. Uh, I wonder if he can bench as much as I can. A three-star linebacker, high three-star linebacker out of Georgia. Um, just before we get into all this, briefly talk about the importance of Georgia to North Carolina recruiting as we go, because it seems to me like Georgia has really overtaken Virginia as an important pipeline. Yeah, yeah, and I think really that that truly started during Fedora. Uh, it's just. You know, that well, it's really it's just that greater Atlanta area. You know, it's just it has developed so much through the past few years. Through, in the, they put a lot of money into not just the high school level, but you know the the lower levels of football. There, there's a lot of really well known trainers in that area. They have uh, at least two well known national seven on seven teams, which makes a huge difference with development. The DBs, which we'll get into, because there's a few of them f in this class in, uh, from that area. They are they they come out and they're as polished as as possible. We saw Josh Downs is a, was a product of that area. I mean, he was as turnkey as you can expect. If 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 it wasn't for the depth chart being so plugged at the wide receiver position when Downs came in as a true freshman, there's no doubt in my mind that he would have he would have played. But um, and that just kind of just speaks to just that area and I think for North Carolina obviously the SEC Georgia in particular and then also Clemson they're, they're hitting up that area pretty heavily but there is so much talent there that you can land guys like Ashton Woods and be you know and, and, and put together a pretty good football team and this is this is a very good football player so Ashton Woods number one in here you're listening to the Inside Carolina Live Signing Day show, December 20th, National Signing Day across the country. Um, it's sort of a it, – it's gotten to be a forgotten thing, but we, as we talked about earlier, if you're joining us late, that with the news of yesterday and some of the late commitments and all that kind of stuff, it is a little bit more hype this year. Um, Mac Brown certainly likes to have his class pretty much solidly filled. Mm -hmm. Um it, let me ask you, and this is something we can sort of talk about over the course of the day. Is that a good thing? And does the transfer portal make that a better thing since you need to devote resources and all to the transfer portal late in this process? Um, you said about getting the class? Getting your class yeah, settled before most I of think these guys' senior year. So I, I, think it's a, I think it's a good thing because everybody else is doing it and I think that the pool of targets shrinks considerably because basically this class outside of defensive tackle mm -hmm. which they ad address with Leroy Jackson later on in the um, in the fall was committed before re really they were all committed by by the end of June they were all uh, publicly out there by the end of August and I think after that point, I mean, ev everybody's goal is to do, is to do that. Mm -hmm. So if most of the schools are reaching that goal, then it becomes um, it becomes difficult to try to pull guys later on. You're you're basically kind of going through scraps a little bit. And then the other aspect of it, you brought up the fact that um, the transfer portal. Well, it makes it so that your focus is just purely or it shouldn't be purely on uh, or exclusively on the transfer portal, but it, it allows you to, f to put a lot of attention on that transfer portal um, during the month of December because you have already met your needs for the high school class. So, and I've referenced it before, high school recruiting is a, a process, building relationships over years. I mean, we've seen guys in the 25 class offer, 26 class. These, these young fellows are getting attention and, and coaches are checking them out. The portal, on the other hand, 
um, if you discount the back channel stuff, and you can't really yeah. discount that, but it, but if we stay above board, the portal is a speed dating thing. Where is it? Yeah. You come in, here's what I've got for you. I know what you've got for me. Let me swipe right. We like each other. Let's see what happens. It's just a weird dynamic that coaches have to do. I, I know that Mac um, and, and his staff talked about how the month of December – with everything they've got going on is just nuts. What's next? Got any more? Got any more letters in? Because you need to let me yeah, know. Yeah, I I am not. It's weird because so there's only one in according to Inside Carolina and UNC is not. I, I don't know really. where. Maybe they're waiting on their budget. Oh, maybe yeah. Wait, I th I thought I saw. Okay. Oh, I see now. Okay, there isn't. There is a second one in. All right, who we got? Timmy Lawson. Tight end from Bishop Vero High School. Yeah, um, Bishop Vero. Yeah, Ver Bishop Vero High School. Let me get it on the screen. Tim Lawson, tight end from Florida. Tell us a little bit about him. There it is on the screen. Is he a pure tight end? Is he a a guy that they can? I mean, six four two twenty. He's got some good size, some good length. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I think he's a guy who can play attached. Um, you know, obviously, North Carolina is not going to bring in a whole lot of guys who can't catch the football, and that's what he's able to do. He's a guy who actually a year ago thought he was going to college exclusively for baseball. You know, he was committed to, I believe, he was committed to UCF. He was committed somewhere and then had to decommit. And um, I, around January, he started to get some serious looks for football. Picked up some offers. Uh, he picked up an offer from North Carolina during, a, I believe it was a March visit, kind of on a whim visit to Chapel Hill. Got the offer, loved the initial visit. I believe he took a second visit. And then um, in June, he actually had a full official visit schedule set up, but um, only made it to his first official visit. You know, went to North Carolina and came out of there and committed and ended his uh, recruitment. So Tim Lawson, Fort Myers, Florida, um, three-star guy, ranked in the you know, in the 900 or so in in 24/7, six four two twenty, um, like Don said, and and this is something that I I really like, is seeing guys that are able to play more than one sport. Yeah. A and when you play baseball, you've got some serious um, hand-eye coordination things like that that certainly help on the uh, deal with Lawson. Fort Myers, Florida, hotbed? Is it is it one of those hotbeds yeah, down there? Yeah, I, I would, I mean, it's, it's a good area for um, for recruiting, you know. Um, I, I mean, I wouldn't consider, it's not like Atlanta, but I mean, they definitely produce talent for sure. Um, so, so yeah, I think that's that's a good area. But I think, you know, you mentioned the, um, the dual sport thing. That's a big thing that those who do the evaluations for um, for 24/7 sports, they absolutely love guys who are dual sport athletes, and so that that certainly helped with his um, you know, helped with his ranking. Yeah, and if if North Carolina fans um, are paying attention, Caleb Cost uh -huh. done uh, with the with the cold this morning, so I hope we don't have the vid before Christmas. But uh, I was feeling <laughs> fine. And then Tommy came. I think you were the same way last time we were here. But, uh, you know, Caleb Cost, of course, a baseball player mm -hmm. um, that expects to play and, and is a fantastic base runner with a lot of speed, will, will be a big part of North Carolina's bowl game against West Virginia as he'll step in in the star role in the, in the defensive backfield. So another baseball guy, lead recruiter, Freddie Kitchens. What, and, and I know he's only been there for a year, but I could imagine – what it would be like if Freddie Kitchens came to my house. I mean, yeah. that dude's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's interesting because, you know, he has, up until recently, like zero background with recruiting. Mm -hmm. and But, you know, he does have that personality to where, you know, it, uh, he can easily kind of relate to, to recruits and, and talk to them and, and be likable and all that sort of stuff. And so he definitely hasn't been – there hasn't been any sort of issues with having him as a uh, 
as as a recruiter on staff for somebody who does who didn't have a whole lot of experience heading into his tenure. Did you have you heard? And this is not just this year, but over the course of it. I mean, Freddie Kitchens coached in the NFL, not just coached in the <laughs> NFL, was a head coach yeah. in the NFL. I mean, for me, if, if if I'm a high school kid and I'm a parent of a high school kid that's being recruited, and a man comes to my house and sits down in my house or meets with my child, and he's Coached at, head coach at the highest level, whether or not Cleveland stunk or not, is irrelevant. <laughs> I mean, how much weight does that hold with guys, Don? Well, I mean, you know how it is. I mean, you you have you know boys who played sports and all that. I don't know how much if you, training or whatever, but I mean, you you look into their backgrounds, and I mean, you don't get much more impressive than you know NFL head coach. You know what I mean? National championship coach in college. Yeah head coach in like like where's that line there like what's what's a bigger deal to these young guys i know nil probably, probably and all that, but. well if you're yeah we're, we're just going to st- stick strictly on i think the nfl stuff probably for mm-hmm. the kids i think um because quite frankly that's the goal for every one of these kids yes and i think that uh they probably have to be told you know about max uh, tenure at at Texas, because uh, most of them, what, were probably not born yet or were Let's just see. born? If you're a class of 24. If you're a class of 24, you were probably born in 2006. Yeah, mine was a my, – my youngest graduated in high school in 23, and he was born in 05. Yeah, so these guys weren't even alive for the most part when Mac won national championships. But, of course, Freddie Kitchens comes in with a – NFL pedigree, and that certainly helps on the trail. Tim Lawson dropping in. Tight end room's kind of stacked, man. Uh, I mean, obviously, guys want to play. Tim Lawson's going to have to watch a little bit this year, I'm sure. But, you know, can we talk about portal commitments? Can I can I ask you about that? Yeah. Or do we need to wait off on that since we're well, talking about tight ends? Yeah, it's because of – Do we have be- another one in? Um, that's what I'm checking because Elon Musk screwed up my life. Yeah, so so just set the scene for folks. We, uh, the sun's coming up. The sun's coming up, so we might want to turn this light off, which actually make the lighting a little bit better, I think. I don't e- yeah, it's up to you, but I don't even think it affects it. it, does, it I, I should have cut my hair before I come cut over your here. Hair. You can really see it on here. Um, y- you know, Don had – Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, and it would be up here on these screens, and in a minute a recruit popped or announced or whatever or signed, we would have a running list. Yeah. Well, then it turned into X, and they made everything not, like, help that. (laughs) So we don't have that. So Don's having to stay on his computer. Had to refresh. It's a little less, uh, what you call it, but – because it makes a whole lot of sense to take people off of the platform yeah, that you want ma- them to be on. It totally makes sense. To yeah, reduce and the it also of makes folks. sense to you have like this complete market where everybody uses the term Twitter, and it makes sense to get rid of that brand and go with something as simple and forgetful as X. But what do I know? So, folks listening to this Inside Carolina's live chat, shout out to the hundred plus folks that are in here. Some of you. Or, or trickling in as the morning goes on. We appreciate everybody stopping. Yeah, what's by. the wh- well? We did. I saw some questions. The, I've got one question here, um, and we can do this. But Preston's solid, man. We we've got a group yeah, of Preston guys here all the time. So Don, look at so that. Ross has has had the pleasure of meeting Preston. I have not, and if so I have, um, if I met you in the Bowls lot. We need to meet again probably sometime because the bowls lot can get. We need, loose. yeah, we need <laughs> to, uh, yeah, we need to make sure. I need to make sure I meet Preston. So let's answer this question, Don. Chris Culliver was your favorite last year. Anyone stand out this year in your eyes? Um, so my my favorite this year probably would be. This is just off the top of my head, is uh, Jordan Ship. Yeah, you know, he was a guy. A f- wide receiver guy. Yeah. Well, he was a guy for the for the longest time. I felt like, yeah, and it kind of same thing with Culliver. Um, that um, I kept on telling people, this is a good player. Yeah, I think that the problem with him, people recognized his uh, big playability, but they were like, oh, well, he's not the biggest, he's not the fastest, that sort of thing. And I kept on telling people, I mean, this is 
it this kid just is a is a ball player and he plays with such a level of tenacity that chip on his shoulder i've never i've been to a bunch of province day practices and i mean this in a complimentary way ship the entire time is always pissed off and complaining about something because you know province day i mean if you look at just the skill players there they kind of go off on the side and they do a lot of one-on-ones and a lot of different things working together and it's very very competitive and ships always get mad about this and that, but it's it's just the competitive spirit that is even every single day in practice, mm-hmm. and um, and I just love that about him. I mean, I I I feel like he's a kid who I would hate to play against, right? Just because I feel like he's always coming at you, and he's coming at you just with that that sharpness, and then you and then that's even forgetting the fact that you could pull up just unbelievable one-handed grabs that you know, one that made sports center top 10 you know but if you go and search youtube or or twitter and there is you know tons of them where you know just you know one on seven on sevens or even in, in, on friday nights and that sort of thing so so he's been my guy for a while now obviously north carolina offered him and uh, a bunch of other schools like michigan um, offered him and um, his ranking actually, uh, 24-7 sports, and this is another thing that kind of went a little unnoticed because of everything that's going on, but 24-7 sports updated their rankings on um, on um, Monday, I believe, Monday or Tuesday, and he was the only UNC commitment who um, got a significant who, bump. Yeah, got a significant bump. What do you have? There's some trolls on Twitter, um, just horrific stuff on Twitter these days. Yeah. But anyway, uh, Preston, shout out to Preston. Yes, I remember now. Um, absolutely. Um, that was a fun time. I think that was at uh, Wake Forest where I met Preston. And, oh, okay. And, um, yeah, because Preston, I think, is from players, Greensboro. Yeah, some of the players' family. So, yes, I definitely remember. Sorry about the, the mind blank. Um, but yes. Tommy's just too big time. No, no, no. No, no you no. don't understand. Like, I've I, seen Tommy in a store once, and he didn't know who I was. Oh, what school I had it. I'd be like, that probably matters. I br- I was <laughs> like, Tommy, we work together. <laughs> Depends on the store. I mean, if it was the gas station or the food line or whatever, I'd recognize it. But if it was some of the other sketch stores, then <laughs> probably not. I don't know this guy. Um, but anyway, two two letters of intent in for North Carolina here on December twentieth signing day. Uh, the crowd keeps getting bigger. Yeah, in what the are, live we, what chat. are we looking at uh, size wise? Let's see. Um, you know, volume. It's a live show, so. I speak directly into the microphone. Don Ah. is sometimes all over the place. So, Joe, that's probably the issue there. Um, But get your questions in the chat. I'm trying to star them as we go. Don't be touching nothing, man. We've got it working. See, that helps, Eddie. Um, For the record, uh, I've got the audio on my end turned up as loud as it possibly can get. So I'm I'm sorry. Well, see if that – did that change anything? Um, Folks can – chime in on the chat yeah, see it, if that helped any. as long as we're consistent just turn your volume up but i shout out to everybody joining us so uh, joe joe tell me which one sounds better okay ta- that fixed on okay well mm-hmm. we're on the same well we're all i think me thing. yeah i think i need to talk into it yeah the don's problem is is he needs one of those headsets that the mic stays in front of his head. But anyway, it is turned up a little bit, so we're good there. This, all right, tell me if Tommy sounds better. Oh, my God, I sound great. The Johnston County drawl. Let me ask you a question. Let's get here on okay. the questions. Um, Hubert, Do- Ho- Hubert Hoyle in the chat says, Jordan Ship, did he play against high-level competition in high school? So, uh, Providence Day, yeah, I would say so overall. I would say it was it was a good level of competition. So they they play some not so great teams, but then they also played they also played um, you know teams like uh, Raven Gap and uh, there's a couple. I think I think they played Weddington. Let me d- double check their schedule. Here, you want to? Um, I'll get into that. But you want to introduce the next guy? Yes, we have another commitment letter or, or national letter of intent that is in Lucas Asada, a specialist out of Woodbury Forest, Virginia, kicker 6'1", 195. Uh, he is, you know, one thing about it is people have talked about the special teams and, and all at North Carolina. Of course, North Carolina signed uh, Ryan Coe out of the transfer portal last year after 
Noah Burnett struggled down the stretch, especially against NC State in 2022. Ryan Coe comes in, has a couple games, gets injured. Ryan, uh, Noah Burnett takes over, takes his spot back over, and has a – you know, you'd like to think if North Carolina wins more ball games, Noah Burnett gets a lot more recognition for the year he had. Mm -hmm. um, but – so that, that position seems solid there. Lucas Asada comes in from Virginia. Don, just sort of speak to what he brings to the Tar Heels. Um, kickers and punters, for that matter, are often forgotten mm -hmm. but are so very important for teams. I mean, you look at Iowa's punter. He's like All-American punter. Iowa scored 10 points a game but won that many games on the backs at times because of a great special teams deal. What's us out to bring to North Carolina? So I think his it's his leg that's the biggest draw with him. That and the fact that he's what we call a combo kicker. A lot of guys by, you know, during their high school career, they're either kind of labeled a punter or, you know, a place kicker. Uh, he's a guy who can legitimately or projected to legitimately do both. Now, he can come to Chapel Hill and then maybe – it turns out he can only do um, one or the other sort of thing. But um, he's coming in with the ability to compete at really all three, I guess, quote-unquote duties for a kicker. You know, I think at the very least, you know, uh, kickoff, he's going to be a, a major contributor to. And then, he, you know, I think, what was it, this past season, he averaged 42.8 uh, yards per punt, you know, on kickoffs. 38 of his 44 attempts went back for touchbacks. You know, the field goals weren't great. Some of that, there's other variables involved with high school. You know, the holder, the snapper, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't wasn't great. Um, and then also, is, is your team getting you in positions to kick field goals is the other part of that. So, um, But, you know, he has a very, very strong leg, and – that's regardless of what he ends up doing in North Carolina, that's go what's going to carry him. Yeah, I haven't I, – I freely admit I don't pay a ton of attention across the country of, of how many teams have guys that kick, punt, and also handle kickoff duties. Um, but if you can get all in one w with a guy, and Asada is a possibility for that, of course, a um, long way to go from high school to college level. But if you can get – um, a guy that can handle all three. Well, somebody in the chat asked about offering offering scholarships to kickers and stuff. If you can get all of that in, in one, mm -hmm. then you can certainly um, handle a lot with one scholarship if possible. And I, and I think, and I said it before, and a lot of people mention having kickers on scholarship, I, I think it's absolutely. Yeah, there, yeah, I mean, especially when, are you you're not a big bowl watcher, right? Not, I mean, I used to be. You're not anymore. But they're just, and you don't they, watch a whole lot of like. Well, I also don't bet Maxion. on them like you do. <laughs> you don't watch like Maxion or or any of the the midweek games, right? I, I like I said, used to. Okay. Now I'm old, man. I go to so sleep. So you, so you have really really bad kickers and punters, and then you also have some kickers and punters who are absolute weapons. I mean, there are certain teams like Miami of Ohio where it's like an absolute weapon that is, I don't want to say an equalizer, but really just changes the football game for their team. And so if you can have somebody like that who's, um, who really can kind of flip the field for you, that, that makes a huge, huge difference. Or, you know, for you know, kicking purposes, you know, when you're in a situation – where, um, you know, I gotta get this call. Um, you're gonna ditch me and take a phone call? Yeah, I'll tell you later. All right, will you tell us later or just uh, we'll see. don't let that cat back in here? So, welcome back, Don Handling Business. It is a never ending thing here with uh, on signing day for Don. I, I, look, folks, I, I will tell you this, and I'm not saying it just because he walked out of the room. Days for for recruiting analysts covering this stuff, whether it's for North Carolina, whether it's for any other team, um, on the twenty four seven, it is a pretty much nonstop thing. And we talked about guys decommitting. Someone in the chat asked if uh, you know asked if we talked about Kenyon Jackson. We did earlier. Um, Jackson, of course, decommits at the last minute. 
signs is expected to sign with NC State together. And so you, you've got a situation where, yes, teams or, or yes, coaches like to get their classes done early as possible. It never stops because then you add in the transfer portal. And of course, North Carolina has been active in the transfer portal and will remain that way. And they've been even in, been active in the JUCO ranks with Tyran Stewart committing yesterday to defensive back. So a lot going on. So just to recap, shout out to the folks here and also shout out to our sponsors. If you're looking at the screen, uh, Ashton Woods, Tim Lawson, and Lucas Asada have their letters of intent in. We are discussing each player as they go. And so uh, we will get more. All good? Yeah. Is the Bojangles on the way? Yeah, something like that. So um, – uh, uh, breaking news: Bojangles is on the way. Is it? Did you hear from? No, I haven't heard from Greg. I don't oh. look at my phone. But anyway, I was talking about um, just the amount of work that goes into covering this stuff. I mean, yeah. we talk about the coaches and all the work they do, and we talked about it earlier. The amount of covering you've got: eighteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen-year-old high school guys, which is. I know how people change their minds at grown-ups, and now you've got that. You've got the transfer portal. You've got all that. So I wanted to get back to that. Unless there's a an int letter of intent in, I wanted to get back and ask you, when does it slow down for Don Callahan? So it will hopefully slow down tomorrow for just a little bit, you know, just because we're – the dead period began Monday. You know, obviously guys are signed today. For, I'm fortunate that UNC has a class that – Everybody who's committed signed um, the expectations that they signed today. There are some schools who will have to deal with some kids who wait until Friday or because the period is just is these three days, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. The signing day period. Sign, signing day period, right. early signing day period. Um, but hopefully I won't have to deal with any of that. The you know There's no more visits for the transfer portal guys. We'll probably get some announcements here and there. But, um, you know, it, it does kind of slow down for me for a little bit for this last half of the month. But you have, you have some news for us, right? Yes. Another letter of intent in Jalen Thompson, Orlando, Florida, Olympia High School, defensive back, six foot 170. Charlton Warren was his lead recruiter. Don, sort of tell us about it while I get him up on the screen. Yeah, this was a kid who for a while took a bunch of, of visits to North Carolina, even though he's from – Central Florida, kind of quietly, um, you know, he, he in initially came to the Showtime camp. This not not this one, the one prior. That's where he got the scholarship offer. Came to a game, came came again um, in the spring, and then um, and North Carolina was basically you know became his leader, and then um, you know took the official visit to North Carolina. Uh, I believe he took a couple, uh, at least, or no, he had he had two others scheduled. Ended up only taking one other one, and um, you know, by the end of of June, made a commitment to UNC. So another Florida guy. So North Carolina certainly mining Florida, mining Georgia, as we've talked about already. Um, you know, I see a lot of discussion about North Carolina's defensive backs and all. And of course, when you add a guy like Elijah Huzzy, Huzzy that helps. How much can North Carolina fans expect, and not you can speak to Thompson specifically um, if you want to, but how 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 difficult is it for like if if I'm a recruiter, am I promising early playing time or speaking about really early playing time for a guy like Thompson or any high school defensive back? Um, I think you try to. I think it's safest to try to stay away from that as much as possible and just kind of say, you know, you know, the whole, like, we're going to play the best sort of thing. Uh, I know that seems like a bit of a cop out, but especially in North Carolina, really, if, if you just look at the hard numbers from the past few years and really for, you know, beyond that, you know, if you, if you're a true freshman, you're not going to play a whole lot. You know, there are, I mean, even Omari Campbell who played a ton, I think he played the most among the true freshmen I mean, he he didn't play a whole lot, relatively speaking. Right. You know, um, and let me ask you about that because that's the thing that always drives me nuts is that you know, Mac Brown spent the entire off season talking about how 
they're going to play more reserves overall, not just true freshmen, but obviously that would factor in there. And then um, it just seemed like that didn't happen again. I think the biggest one for me was Amari Campbell. Uh, I can't remember. Maybe it was the Clemson game. You know, he should have been playing all year. Yeah. But maybe it was the Clemson game. They talked, and we talked to them. If folks pay attention to Inside Carolina, we get coach availabilities on Mondays of games week. And mm -hmm. you have Mac, and you have Chiswick, and you have Lindsey. And every week, Mac talked about, we need to play guys. Yeah. We need to play guys. And, you know, Cedric Gray probably played 2,000 snaps in two in the last two years, and, and Eccles played a ton. But I think against – in the Clemson game, and I could be – it, it might have been Georgia State. I'm pretty sure it was Clemson. Um, Campbell played early and made a splash play, maybe two splash plays in his three snaps, and he never played again. Yeah. And so I asked Chiswick, I was like, you guys talk about playing these young players. And Campbell comes in and has a, a fantastic three plays, and we never see him again. He's like, that's on me. You know, and I think it's probably on the position coach as well. Um, but ultimately, so, as he said, I did sometimes, and I'm not just this is not a shot at Chiswick. I see this in, you know, even in the NFL, some coaches. I, I get the whole self accountability thing, but like some people just say it like it's lip service. Yes, it's and, it's and complete BS. They're like, this is what I'm supposed to say. It's not it's not authentic. And yeah, it's just and it's just the. I guess I guess just because we've heard about playing other players all off season, and the people who have the ability to to make sure that happens are mm -hmm. saying it, but it's not happening is just so frustrating. Yeah, I, I mean for me, and we talked about it a lot on the basketball side, and it's a little different on basketball, yeah. physical and all that. But you got to play guys to know what they can do, mm -hmm. and if you don't ever play them, because look, we can we can have a discussion with. Jason Staples and Greg and everything about practices at, at North Carolina football, which that's that's an interesting discussion. But the bottom line is, is if guys don't get an op opportunity to play in games, you don't know what they're capable of. I think the most recent one that everybody wants to point to is Josh Downs. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, he had two great guys in front yeah. of him, or, or one guy in Daz Newsom, but he never got to play that much. When he did play, he showed out. And then, of course, the Orange Bowl was kind of his launching point. But with a guy like Campbell or any of these guys, uh, you know, Sebastian Cheeks, Deuce Caldwell to a lesser extent, if you don't play. Yeah, you don't know. You don't know. Well, I, my, and then guys are going to go. My example is Kobe Pesor. Yeah. If Josh Downs doesn't get injured, we probably don't realize how good of a player he is. You know exactly, and that what was it? App State and Georgia State games yeah. last year. And you, you don't want to say that this this green player w was just as good as Downs because he wasn't. But uh, the offense didn't seem to miss Downs mm -hmm. in, in, in those games at all because of what Kobe kind of brought to to the offense. And, and then you saw this year mm -hmm. when, when Pacer got hurt this year, I think the offense suffered because he wasn't out there. Yeah. And, you know, maybe you had opportunity to get – Doc Chapman out there more, or Andre Green in this different position, but uh, another receiver, is you got to play guys to see. And to your point about the lip service, I mean, I take uh, – I love talking to college coaches. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's fascinating to to be educated on, on the intricate details and all that. And it's more just watching on TV saying, you know, press X or Y in Madden or next year NCAA 24, which – this guy will Are you going to play that? Heck yeah, man. <laughs> yes. That, 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 I'll be 75 years old playing that game. But Do anyway. you still play the old one? Yeah, the revamped version. Do you? NCAA okay. 14 revamp. Yeah, we upgraded it. My son's home from college. We got the latest version. Okay, so like so do you guys – I mean, because – New rosters and all that stuff. Yeah, so my brother's like huge into all of that stuff with the, the modifying and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I, 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 you know – I stopped getting into that, but so but, I just but feel the like the point is, it's well, not I got it. So, do you guys just play each other? Because I imagine playing against a computer for twenty years is boring as hell. He plays dynasties, uh, so like right now he's like army, 
And but does he play the computer or does he kind of does the coach thing with it? Or? No, he plays the game. It's, okay. a, it's against the computer because I don't know if you can still play that game online. I used to talk a lot of junk about online video games. Uh huh. And then I can't remember who it was, but somebody just beat me to death and then told me about it. And <laughs> I was like, never again. But anyway, he plays that game and now they, you know, the latest edition has Drake on the cover and Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison and all that and uh, the new rosters and everything. Anyway, it, it is pretty cool. But anyway, my point is about we get on coaches a lot because you know, it seems easy to press X or Y and call a play or whatever. But the, but one thing you can absolutely get on coaches about is not playing guys. And, you know, do you give up 28 points to somebody early versus 14 points? You still win but you give up more points if you let those young guys play. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have the tail off at the end of the season because you can't tell me otherwise that Carolina can be 6-0 and or 9-1 and or whatever they were the year before that, and then they fall off at the end of the year. Yes, the competition ramps up, but guys get tired. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what a player says when he says, I don't get tired in the games. When you have six, seven, eight hundred snaps on your body, and then you've got a freshman in Amari Campbell sitting there who's capable, and it, it works across the board, a little lesser on the offensive line and all. But, you know, I think that has been a huge failing. And that's why we're sitting there talking about these young guys coming in is how much playing time they will get. Yeah. Remains to be seen. Yeah, but and I think that, you know, somewhat guarantee you would hope no one would guarantee playing time but i think somewhat guaranteed playing time played a role in the keenan jackson situation yeah i mean that was that phone call kind of mentioned some of that well the thing is is that guys want to play yeah and you other teams will use specific examples against you and for them. Oh, yeah. And it's, you know, when you see a team that has a, a young guy that flashes and plays a ton, you can say, hey, look, this guy played a lot. He's a freshman. Their guys didn't play and they're leaving. So what are you going to do? And, I mean, it, it, it sort of is what it is. But, look, like I said, it's on the coaches to play the guys. And it's on the coaches to get them prepared to play. And if they don't – uh, and it fails at the end, and and people leave. We do have another letter in. Sorry, people didn't keep saying my volume keeps lowering. I'm talking as loud as I possibly can. I'm probably waking up the neighbors. Well, I think because I have mine right up here, and so this. That's did, all yours. The, the this did help, by the way. All right, we have another one in. Dun da da da. We need a buzzer. <laughs> I started to buy you the, uh, the Mario thing. Since you've got that as your chat, there's a light you can hit. We should have done. I that. have. I have a light. We can put that on the table right, and be see, see what corny and all. Go ahead. You introduce that. And I'll see what I can do. Linebacker Evan Bennett, Eatonton, Georgia, Gatewood School, 6'3", 210. Another guy that's the same size as me. It's fascinating. These, I could have played linebacker and been a big one. He's uh, committed to – is this is this still true? He committed to Carolina back in January. And he was the first commitment in the 2024 class? Yes, yes. So tell us a little bit about Bennett. He certainly uh, brings some skills. Another one of those guys from Georgia. Uh, yeah, yeah. Georgia. Now, he's from um, he's from outside of that that greater Atlanta area. You know, he's you know, plays in an area that, you know, it's a smaller classification – He's a little, a bit of a big fish in small pond sort of thing. So he did a lot of different things for his high school, which actually ended up kind of help holding him back during his senior season because he ended up breaking his, I think it was his thumb, you know, just from, you know, because he was carrying the ball, he was returning kicks, he was obviously playing linebacker, but. Um, but ultimately, you know, he is a linebacker for, for, for UNC. You know, he's kind of that, um, I guess if you were going to put him in a certain mold, if you're going to say you have Power Eccles, you have Sed Gray, he's more in the Sed Gray sort of role mm -hmm. sort of thing. You know, that off-ball sort of um, linebacker. Um, you know, he's athletic. 
if you if you go and look on his Twitter account, you'll see that he spends a lot of time in the weight room and uh, is not afraid to show off his body of work, pun intended. Um, and uh, you know, great kid, it, you committed and and stayed um, stayed firm to that throughout. As you mentioned, he was the first commitment of the, of this class, and uh, and yeah, I mean, and he and he helped North Carolina kind of recruit, you know, um, since since that time. So it's funny, um, Bennett, of course, number five in here on letters of intent on signing day here on Inside Carolina Live Show. I'm looking at his uniform. You got to love that. Being a pro guy, you got to love the Bennett's high school uniform, basically Green Bay Packers. Uh, yeah. And it's funny to me when you uh, when you see high schools, they like rip pro team logos yeah. and all. But granted, Gatewood High School, you know, Eatonton, Georgia for Bennett, Tommy Thigpen, mm -hmm. lead recruiter. Don, how important are position coaches recruiting their actual position. I mean, I know guys have areas. Yeah. So sort of talk to us. Well, I that. think the area thing, I mean, guys still have areas, but it has really kind of gone away a bit just with, I guess, I mean, social media has been around for a while, but just the way recruiting has kind of evolved, I mean, once once the position is identified, you know the position, and the and the kid gets offered. Then the position co coach almost goes all in on handling that recruitment nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, we've we've kind of seen it kind of go that route the last couple of uh, years. Um, but yeah, so Thickpen has always well, he has always pretty much been involved with his linebackers. But really, um, he goes in immediately, and and yeah, I mean, he has a great reputation as a recruiter, and really. If you look at the linebackers he has signed through the years, he has a great reputation for finding talent mm -hmm. and for developing that talent. So when I when I look at, let me ask you this: We have recruit. We're a, we are a a staff, and uh -huh. we have areas. But there's a guy in Oregon that loves Carolina. He used to live here. His family used to live here. He wants to come. Who handles that? So typically, early on, that would be something that, I mean, I guess it depends on how it starts. Mm -hmm. If if the staff finds out about this kid, then um, you know it might just be, you know, it, it it could just be the position coach that just kind of starts it off. But generally, what you do is you have your areas within your primary recruiting footprint, and then outside of that, you have. Um, larger areas that you kind of give to some of the grad assistants to kind of handle mm -hmm. they're limited in what they can do due to ncaa rules but they can do stuff such as and and i am definitely not an ncaa expert so just let me give this disclaimer rules change like crazy but i know at some some point they were at least allowed to message recruits i believe that's that's, that's still the case mm -hmm. um and so they kind of will start uh the um start that initial contact but once it gets kind of hot and heavy, then the position coach w would come in. But if it, you know, you take a kid, um, your guy, um, Weston in California. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Tommy Thigpen, you know, has handled that throughout. As Weston Port, what Weston is he, a Port, twenty-five guy. Yeah. Yeah, twenty-five. Uh, reached out and says, "I want to come to Carolina, or <laughs> want to visit Carolina." I have to tell Don about it. You know, <laughs> it's crazy how the Inside Carolina family works. Um, we are here just to recap the signing day class thus far, letters of intent in. You got Ashton Woods, linebacker, Tim Lawson, tight end. Kicker, punter, slash do it all, Lucas Asada. Jalen Thompson, another defensive back. And linebacker, Evan Bennett, the most recent one. Collecting questions in the chat. Uh, Greg Barnes will be here I as soon as possible. Picking up That's a boatload of boat said, you know, I, I don't think your mic is is low. I think that I'm on top of it because I've been so worried. Mm. Well, but, um, I, if I talk like this, it's probably loud. But if I move it, yeah, I'm going to keep my a little bit away. It, it's kind of it, it, it's live radio, right? You know? We um we should not have allowed Greg to to pick up the breakfast. Yeah, it is uh, now eight o'clock, top of the hour. Those, eight o'clock. I thought you were getting the uh, sounder over there. 
Well, I if you do you really want it? No, man, I don't care. If you want to put it up there, it'd be funny. All right, I will get it, man. Because I, I have to unplug it behind the couch. I, mean, I could do this for you. No, Tom. don't worry about that. That's a big couch. So shout out. We are in. Um, for everybody wondering, we are in the Man Tower, Don Callahan Man Tower. You guys have heard so much about it. Um, loaded up with screens. It's eight o'clock. The top of the hour. We've been going for about an hour here at Inside Carolina's Live Signing Day. A lot going on today for North Carolina fans. you got Signing Day happening now with Inside Carolina. And again, shout out to the 150-plus folks that have been in here. You have Mac Brown uh, recaps the Signing Day class, I believe, 130 in Keenan Football Center. Inside Carolina, of course, had full coverage of that. And then if you're so inclined to – do like I'm doing. You get up at 4 a.m., mm-hmm. you leave to get to Don's house, you do this, you go to the press conference. Carolina basketball plays Oklahoma at 9.30. Well, it's scheduled for 9, but we know how that works. College basketball at 9.30 tonight in the Jordan Invitational. It's going to be an interesting and long day here at Inside Carolina. Uh, it could be really loose. It could be really loose on the post-game podcast. Check that out. We'll have Justin Jackson, Dewey Burke, myself, and producer John Bowman running that. It's going to be a fun day here at Inside Carolina. So, again, shout out to folks that joining us. Any new news, Don? Uh, I don't see anything. We do have um, – Somebody in the chat said Patterson. Has it come through yet? Or no, Patterson? Well, so here's the thing I, I, we probably should have mentioned before is that from my understanding, a lot of the – oh, yeah, Patterson did, did come in – a lot of the, or most of, yep, yeah, it looks like there might be, they might be releasing these every 10 minutes. So keep it's that perfect line. for us. Yeah, tell it's them. perfect for us. Send them a note tell them appreciate it. It's the, perfect. Um, but, yeah, the, my understanding is that, that most of these come in very close to 7 o'clock and that, the, that UNC is just releasing them publicly. Worse for me. Hey. You know, sporadically, and it looks like it's, it's about 10 minutes or this release, but yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll let you go get in on this. Defensive back Jaden Patterson, six one one eighty from, is that Dakula? Dakula, Dakula, Georgia. Uh, Dakula. Another Georgia kid, Mill Creek High School. Jason Jones, of course, North Carolina's cornerback coach and, and and relatively new coach on staff. I guess this was first year. This past year, replacing Dre Bly. Patterson um, didn't have a ton of P five offers early. Then he started working on them. Don, what's he bring to Carolina? Yeah, so this is a kid who actually, we talked about rankings a little bit earlier, but him and another guy we'll get into later once his later letter intent is in, he he received a massive bump in the rankings a couple months ago where he went from basically like a, I think it was like a mid-high three-star to a four-star status because of his senior season was so impressive. You know, he he was a converted wide receiver who um, hadn't played DB until his junior season. Didn't have I don't I think he got his first Power Five offer in February. Visited North Carolina. North Carolina offered him, and then really, yeah, you know, he he probably he didn't admit it at the time, but North Carolina probably kind of seized the 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 lead there, and then. Um, you know he he committed uh, he, he he committed in in um, in April to UNC. Uh, he took I believe he attended the the spring game and then a week later gave uh, announced his commitment to North Carolina. How important is it, or does it matter? Well, in high school, I guess most of these guys play both ways, especially in the smaller schools. Um, but wide receivers converted to defensive backs. I mean, everybody says when they see a defensive back drop a pass or drop an interception, they say, that's why he plays defensive back. Well, you got Patterson here that's one of those converted wide receivers. How important and, and what kind of role does that play for in recruiting and then, you know, for guys being ranked highly? It, or Let me ask you this. To be ranked highly – in 24-7 sports composite or their rankings, and I'm a defensive back. Mm -hmm. Do I need to have great hands or the number of interceptions relevant to my ranking? No, no, because I don't think he had a whole lot of – 
mm-hmm. interceptions. I think if you watch his film, you see a guy who is tremendous in zone coverage, kind of back there as a center fielder, but also, you know, particularly in goal line situations, will hop up and guard a, a slot guy one on one and just completely blanket him. But then also, you know, run the alley and make a big, you know, pop of a uh, a running back, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and I think really, you know, it, it's – I think that what you're saying, that saying is kind of a little – I don't know if there's ever, ever some merit to it at all, you know, because I do think obviously it's a skill position. There's skills involved, but it is a different um, – there's different skills involved with, with the two different positions. It's not just whether you can catch the ball or not. Uh, obviously, you would think that wide receivers are better catchers than than DBs, but there's other elements to it too, you know, such as you know your your hip movement, you know, with um, receiver, you want the you know the body control and all that sort of stuff. But um, you know, I think that his his experience at receiver really kind of helped him with the transition to DB. But I think. What it all also kind of speaks to just why he made such a jump during his senior season was that he had that one season kind of learning the DB position and then, you know, used uh, this past season to kind of just really kind of excel with it. Question. Evaluating defensive backs. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not always the easiest thing to do during high school games because a lot of it's competition and all. Yeah. The importance of camps, especially seven on sevens and things like that. It's it's huge because – well, you know what? You you put on a a DB highlight film and it's – you watch it and there's a lot of – you see the interceptions. And some of these interceptions are just poorly thrown balls. You know, a ball that's – soars over the receiver's head and right into the breadbasket of the DB. I mean, the, did the DB do anything there? And and a lot of uh, highlights kind of show you that. So, yes, uh, and even as you mentioned, I mean, now he plays in, in an area where it's very, it's more advanced um, as far as the passing game in that he plays in that Georgia area. He played in the same secondary as Caleb Downs, who is um, who had a great – True freshman season for Alabama. Freshman All American, wasn't yeah. he? And probably the best player on that Alabama defense. Yeah. So he played alongside Caleb Downs during his junior season. And um, so I kind of lost my train of thought there where I was going with that. But um, focus, man. Focus. Yeah. We got a long ways to go. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Talking with Don Callahan here in the Man Tower. Got a couple questions. I don't want to miss a, a letter of intent drop, but uh, we've got a second. I'm going to ask you a question out of, sure. the, out of the chat. Uh, yeah, yeah. Garrett Chapman, another regular here. Did Carolina get the NC kids, the North Carolina in-state kids that they wanted, or did the best in the state go out of state? Um, quite frankly, I hadn't heard a ton about the North Carolina class, the, the quote-unquote state of North Carolina class, whereas a couple of years ago, two or three years ago, it was tremendous. Tell us about how it sort of wound up here for the the top North Carolina guys. And, and I'm looking at your screen, and I see a lot of logos that are not specifically not Carolina, but also specifically uh, not ACC, at least at the very top. Yeah, so I like to use the composite for my – just from my viewing, just because I feel like there's more more minds involved, mm-hmm. you know. And if we're going down, let's go down the top ten of um, of the uh, of the in-state top ten. We got Amarius Williams committed to Florida, Jaden Davis committed to Michigan, Bryce Young signed with Notre Dame, Jonathan Paler committed to NC State, Malcolm Ziegler committed to UNC. Terrell Anderson committed to NC State, Caden Jones committed to Alabama, Jordan Ship committed to UNC, Micah Gilbert com- uh, signed with Notre Dame, Ethan Callaway committed to LSU. So, two of the top ten, you know, obviously, you know, there were you know the first couple of years for Mac Brown a little bit better there, but I think there's you know different situations there um, with each one. 
you know, North Carolina recruited each of these guys for the most part. You know, they did not offer Bryce Young. Terrell Anderson really didn't have a committable offer from North Carolina be for academic uh, reasons. Um, and then, you know, Callaway was a guy that, you know, his academics really kind of hindered North Carolina's recruitment of him also. But What's the allure of Florida? What's that? What's the allure of Florida? It's still Florida. Like, I know that everybody looks at how dysfunctional and all that, but, I mean, it's still it's still Florida. It's still, one, you're going to the state of Florida. Yeah. You're Ballad. playing You're playing in the SEC. It, it's a very good academic school. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, they're, they still have, they have that tradition, you know, um, yeah, there's, there's a new one. And I think, th- you know, they have, um, some backing also, you know, with, with NIL stuff. Right. Uh, but I still think it, it still has a pretty good, we talk about prestige. I, st- I still think their prestige is, is up there. I mean, don't you think, or do you think it's kind of, I mean, I know that, I mean, they're not very good on the football field. No, no, no. Um, but um, we talked about before just how how much it's more about perception. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, Miami isn't very good and hasn't been very good in a while, but still does really well on the um, in recruiting because it's it still has that that allure. You know, and then I mean, it even kind of tr- transcends when we were talking about the best home games for UNC. Everyone mentioned when Miami came to town because yeah. it was the U. You know what I mean? And so that kind of works both ways. So Carolina has another uh, commitment releasing, and, and if I had this stuff in alphabetical order, it would really be great. But I did not do that. Yeah. Aiden Banfield. Interior offensive lineman, 6'3", 280, Mill Creek out of Hoshton, Georgia. Um, three-star kid, a mountain of a man, 6'3", 280. I couldn't imagine being roughly 70 or 80 more pounds than I currently am, just to put it in context. But tell us a little bit about Banfield. It, so he's teammates of um, Jaden Patterson. I don't think that mattered too much. Uh, Banfield, uh, his mother – graduated from UNC and I think that played a major role I know that when he was offered by North Carolina I think it was in January that receiving that offer was um, a very emotional situation and I think that ultimately kind of uh, fueled or helped fuel North Carolina's uh, recruitment of him I think UNC was probably the the team to beat throughout and he officially um, committed to North Carolina, I think it was about the, yeah, it was, um, yeah, April. So he committed just um, just a couple of weeks before Jaden actually committed. But, um, you know, he was looking at mostly academic schools, and, you know, when, when, that's a, when that's such a strong factor for you and your mom went to North Carolina, it's going to be hard to, to beat North Carolina. Interesting looking at Don's write up on Inside Carolina. Uh, chose North Carolina over Duke, Georgia Tech, Pittsburgh, Vanderbilt, Virginia, Wake Forest, and NC State. We're talking about academic schools. Um, take that for what you will. Banfield, twitchy, nimble. I like how you worked in nimble yeah. offensive guard. Randy Clements, his primary commit, uh, recruiter. What have you learned about Clements' style on the trail in a year? Yeah, so. Clements does not, and I think this is good. So this is this is more of a compliment. Um, he does not care about rankings, mm. and so I remember, I, I believe when Banfield committed, he had not been ranked yet. Um, Clements, he, he makes he works quick. You know, if it, if we look at this uh, wide receiver hall, and I'm just going to list off when these guys committed. Right, Banfield committed. In early April, Desmond Jackson committed in late January. Luke Masterson committed in early April. April Fool's Day he committed, by the way. <laughs> Janai Norwood committed early April. Andrew Rosinski, late January. So basically, he had his entire wide re- I'm sorry, his entire offensive line haul done before the calendar flipped to May. He didn't even need official visits. So, so to me, that says he's a guy who 
as I, as I mentioned, you know, works quick. Identified his targets quickly, developed good relationships with them quickly, got them on campus quickly, and then secured their commitments quickly. I, I think one of the interesting things talking to Clements uh, back, I guess maybe his introductory press conference because I don't think we got him during the season. If we did, maybe once, but uh. Listen, uh, yeah, I do definitely. I need Greg to get here with some food, but I, it was interesting to me that, you know, everybody says, do they love football? I think, I think it's interesting that to play in the trenches, specifically offensive line, you got to love the game and you got to love being a football player. And I think Clements was right on that. Um, thank you, thank you, ma'am. I will leave a solid tip. <laughs> But it, it, Clements was right on that. And, and for you to sort of recite his getting his class in, I mean, he, he clearly wants guys that are tough, physical, nasty, and all that. I, I've often said, and, and I know quite a few, and maybe some that listen to this, I've never met an offensive lineman that was a, a nice guy on the field. Yeah. That was worth their salt. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was a good player. Yeah. I mean, because – you know, if you're in college, if you're watching this and you're a college student, let me give you some advice. Oh, man, look at this. Go be friends with the offensive linemen <laughs> because those dudes are the ones to hang out with. Greg Barnes has arrived with – we don't have a gigantic bow box, but we have but a several bags of Bojangles. Um, but, yeah, so Randy Clements securing yet another offensive lineman for North Carolina, Aiden Banfield. Let me throw it up here on the list. Get so we have there. a celebrity. We have a celebrity in the house. Is that Greg? Oh, you didn't even see him? Yeah, I saw Greg. I said, is he the celebrity? Oh, yeah. Oh, he's definitely the GOAT. I mean, the man just walked in. Look, he just walked in looking with like. He's. We don't have a sponsorship with Bojangles. I know, Bojangles. What is going on? If they want to sponsor us, then we'll put the bag up front and center. Make but, sure we got the. But, uh, oh, no, this is, this is yours. Barnes walks in looking like he's already played around the golf. Um, <laughs> so it, it is, um, you know, to Garrett Chapman's comment, Carolina needs dogs on the offensive line specifically. I think they've got one in Willie Lampkin. It's going to be interesting to see how this bowl game shakes out with Willie playing center along with Connor Harrell um, and some of those other guys. You know, we've heard a lot about rankings and all that. And to your point about Clements, Rankings don't mean a thing yeah. to Randy Clements. Well, and then I was also I – um, I probably shouldn't shout out – well, I, I think it's fair. Uh, the Athletic did kind of a breakdown of um, the top – just focusing on the top 100 recruits from each class mm -hmm. and what happened as far as the, them being ranked. I mean, I'm sorry, them being drafted, right? Because obviously you would think – well, at least two for seven for their rankings. The goal is to have their top 32 be drafted in the first round. Right. And the, the position that was um, least accurate was offensive line. And if you think about it, I mean, the, the problem is, is that the, the job requirements for that position, the size, not only just the size, but the mobility, that combination – the pool of talent is very small for those guys. Mm -hmm. um, and so it makes it harder to make sure that you're getting the right guy because a lot of instances you're just focusing on that, that size. Yeah. Do you need a plug or are you good? I should be good. Okay. So you have your own microphone. We've figured out the audio. Um, you know, we've got real-time yeah. folks talking to us about um, our audio levels. So as long as we're consistent, we're pretty good. Greg Barnes has joined the chat, ladies and gentlemen. He arrives. <laughs> um, what does your sticker say on your? He arrives fashionably, fashionably late. I've got a trophy, trophy husband. husband oh side. man. Then I got the New Orleans. I'm gonna have to get on. on I'm gonna have to get on my my wife about why uh why don't I have a trophy husband sticker. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I mean, God. it looks like it's been partially torn off. Yeah, at times. well, that's so what happens that, when you're a trophy husband. Things get ripped times. off. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, um, you know, it's an interesting take. What you were talking about, Don, is that 
recruiting offensive linemen specifically is such a, a crapshoot, yeah. really, because who knows what a seven, especially now you got to get them committed early. You got 16, 17 year old kids, and you're getting them committed. And then you see when you, know, you get to college, you got 24, now 24 year old offensive linemen that are like Corey Gaynor. What yeah. is he, 25? I mean, I'd like to see what. I, I think he's almost your age, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> really? He certainly well, has he's the not wisdom. He's that old. Of it. But, yeah, so it's just a offensive lineman. If you hit on them, you, you get lucky. If you don't, you, you know. Well, the, the other thing is is that a lot of these guys, they're playing against kids who are literally a foot shorter than them. And so they can not use any technique whatsoever, not learn the game, not learn how to truly block, not learn about leverage, which is very, very important, and just absolutely dominate. And then they get to college, and now they're playing against people who are the same size, and they don't know how to adjust, or they don't they don't want to figure it out, and that's where busts kind of happen. I've told this story a number of times over the years, but my first real recruiting trip was with Don Callahan. It was on on the way to Blacksburg for yeah. a Virginia Tech game. We stopped at Hardee's and had had dinner that day, uh, but we went to uh, Lynchburg Academy, which is where uh, Liberty actually plays. Nice mm-hmm. facility. I'm not sure what the school was that M- Massey was at. Uh, Liberty, um, yeah, it's, it's the same school that which is, um, that Zach Rice went to. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm shooting uh, – uh, I'm playing photographer for Don as he's taking notes and, and talking to coaches and doing all the things that Don does. And – to watch Massey, who ended up being I – mean, I don't know if he was a five-star kid, but went to Ole Miss. Mm-hmm. Um, played in the NFL. Played in the NFL. It was laughable. Yeah. Seeing him on the field. Yeah. It, it looked was, like someone's dad. It, he did. <laughs> he did. Uh, it was like – yeah, it was like a, a dad out there playing mm-hmm. with peewee kids, just tossing them around. And yeah. I'm watching it, and I'm like, well, I, I don't have the evaluation skill that Don does. <laughs> But I can tell you that we don't know anything about this kid after watching this game yeah. because he was so dominant and kids were literally bouncing off of him. Yeah. Um, and I can just only imagine how difficult that is for coaches to have to try to look at film and know that, you know, in, in Massey's case, there was what, maybe like two games that entire year mm-hmm. that was worthwhile looking yeah. at in terms of skill. So. Yeah. And, and then the other part of it too, and I wanted to ask you about this, Don, is – Carolina has had a ton of offensive line coaches. Yeah. You go from Cap to Stacy uh, to Jack. Uh, you know, now you got Randy. And, I mean, blocking and all those things, right, there's a baseline. Mm-hmm. Um, but each of those individuals has something a little bit different they want to do. And therefore, there's something a little bit different in how they recruit of what they want to see. Yeah. So when you combine the fact that you have – Coaches are looking for different things. And then you already have this this weird situation where it's very difficult to evaluate properly and project what a high school kid can be four years down the road. Uh, it's almost like throwing darts. Yeah. It seems like. Absolutely. Um, how, do, how do coaches talk about that to you in terms of trying to understand and evaluate properly – Uh, to make sure they get guys in the program that they think they can develop? Well, I'll tell you the one thing that you'll you'll encounter a lot, and this is not exclusive to the offensive line. This is every position. You know, uh, a a new position coach will be – maybe I shouldn't phrase it this way, but they will be – there will be certain players who they inherited that they're like, man, I don't know why they recruited this kid. You know, and that happens pretty regularly – and um, and then some of that is what you said. I mean, they value certain things. And that's why I think fans don't grasp the idea that there is not like this consensus opinion on things. Like it, it is truly an art, not a science. And, you know, one coach can look at a kid and think he's a great player and another coach can look at it and think he's not. I mean, it's just like, you know, there are obviously like – we can all look at Mona Lisa and be like, yeah, that's an awesome painting. But there are certain paintings that I wouldn't hang in my living room, 
but Tommy would absolutely love, you know, and that's you've got a ton of stuff in here. I wouldn't hang in my yeah. letter. <laughs> Let me cut you off there because we do have another okay. commit that has come in. Defensive lineman Leroy Jackson, Don, uh, the last, yeah, of North Carolina's commitments. And if you don't include Tyron Stewart, the junior college guy, the last high school guy to commit yeah. to Carolina, uh, Leroy Jackson, Leesville, excuse me, Leesburg, Georgia, Lee County High School. Three-star guy, defensive line. A lot of people talked about getting defensive linemen in this class. You talked about all summer uh, that they were done unless there was a defensive lineman that they saw and liked. How do you end up at North Carolina? Yeah, so as you mentioned, I mean, that was that was the one position that eluded them over the summer and that they looked to, um, to still bring in. They spent the first – this, this used to be commonplace, but now that the calendar is so sped up, this doesn't happen as often, but we talk about the, the first three games. And so what, um, what kids will, te- will typically do, I guess it still happens maybe for Group of Five and FCS, you know, seniors will send in their, their first three games and decisions, decisions will be made based off of that. UNC checked out a bunch of um, first three games of, of – uh, defensive line targets and he was a guy who really stood out now if you actually pull up his film it's actually pretty impressive you know he's not the tallest defensive lineman at all but as far as um but it's what what is that rick minor in the chat every good d-line needs a leroy (laughs) um but um the first couple clips of his highlights if you're if you're watching us at home and have the ability to pull up his huddle you know he's catching passes you know, uh, you know, he's he's running the ball, and it's actually kind of funny to watch. But um, you know, this is you know, you like the word nimble, Tommy. Yeah. Tommy says he likes his women nimble. Um, <laughs> so it's, just, um, it's just eight o'clock. It's eight thirty. <laughs> We're already hour and a half in. You can see it is sliding, devolving. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> Let me save you from your coughing okay. fit. Lead recruiter on Leroy Jackson, Tim Cross. Yes. Com- comments. Oh, comments. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> you know, as a recruiter, I think he. Let me just. I, I was talking to somebody about Tim Cross as a recruiter, <clears throat> and he said that Tim Cross is a guy. As I lose my voice, Tim Cross is a guy who, you know, you definitely want to be a role model for your kid, mm-hmm. and so um, he's genuine. You know, if. Uh, if your family's really big into religion, he's definitely someone who kind of touches that. And um, he's very, in, you know, um, somebody who will impress you in that aspect. He's definitely somebody who a parent will trust with their child sort of thing. Um, so he's a guy who, once he kind of gets in there with a family, is very successful. You know, um, I don't know if he's a guy who kind of will fight in the trenches you know, like in a heavy SEC sort of battle, recruiting battle sort of thing. But he is definitely a guy who definitely parents love and relates to a lot of different kids. Yeah, it's an interesting Uh, dynamic what what people think. And, and Greg, this is something you can comment on from covering. People have perceptions about coaching abilities. And, you know, we we certainly – what you see on the field is ultimately your your test and your um, whether you're good or not, mm-hmm. you know, quote unquote good or not, or a good coach. But there's so much more to being a football coach than you know. I, I tweeted something not terribly long ago that about Nick Saban. He was talking about one of his players, not even from a being a coach aspect of it, but being more of a father figure slash mentor and all. That's that's often lost, especially in this day and age, where um, folks just expect, and, and rightfully so, they pay, get paid a lot of money, but expect guys to produce winners all the time. There's certainly more to it. I've heard plenty of former players talk about coaches that on a message board people would say sucked, mm-hmm. but they talk about how great they were for them in their lives. Greg, just speak to that aspect of, of this coaching profession. Well, I think a <clears throat> good example of that is, is Stacey Searles, right? When, when he is in Chapel Hill, and even when he was in Miami, people were like, eh, like, okay, he's a good recruiter, but is he, like, the best coach in terms of technique and those types of things? Where's he at now? Georgia. 
Yeah. So I, I would say he's uh, he's had a little bit of success down in Athens. There is, Tommy. I think you're exactly right. There's there's a lot that goes into coaching. Um, and for me, this and this goes across all all the sports that I've covered. Yeah, the technical side of it is is clearly important. Um, you've got to you've got to get kids to to know exactly what they're supposed to be doing and, and react properly on the field, and that's what everybody sees, and that's the easiest way to grade. But there's also a component of connecting with the kid in such a way that you can get him to be a better version of himself. Um, and there are a lot of coaches out there who do not have that ability, and that's beyond just on the football field. That's uh, you. That's a kid maybe not coming from the best background and having a new perspective on life and understanding that life past football exists for him now, where maybe before it didn't. And a lot of those things really go into it. And look, Mac Brown values that. Um, Larry Fedora valued that. A lot of coaches do. Nick Saban does. Um, so all of that stuff is important. And that's you know, the conversation that we had last year about Tim Cross. And to your point, people are like, ah, get rid of him. Get rid of him. And Mac pretty much said, hey, you know, this is a guy who really connects with the players. He's great in the locker room. Uh, he's really kind of a, a father figure for a lot of these guys. There is value in that. Now, we can debate whether or not value on the field versus value in the locker room versus value as a X's no guy. All those things vary in opinion, and it dep depends on who the head coach is. Um, but there's so many different pieces. And then when you get into the recruiting aspect, like, like Don said, if you've sat down and talked with Tim Cross, yeah. it's hard not to like the guy. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's funny. He listens to you. He gives you good answers. He's straightforward. It's very easy to see how he and He's connects. not just football. Like, Correct. I, I talked – he's big on watching um, different TV shows, streaming, binge watching, and all that sort of stuff. And we've compared shows and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, so he's not just loosely football. Yeah, but he's it's very easy to connect with. It's very easy to see how he can go into a kid's uh, home and, and make connections with parents as well as the kid. And all that stuff kind of factors in here. It's a, it's a the human being aspect of all this is like, you know, I, I've talked to plenty of people and you meet somebody and you talk to them and all they can talk is ball. And it's like, you yeah. know. Yeah. I'll tell you all about the three tech and you know what the five eyes doing and all that, but they can't talk to you about anything else. Well, you know, on um, Blindside the movie, the thing that people always bring up about Nick Saban's part is how he pointed out the uh, d the drapery. Like, mm -hmm. why does Nick Saban know about you know drapery, sort of thing? But that was supposedly one of his things is that he talks about other aspects when he would do in home visits to the parents, and that would automatically kind of just take them kind of a little bit off their game, just focusing on what they're wanting to focus on sort of thing. Yeah, so, I mean, there's definitely uh -huh. that, that huge, <clears throat> yes, it's ultimately about winning. Everybody wants to win and all that, but it, is it winning at all costs? That There's yeah. the line you draw, and that's a line that, you know, maybe a school like Carolina draws a little bit in a little bit different space than some other schools may. And, and I don't know, you know, I think, coaches all across the world want to be liked or whatever but it's just an interesting discussion point when you're when you go from being in the message board fanatic fan aspect of it versus the the people that you see every day covering it talking to them so an interesting thing there carolina of course Getting some letters of intent in here on National Signing Day Greg Barnes in the house We have a new one We have a new one who we got Ryan Ward. Let me find it on my list. I will kick it to you, Don, so you can. Uh... Yeah, so Ryan Ward, tight end from Rutherford, New Jersey, not typically an area that UNC hits up anymore. You know, during Fedora, he would hit up New Jersey a bunch, but but not during uh, Mac Brown. But this was a kid who who actually ended up visiting North Carolina a couple of times, and during his uh, his final visit to uh, Chapel Hill, which I believe was over the spring, um, he ended up committing in mid-April to Chapel Hill. You want to introduce him further? Yeah, Ryan Ward, tight end, 6'4", 240, Rutherford, New Jersey, Rutherford High School. Another Freddie Kitchens grab, a tight end. I, I think, Don, what's interesting about your article here on Inside Carolina, and folks are watching this on YouTube, certainly 
call up the Inside Carolina page as well and have Don's information on here. He's done it all. He's yeah. one of those guys that in high school he's got the size. He's like you guys talked about earlier. He's like bigger than everybody or, or whatever, but he's he runs, he throws, he finishes in tackles. Um, he's got a team first mentality. Just sort of his place for North Carolina, you think, how he settles in. Good yeah. size um, and the ability to do more than one thing, but where does he settle in? Yeah, so I actually think he is the most underrated signee that UNC is going to sign today because of what you mentioned. I think that when you're looking at tight ends, when you're looking at H-back, th that position, you want guys who can do a lot of different things, and he certainly did it. He threw a touchdown pass during his senior season. He had five rushing touchdowns. Nine, t nine receiving touchdowns. He also was among the leaders um, on defense. 91 tackles for this kid on defense. Keep in mind, he's playing all that offense. He's 91 tackles. You know, uh, four and a half sacks, two interceptions. I mean, so he did it all. They went undefeated until losing in the, uh, the quarterfinals. Um, I think he's kind of like an H-back sort of thing, but I think he could, do a, he could do that sort of attached tight end or even the detached what you know, Greg? I, I'm curious your thoughts on just what, are, yeah, what, how North Carolina has been using the tight end because I feel like it has evolved underneath Mac Brown, you know, to a degree. In the very beginning, wasn't using it at all. Now, you know, this past season, they're using two, three tight ends. Yeah, I really think when you look at what Phil Longo wanted to do, uh, he didn't really like the idea of an attached tight end, and until you get a guy like Bryce Nesbitt, who is like the quintessential H-back, mm -hmm. you know, detached tight end at the college level, uh, they weren't able to utilize it the way they wanted to. And then you get into some some shortages at wide receiver, so some injuries. And I think that kind of really forced their, their hand a little bit. But when you have a guy like Bryson Nesbitt, who is tall um, and is strong and can run, you can utilize him in a lot of different ways, especially over the middle of the field. And I think that ability, you know, uh, Copenhaver – for whatever reason, um, that's a guy that Chip Lindsey really likes, uh, and that's why he kind of moved up to the top of the, the depth chart. And then you see guys like Carl Tucker and even now Kamari Morales, who, while they are very athletic, they are much more kind of in the mold of an old-school traditional tight end. Mm -hmm. And that's why Carl ends up going to Bama and, and Kamari decided to, to transfer. Um, but – the ability to, to utilize those big guys in unique ways, I think, is, is what's most important. Um, and that's really kind of a, a, a key position for a lot of these offenses, like what Chip Lindsey runs, where you don't have maybe the elite skill set guys. And you've got some good guys, but maybe not the elite guys. So you're trying to find uh, maybe secondary options beside a Josh Downs, beside a Tez Walker, beside a Marion Hampton where you can say, okay, well, we know that they're going to defend and bracket option number one and option number two. Can they defend well enough? Do they have the skill on defense, uh, the talent, to be able to defend our third option if our third option is a guy like Bri Bryson Nesbitt? And that's a tough ask, and that's one of the reasons that Carolina's had so much success at the tight end position the last couple of years. Yeah, and I think that's where you see a guy like Copenhaver stepping up making plays. Yep. I, I mean, you know, I've said it. Already on this show, I'll say it again, North Carolina on the skill positions I think will be fine when we were talking about a decommit, a wide receiver decommit. Where North Carolina has gotten significantly better in this offense, uh, granted Amari and Hampton's been really solid, but is the tight end room. And so, Don, I want to ask you this about the tight end room. We're talking about these young fellows coming in in Ward and, and all on the recruiting class, but out of the portal, Jake Johnson commits, mm -hmm. who at the time – was the number one tight end in his high school class. Of course, his older brother, Max Johnson, certainly will compete for the quarterback job at North Carolina. But where's Jake Johnson fit in all this? Uh, I mean, I we're mean, not talking about a young guy that needs time to grow. He's still a young guy, though. But he's going to be ready-made. Yeah. I mean, he played yeah. a lot for Texas A&M already. Yeah. And now he enters a room who currently has Nesbitt, Copenhaver. Yeah, I mean, I think that's – it's probably a better question for Greg, to be honest, because, yeah, there's there's a lot of options here. And how – I mean, the good thing about the tight end position is is a position where you can put two, even three 
guys out there in, in certain situations. Um, and, and then you have guys like, I mean, Nesbitt is basically a wide receiver. And even, even um, uh, Jake Johnson can basically be kind of a wide receiver out there, just a massive wide receiver that's a huge mismatch problem. So I think really it kind of falls on Chip Lindsey to be creative enough to figure out how to take advantage because I think the pieces are here to be super successful and take advantage of that. Greg, let me ask you a question. I know you sat down with Lindsey in the offseason last year before this season and had the opportunity to talk to him. Um, I, I listened to him, I guess, yesterday or day before yesterday talk about the tight end room now um, going into the bowl game. I mean, Deems May was fourth on the chart. Now he's the starter if they go that route. But Lindsey talked a lot about using 12 and 13, um, even 13 at some times uh, personnel. I mean, he's continued to, to be able to do that. I don't know what he'll do against West Virginia. I would doubt that's the thing, unless unless one of us is playing mm -hmm. tight end. But but just what do you expect out of him as he evolves as a play caller, as, a, as an offensive coordinator for Carolina, maybe going into the off season after year one? Well, I think if you look at kind of his history, uh, he's worked with a lot of guys who are willing to break the mold a little bit and use different different personnel packages and really maximize the talent that he has. And I, I, you look at what happened this year, as you mentioned, I mean, North Carolina played three tight ends quite a bit. Why? Well, there's talent there, so you want to maximize that. But also you had some injuries um, and maybe some holes along the wide receiver spots. And you know, if you go back a couple years ago, we started seeing more tight end play when there were some questions at, at wide receiver once you got past Andre Green and Josh Downs. And so I, I think some of that exists at the wide receiver position projecting forward to next year. And so there's opportunity there. And Lindsey can say, look, you, we're willing to go with three tight ends. If those are the best players on the field, I don't care what they're called, we're going to use them as football players. And that's what's going to be interesting about we can, we can dive into this right now. We can wait. Let's wait because we got a thing coming in. But, but I right. do want to go there. Let, so let, hold me, the let me say this real quick about the tight end. You mentioned for the West Virginia game. I think Chip Lindsey is going to mix things up. And I don't think we're going to see a lot of tight ends on the field whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, because he doesn't have you know, the, the options that he would like to have there. Now, you're still going to see Deems May uh, play a little bit. But not near to the extent of what everybody was used to this season. Got another letter of intent in here at Inside Carolina Live signing day show. Desmond Jackson, somebody asked about North Carolina recruits. Well, here is one. West Forsyth, Clemens, North Carolina. Another interior offensive lineman, Don, 6'5", 290. Another three-star guy, local, right down 40, 85, however you want to get there from Chapel Hill. Um, what does he bring? And tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so his re recruitment was pretty simple. You know, UNC was the first school to offer him during the fall of his junior year, attended a couple games, visit North Carolina once in January, and then I think it was like a week later, committed to North Carolina. So he wasn't the first commitment. That was uh, Evan Bennett. I believe he was the second. If he wasn't, I believe he was the second. Um, you know, a massive kid who uh, moves really well. Plays for a very good program, West Forsyth, um, who has produced a lot of really, really, um, um, a lot of talented players come from um, that uh, that program. Um, and I think you know he's played mostly tackle at West Forsyth, but I think he's a guy who clearly moves inside to guard for North Carolina. Let me ask you this question, um, and Greg, you can even you're a North Carolina guy. I've been here forever, but. How important is the Winston-Salem area in recruiting these days? Everybody talks about Charlotte. Mm -hmm. You talk about Greensboro with the Whirlies and Grimsley. Um, once upon a time, Newburn and Jacksonville and all on the coast were big time. How, how big a area is Winston-Salem now? I think you know Winston-Salem probably on average has um, two or three legitimate UNC guys. You know, um, you know, depending on on the class, 
you know, so, so and, it, and it's a pro-North Carolina area, I feel like. I mean, you guys probably would know better than, than me, but I feel like when I go in into that area, it's um, a lot of UNC fans there. And, I mean, it's the same high school as Jalen Dalton, which was at one point a big pickup for North Carolina. You know, um, you know sometimes it's – it's uh, West Forsyth. Sometimes it's uh, Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor actually has a couple good recruits coming up right now for the 2025 class. Um, but uh, yeah, so I think it's it's a good area. Any any other <laughs> insight for you guys? Well, Winston Salem is home to Wake Forest University. Which yeah, we, as we all know, is is uh, Switzerland. <laughs> so it makes sense that North Carolina fans can have a a place <laughs> uh, to kind of call their own there. Do you yeah. Know, do you know that their five fans all hate Ross Martin? <laughs> it doesn't surprise me, but – I know a couple of them that hate another inside at, Carolina guy, but I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> at some point, there's uh, there's the whole thing of kind of looking in the mirror, right? Mm-hmm. When you got the penny loafers and the, and the, and the well-done hair. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, sometimes you see yourself, and that's where some of that judgment comes from. Slee Rat on the board, he's, he's like, you know, give us some credit. There's at least one Carolina fan in, the, in Winston-Salem, and it's him. And uh, – mm. I will say this. I've been to a lot of away games mm-hmm. in a lot of different places. I have never had a problem at Carter Finley. Really? I've never had a problem at Wallace Wade. Uh, Winston Salem is a different animal. Really? Those Wake Forest fans, and, and you know, yeah. Wake Forest fans do not like North Carolina. See, I, I've left Carter Finley and have seen bash out windows of a UNC. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's fan. why you probably rolled up in there with Carolina stickers on. No, I that. didn't, but, um, <laughs> yeah. But. It, it is an interesting dynamic at Wake. Okay. Um, you know, and, and we, we talked about transfer portal, and this is an ACC thing as a whole. Wake is basically becoming a farm team mm-hmm. yes, yeah. for better schools. We saw Sam Hartman leave and, and all that. but And I don't – if Carolina is going to be in the ACC currently, I don't like seeing that now. If that changes down the road, then I couldn't care less. But anyway, Greg, back to the discussion we were having um, with tight ends and Lindsey and all bowl game and stuff. I I think you're right, though. He's going to have to do some different things, especially for this game, to sort of fill those holes that where you lose Morales to Boston College. Nesbitt and Copenhaver are both on the shelf due to some postseason surgeries. I mean, it's going to be an interesting watch. It is, and I may or may not write about this, so we can go ahead and talk about it. <laughs> but you have somebody on staff in, in Chip Lindsay who has done a lot of creative things, and he, he worked alongside of uh, Gus at two stops, Auburn and Central Florida. You know Gus likes to kind of shake things up. More importantly, he's working alongside a, an old buddy of his, and Randy Clements. And North Carolina fans remember Randy Clements from his Baylor days because – what happened at Baylor in 2015 is Jarrett Stidham was the, the quarterback. I guess – I think he decided to go pro. Backup quarterback was hurt. So, we knew going into that game, okay, they're down to the third-string quarterback. Their Blitnikoff winner at wide receiver opted out. Their 1,000-yard rusher opted out. <laughs> what are they going to do if they run the exact same offense, right? Well, Art Bryles is a great offensive mind and completely reworks in a span of, like, four weeks what his offense is going to look like. He said, I've got one game, so for these four weeks, we're going to have fun, and we're going to change what we do into a power run game and had a tremendous amount of success. They're, they're, you know, the Baylor Bears are still running. They're still running through Gene Chizik's dreams, I imagine. There are, there are a lot of people that will say this conversation's too soon. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Well, inside of a decade. My point is, is you you lose Tez Walker, um, you lose Drake May, you lose your starting center. Um, other guys are out with injury. If there was ever a time to tinker and to get creative and to mix things up, now's that time. Mm-hmm. You know what you have at quarterback who is a, a raw young man who is a phenomenal athlete in Connor Harrell. You know what you got at running back, and you've got some big bodies along the offensive line. And you got some pretty good um, you got some pretty good options there uh, at, at wide receiver, even though there are some, some injuries. 
why not mix it up and, and completely turn in some kind of power run game and run some option, not just zone reads and those types of things, but mix it up and, and try to get Harrell out on the perimeter, try to use the option game. Um, you know, the triple option would be fantastic if you've got enough guys in the backfield, which I think you do. I think they could have a lot of fun with this, get full creative. Fans are going to say, wow, they're actually getting creative. This is really fun to watch. <clears throat> it's a mess. It's not working. But it may work. But what, at least you did what something. Are the, yeah. What are the chances? Put a, put a percentage on that, that, that they do anything creative for the bowl game. I think there's a decent chance that they do some things. 20% maybe? Okay. Yeah. I yeah. Don't, uh, what Mac Brown just the more I seem... think about it, the more it kind of creeps up in my mind. But yeah. I, I, yeah, that's not in Mac Brown. Yeah, that's style. what I'm thinking. Mac Brown would not. <laughs> what you don't want to see is you come out and try to do, and I, and I know they say that Harold can do a lot of the same stuff, but I guess to my point, to your point, is why not? Yeah. Yeah. What, I mean, what you got to lose? A bowl game? Well, <laughs> at this point, it, which you know, but I want to see – not only I want to see what what the young players can do, I want to see what the coaching staff is capable of doing in a month, yeah. flipping something around. Because what is bogged down, I think, Greg, this team over the, the last several years is that it's the same thing, especially on defense, it's the same thing week in and week out with very little adjustments that work. And, and – I think that speaks to why they've had these sort of tankings at the end every year is yeah. because you put six, seven games on tape, everybody knows what you're going to do, they're prepared for it, and you do nothing differently, then you get three, four, five losses to end the season. This is a perfect opportunity to show that, hey, we've we got, we got some creativity in here, and it would excite the fan base as well, which I also think is very important. I agree with you on that point. I think I think North Carolina needs some um, good positive energy going into the offseason. And that's way that's that's one way, regardless of win or loss, if you show that type of creativity and risk, uh, you kinda you kinda draw some interest there. The the other part of it, uh, to your point, Tommy, is is the flip side of what happened in two thousand fifteen. North Carolina had no answer for what Baylor wanted to do in that, that bowl game. And we've talked about it before, but kind of the commentary behind the scenes from some staff members after that year was, you know, what do you want us to do? Draw up plays in the dirt. Yeah. Because they were not prepared <laughs> yeah. uh, for exactly what Baylor was doing, and they, they didn't know how to counter it. So, yeah, the, the obvious answer there is, yeah, draw, draw up some plays in the dirt. On the spot, on the fly, let's see what you got. Uh, but as Don suggested there that's not really in mac brown's wheelhouse which which would make it even more interesting before we move on you said something don about desmond jackson that i okay. want to come back to sure and uh i think a lot of fans hear this and they want a little bit of an explanation okay you said you, you thought that he projected more inside at guard when you're watching a, a kid what are you looking for to kind of say okay well this kid clearly can play tackle or Big, strong guy, but he's going to be inside. So the um, – I guess the, the the cheating way to go about it is just to kind of see – I mean, I guess it's not really the cheating way. I mean, if you see a guy – I mean, obviously we're looking at – we're talking about kids who are 6'5"-ish, you know, give or take. Um, but if you see a kid who is, you know, you know more athletic um, and, and obviously has the, the – you, you, most of these, once they kind of get into that lane, they start to kind of develop this anyway. But I guess it's just the athleticism, you know, being more finesse. Um, I, and, and when I say that, I'm not saying they're not powerful still, but because of the fact that you have to kind of, um, you know, pass set and, you, you know, drop back like that, and it's more, it is more of a finesse game, whereas a guard – they still have to do those things, but not to the extent that a tackle does. But yet, you want them to be more of that steamroller, and that's what I think Desmond Jackson is. You know, so like a broader frame. You know, he's still very athletic for his size. But um, you, know, the other thing is, is I mean, what they list him at two ninety, but I think he's probably over. You know, he's probably closer to like three ten, if not more than that now. 
you know, uh, usually your tackles in high school are going to be, you know, um, 285, 290, I guess. But I mean, um, Jackson, I think, is 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 up there now. And so, so yeah, just more powerful for those interior guys um, and more athletic for those those tackle guys. Is is length a primary factor? Is that more secondary based on athleticism? Yeah. Um, well, length is is definitely very important also um and um so but obviously that typically comes with somebody you know the, the taller you are usually the longer you are it's not always 100 percent, but yeah and that's why you will see you know he's listed at six five but you'll see six five six 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 seven offensive tackles because typically that wingspan kind of converts with the um with the height tommy when you watch uh travion green in practice that dude's a monster. I mean, his his wingspan <laughs> is ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's uh, that's one thing that folks that watch from the stands a lot and, and see it on TV just do not understand yeah. how big these people are. And, and then you get to the pro level, and if you've ever seen a professional team up close, it's like every single one of them are monsters. They're just so, massive human beings. I mean, yeah, it's, it's Marvin Alston had the biggest head of any person <laughs> I've ever seen in my life. No. Julius Peppers, yeah, massive Peppers head. <laughs> Julius Peppers, uh, his, I remember covering him and talking to him. I mean, he was jacked up after a basketball game, actually, and his shoulders and his biceps and all were bigger than my hip and thigh. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just ridiculous. We got another uh, signee to announce, defensive back Tyshawn White, 5'11", 190, out of Beaufort, Beaufort High School in Georgia, Charlton Warren lead recruiter. Don, uh, another defensive back for mm -hmm. Charlton Warren, Jason Jones in that room. Sort of walk us down about uh, what he brings to the table. I, I see something that I do like seeing on the defensive back. He's best in run support. Mm -hmm. But just sort of break him down a little bit. Yeah, so we kind of touched on this a little bit about that greater Atlanta area. And Buford, anyone who follows recruiting is familiar with that school, just constantly produces – talent like I mean literally the four stars and five stars that are on that roster year in and year out are just absolutely insane um, but you know he's a he's kind of your your you know traditional kid who comes from tr traditional DB who comes from that area where he's been learning the position playing it at a high level for several years plays on seven on seven has been trained highly um, you know, but he's a guy who I think if you look at him, he's not the tallest guy, but he's thick, particularly, um, you know, the, 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 the thighs. I mean, very, very strong. Um, I mean, he's a guy who I think is kind of the prototypical sort of, um, you know, uh, the star position, you know, where um, you where you know, we mentioned run support. You know, he's excellent in run support, enjoys um, the, the physicality of playing the run, but also is excellent in pass coverage. So I'm going to throw it to Greg because I'm curious, just bringing in a kid who um, who is perfect for this, uh, for this star position, how important is it for North Carolina's defense and how much was it missed when um, DeAndre got hurt? Well, that's kind of the, the ripple effect, right, of, of – they had planned on Boykins being the, the main guy at the star, which was going to allow them to play Elijah Huzzy on the edge. Uh, and with Elijah moving inside, he, he was really good in that role. He's a, he's a good uh, coverage back. And he, he doesn't mind kind of getting his, his head in there too with, with run support. But that really kind of thins you out at your cornerback positions. Uh, and I think more than anything, that's kind of been the issue is that North Carolina has had some injuries – and they haven't been able to get guys in place at the key positions for an extended period of time. Uh, the star position is kind of, of a unique one because it's, you know, when, when Butch Davis really started pushing the nickel position when he came in 2007, uh, that was really when we first saw it, at least at North Carolina, of being this, at that time, maybe not a base package mm -hmm. position, but pretty close. Yeah. Uh, Charles Brown. Yeah, Charles Brown's a great example. And it was really a situation of how do you want to use this position? Because if a team now with all this spread 
looks where you're running four and sometimes five wide receivers, you've got to have a, a third cornerback on the field. Mm-hmm. And that's what Elijah Huzzy really thrived in this past year in that star role. But then when you have teams like Georgia Tech who want an NC State who want to line up and run the ball on you, mm-hmm. well, now all of a sudden that same position's got to be effective enough to get up there. And as Tommy said, you kind of run downhill and, and stick your helmet in there. And so that's asking a lot out of a kid is saying, yeah. okay, we want you to be a linebacker, but we also want you to be a cornerback. Yeah, yeah. Uh, those guys don't grow on trees. No. <laughs> and uh, DeAndre Boykins you know, has good size. Uh, and I think he's really kind of the ideal fit there. So it'll be a, a benefit getting him back. But I thought Huzzy did a good job. And that's that's one of the things, too. You look at a guy like Ant Lane, who Ant's not a big guy whatsoever. Mm-hmm. But when you watch him play, he plays with a, uh, a veracity, which is just everybody likes to see it. Mm-hmm. He will lay a hit. You mm-hmm. can hear it when he hits somebody. Um, and it doesn't matter that he's a small guy. Mm-hmm. He can lay that hit. He doesn't you know, have the, the speed necessarily to, to play cornerback. But that's kind of what you're looking for is a guy that's willing and knows how to get in position. And that's really what it comes down to. Um, you know, North Carolina's had plenty of guys over the years who are 6'1", 6'2", 215 pounds that play safety, and they play more like a cornerback. And so that's really – I was going to ask you, when you look at kind of the young guys on this team, because there are going to be a lot of playing opportunity. Yeah. Who of the young guys that you've really scouted this year and last year um, kind of fit the mold of a guy who has the skill set to be able to do a little bit of coverage work but also can maybe cover a tight end or or get active in run support? So we're talking about um, – This year and last year. Just in terms year. Of the yeah. So, um, well, I mean, I think Caleb Cost can do that. Okay. You know, and I know that he was someone that they talked about a bunch at the um, – the media stuff the other day. He's played a lot of special teams, yeah, too. but a lot of special teams, which is always a good sign because it shows that the coaching staff trusts trust you. I mean, I think he's the main one within the past couple of years. As for this class, I mean, obviously we, we talked about um, uh, Tayshawn White because um, he just his letter just came in. I mean, he's probably the, the, the other one that I would kind of throw out there, um, it, it kind of fitting that sort of role because I don't think that it's, it's not like – other positions where you're taking multiple players um, because one it's it's not easy to find those guys because there is a little bit of a mentality aspect of it but but two even though you're playing it in North Carolina basically played it full-time it's still not 100 percent full-time I would say you know yeah. um, so you, you know and then there's other you know situations where you can kind of kick in a cornerback in 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 certain situations, like a, clearly if it's a passing down, like third and long sort of thing, maybe you pull in a an extra cornerback, a true cover guy, as opposed to, you know, I think on standard downs, that's when you want to use them mostly. Yeah, and that's – I think that's a lot of the challenge with <clears throat> the development and, and building of a roster. Mm-hmm. And North Carolina is not alone in this regard, but – there's two ways to approach it, right? There, there's one where when you're going against a team that throws the ball all over the place, you need a third corner out there. Mm-hmm. But if you put a guy who's only good at uh, coverage, well, then the other team's going to say, okay, well, they clearly think we're going to be running a lot of passing schemes here. We can run it at him. Mm-hmm. If you put a guy out there who clearly s- his strength is in run support, well, then maybe you can take advantage of him in the passing game. Yeah. Uh, so – Two approaches is, one, where you have enough guys where you can throw a third cornerback in or you can throw a, a big safety in that can do some some run coverage. Or you find a guy who's really a tweener who excels in all those areas, mm. uh, which, as we've talked about, it's just really hard to find that guy. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's easy enough for the Bamas and the Georges of the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's I think that's really the challenge when you're, when you're crafting a defensive style in a scheme – how are you going to fill those positions? It's easy enough to get a field safety and a boundary safety. But when we start talking about all these kind of unique positions, that's where it gets complicated. There are not too many Xavier DB, Virginia Tech guy, and Cam Chancellors walking yeah. through the door. Correct. Yep. And that's the thing is a lot of people, they, we often see 
people compare like well, why you can't they get a cam chancellor why can't they get this why can't they get that i mean those guys don't grow on trees we do have another signee in the books michael merdinger don callahan you and i have talked about this young yeah. man extensively over the past several months he uh, gets to a north carolina quarterback room next year max johnson from texas a&m to transfer connor harrell uh, Jefferson Boaz is moving on. Tad Hudson's still there. I think uh, Russell Tabor moved on. He was a walk-on that was in the room as well. Tell us a little bit about Mergen Merdinger. Yeah, so this was just to kind of, I guess, take a step back here. Um, you know, Chip Lindsey, at this point a year ago, was not the OC, correct? Not yet. No. Okay, so – I guess he took the job later this month, right? Or was it in January? I believe it was January, but don't okay. hold me to that. Um, and so he got a late jump on quarterback recruiting, which is the position that moves the – well, is more advanced calendar than the other positions. So basically you're you, – you, well, UNC already has their 2025 quarterback committed. And, the, that, and, and there's a lot of 2025s. Most of the top 2025 guys – who, uh, okay, so it was about this time. Yeah, December 15th. Yeah. Either way, it's still, you know, he, he got hired um, about a year ago, and the recruiting for the quarterback position had already begun six months prior. That's just, that's just the nature of the position. A little bit behind the eight ball there, but was able to bring in, I think it was three of his, of his top targets, which were two of them were, were semi-national guys, um, for uh, at least one visit, I think actually both of them visit, tw uh, two of them visit twice. They ended up going elsewhere. All three of them ended up going elsewhere. Um, and so a little bit of a scramble situation there. And uh, Merdinger was a guy who backed up the quarterback that Lindsey signed at UCF. Mm -hmm. Hopefully everyone kind of follows that a little bit so he had seen him throw a bunch in practice settings and in, in games and and that sort of thing so he was well aware of him um, this is a kid who is, did not grow up being trained to play the quarterback position like a lot of other quarterbacks do he actually you know there's a story that I think it was um Andrew Ivins did where it talks about how he was actually I think born in Israel I believe and came over to the United States. Someone gave him a football for a gift. Didn't know what the hell to do with it. And eventually they kind of looked on YouTube, saw some videos of Joe Montana. And uh, he basically taught himself how to throw the football. And obviously there came a point where, you know, he's, he's playing for a team and all that. And, and, and that developed a little bit. But a lot of these kids have been taught how... You know, I go to different trainings, and you see on the side, because obviously I'm not there for, for the, the elementary school kids, but you do see on the side some elementary school kids being taught how to throw a football, which blows my mind. Um, but so he wasn't one of these guys. And so uh, and then on top of that, the, the UCF signee was the starting quarterback during uh, Murdinger's junior season, which if you follow recruiting, you know – Junior season is really important on kind of setting your market for um, your recruiting. And so, anyway, so he didn't start until his senior season. Obviously, Lindsey liked what he saw from him, went back and visited him one more time during the spring evaluation period, offered him, and or no, I'm sorry, I think it, what, what it was was he, he wanted to bring him onto campus after that evaluation visit. Uh, Murdinger came for a visit. UNC offered him on the visit, the first day of the visit. I think the visit was multi-day. On the second day, he committed to North Carolina and then became one of North Carolina's better recruiters uh, for this, uh, this class. The, the other part of it, too, is we've known really since spring ball that Carolina was uh, going to sign a quarterback out of the portal under mm -hmm. the assumption that Drake May was going to yep. leave. And I, I have to wonder about the calculus there of it being a situation where you know you've got Connor Harrell, you know you got Tad Hudson, you know you're getting a transfer in to at least compete and most likely take the starting job from Drake May. So given the 
transfer per portal world that we're in now, it's tough to keep a lot of guys on yeah. on uh, staff or on your roster that have potential to play down the road. Yep. And what I mean by that is when you look at this kid who is you know he was signed and or committed in, in May. You know, how much of it, and maybe you know the answer to this, Don, how much was it of, of Chip Lindsey saying, okay, we know we're going to get a transfer in. We know we've already we, – when we do that, we'll have three guys already established on the roster. This is a kid who I think has a lot of potential. He's not a big name. He's a development-type guy. Why not take a risk on him, bring him in, coach him up, and then maybe down the road he can turn into a really good quarterback for us? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't – I don't know if that was the the case, but I but I it wouldn't surprise me if it was, you know, because I, I remember talking to a source when we were kind of laying out just what was happening with their mindset and when they were considering offering Merdinger, um, immediately it was or maybe it was when they had offered him. Immediately it was told to me by the source that we're going to take a um, a quarterback in the portal and it's going to be a dude, and I mean. I don't know. Is is Mac Johnson a dude? I'll just ask you guys. I mean, I think he, you know, he certainly has the rankings coming out of high school. Um, but um, yeah, so so that was definitely, and I think it's a good idea. And I think the you know to to develop a guy, and I think what's important to do that is to make sure the kid understands that that hey, we're going to develop you, and that's probably going to have to be the approach in this transfer portal age of. You, you know, I think you're going to be more more successful if you kind of take a kid and are able to develop him and make sure he understands, hey, we're going to recruit over you for a couple classes, but our hope is that you play in such class. I'm not saying that conversation happened, but I'm saying that if it did, that could be beneficial for North Carolina. I guess you have a – Well, we've got another yeah. um, letter of intent has dropped Peter Przanski. Tampa. And it's Tommy's it just, favorite. It does. It just reminds me of the <laughs> Monsters, Inc. lady. Um, but this is a young man, 6'3", 265 out of Tampa. I deal with all the time. A Jesuit, Jesuit High School in Florida, a, a three-star. One of the earlier commitments, We all, Don, we also talked about him at length on Inside Carolina on the Noon Dish. Um, Don, don't let Don fool you. He loves that I'm on the noon dish with him. I, I mean, do. It makes his week I whenever do. we get it done. But, Don, tell us a little bit about Pazanski. So, Greg earlier, and I think it was when Tommy left, talked about Stick Lane and just the hard hitting and how that kind of, you know, gets a pop from the crowd. It it energizes the defense. You know, kind of that sort of um, – it's like an intangible sort of thing that you can't really evaluate just having that – the energy when you're playing. I think Pazanski has the same sort of thing. If you know he's not yeah, you know, I know he's listed as six three, two sixty five. Uh I don't I don't think he's six three. Um but he, he's definitely not the most uh physically imposing defense alignment that you'll ever see. I'm not trying to disparage him at all. But he plays so much bigger. And he's one of those guys who makes who just plays so hard and he's so energetic that it's contagious for his defense. You can literally see on certain plays where he makes a massive play, and it just energizes the teammates. And that's, I just think that's something that – I mean, it's hard to quantify, so it's difficult to, to evaluate and put it into a scouting report, but it's something that definitely will help, will help your defense. Uh, let me ask you, the greatest ability is what? Availability. But what do coaches want from their players, specifically defensive linemen and offensive linemen? They want motors. Yeah, and because, he has that. Because they can dial back a motor, but it is nearly impossible to get somebody to get one that doesn't have one. I mean, we've seen five-star guys without motors mm -hmm. that don't love football. Pazanski's a guy from talking to you and from and watching him all. You don't have to worry about him playing hard. Mm -hmm. now, he might have some deficiencies – in skill set and all that, but you don't have to worry about effort. And I can promise you this, a fan base, whether it's Carolina's fan base or anywhere across the country, but more so with a team like Carolina, is you got to have guys that have motors that play constantly because they're not going to overwhelm you with the talent. Mm -hmm. And Pazanski is that guy. I think, you know, 6'3", 265 as a high school senior, 
I mean, you probably project that to be 6'3", 280-ish mm -hmm. at Carolina. Um, if he gets to freshman 15, mm -hmm. like everybody else does. And, and so you've got a, a guy there. Greg, you've watched a lot of football. You can tell the guys that burn. And let that that play hard all the time, and this seems like a guy that could do that for Carolina. Well, and in, in hindsight, Kamon Rucker had no business playing on the inside as a freshman, and yet he popped. Yeah. Why did he pop? Well, he had a good burst, but he played high energy ball like you're talking about, Tommy, mm -hmm. and that's carried through. And now he's at a position that actually works for him, and I think he's got a he's got a chance to have a cup of coffee at the next level. Um, because of that. And, yeah, there, there's so many players around the country. I mean, the, the first kid at Florida State, he has all the measurables. He's the right size. He's fast. But when you watch that Florida State defense play, he is the energy guy. Yep. And when you combine that with the measurables that he has, he's likely got a long NFL career ahead of him. Um, and so I think we get so – it makes sense, right, as, as – Fans of the game who don't have the inside of Don Callahan who goes out and watches these kids and watches them up close and understands what they're made of, we look at the numbers. and We say, okay, well, this kid's 6'3", 265. Um, you know, what else do we know about him? Not a whole lot. And we get so stuck on the right size and maybe how fast they are. But if you don't have that burst inside, if you don't have that, that – internal intrinsic motivation you're not going to be able to live up to your full potential and so it's kids like this that are ones that are real exciting and the good thing about them like Kamon Rucker you'll be able to see it the moment they step on the field um you know I mean the the Atkin Atkinson kid uh, mm -hmm. out of Absolutely. Raleigh you know he, he what does he do nothing but make plays right and mm -hmm. he, he doesn't play a lot because he's not quite ready he will be very soon. And so you can see kids like that, and, and hopefully Pazanski is the same type. Um, I mean, you see the guys like three-star guys, if we want to talk about They make to the next level on their hard work and Correct. all that. Right. But when you see – if you can find a five-star guy mm -hmm. that plays like that, you mentioned Verse. Verse wasn't a five-star guy. He went to Albany. But if you get a five-star guy with all the talent, you know, in baseball you call it five tools. In football you just uh, – elite talent that plays like that, then you start talking about guys that have NFL, long NFL careers, Hall of Fame type careers. So give me guys. I always talk about dogs and all that stuff, but just give me a guy that plays hard every time. Bo Atkinson's a great example. Cayman Rucker's a great example. Ant Lane. And Stick Lane is a little fella. I mm -hmm, remember seeing correct. him in the elevator. Yeah. Um, you were with us. Uh, yeah. And yeah, he's not. <laughs> he was he was by far the shortest person in the elevator yeah. that day, and literally he has food there, and he's probably one of the hardest hitters on the Carolina football yeah. team. He would have tore you up in that elevator. Yeah, he would have been like a dag on. <laughs> you <laughs> would have been, like, been. Yeah, if you said, "Hey, little guy," I'd be like a badger. <laughs> yeah, He'd be like a badger, just cleaned the whole elevator out. No, I'd, I'd have hid behind the other people in there. But but the point is, is that give me guys who want to play, who want to play hard, who want to hit people. You know, I often say if I played football, I'd be the one in concussion protocol <laughs> all the time because I'd be out trying to hit people and take people's heads off. And, and Carolina needs more of those by far, especially on the defensive line. I don't care who's coaching them. If you don't have those guys, it's not going to look pretty. And so Pazanski certainly is one of those can, guys. Can I address something real quick? You do not have clean socks. No, I have brand new socks on. So don't show them to Joey. Joey shout out to Joey Powell, Sherelle McMillan. Um, I somebody, don't know how I, can. I got clean, brand new socks on. So folks keep asking about the stickers here on the front. Brand of our new computers. socks. We don't have trophy husbands like Greg has. Yeah. but we had the inside Carolina stickers. We're a step below the trophy husband I have category. An absolute ton of them at home. Shout out to Michelle Hillison um, and Greg. That's the Montrose hat. But shout out to nice. to Michelle Hillison. I ordered a bunch of. I like cooler stickers, like you put on your cooler. So I have a bunch of those inside Carolina stickers. I'm not going to lie. If you want to send me your address or DM me your address, um, folks watching this, I will try to get them out to you um, at some point. But um, I've got there black is, ones and white ones. So There is a question Sherelle has. I have a – why doesn't Hubert blitz more? No, not oh. that one. <laughs> why doesn't Hubert <laughs> score touch how, more? How touchdowns? does the net work? <laughs> you, see the, you see the one I'm talking about? Yeah, Sherelle's question. Yeah, I think it's good that we can all talk about 
Okay, uh, I think this is relevant. And, and shout out to Sherelle. And I have a ton of questions stored, and we will certainly get to a lot of them. But Sherelle's question, why does it seem like, or am I off base, that UNC's highly ranked guys take a while to get on the field? I'll give my uneducated answer. Okay. Part of the reason is Carolina doesn't have as many as other teams have. So you're going to have more hits. Like if you have 25 five-stars and you're Georgia, well, if 20 of them don't play or 23 of them don't play, nobody notices that because you've got the one or two guys like Caleb Downs for mm -hmm. Alabama that are balling out. Carolina – has a lesser pool of quote unquote highly ranked guys, but Don, your your play here. Well, I think the question is somewhat wrong because it's not highly ranked guys; it's guys in general. And, and Tommy and I talked about it before Greg got here, so I'm curious on Greg's take because I would I want answers actually. Why don't true freshmen, more true freshmen, play? And I guess really that answer that question is wrong too because it's really why don't more reserves play at North Carolina? I and mean, that's what it comes down to. Because, I mean, if you're a, you know, true freshman, we can't even talk, begin to talk about why aren't you playing if reserves aren't playing. So, Greg, why doesn't North Carolina, even though Mac Brown has talked about it all offseason, talked about it last offseason, about getting more reserves in, why doesn't North Carolina play more of its, its reserves? It's a great question, Don, and I, I think it is one that's kind of hampered the, the program a little bit. Now, I think part of it, 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 there's this interesting dynamic, and it's a relevant conversation for the basketball team as well, but there are such high expectations that when you get into close ball games, you want to rely on the guys that you can trust. But the, the kind of catch-22 of it is, is throughout the course of the year – the way that you build for future years and the way that you build for the end of the year is by finding opportunities to get younger guys who have earned the right to play playing time. Or even the end of a football game. How many games did North Carolina lose in the fourth quarter? And Mac Brown is always like, I don't know what happened. Well, right. how much does that factor in? Yeah, for sure. And if you look at the last, I know we focus primarily on the last two years, but the last three years, you go back three years ago, Carolina lost four of their last five to Power 5 opponents. Last year, lost our last four to Power 5 opponents. And I guess it was, what, four of the last five so far this year. Well, yeah, and Campbell really doesn't count. Correct, right, right. right. Um, and so you get into this situation of we have a, a troublesome trend where at the end of games, to your point, and really at the end of these seasons, the guys are just worn out. Mm -hmm. And when you're looking at the snap counts – uh, Power Eccles said, great, they're top of the ACC and near the top of Power 5. Elijah Huzzy was up there before he got, got hurt late. Um, a lot of the offensive linemen are. And I don't really know the reason other than you get in these close games. You know, Carolina had so many games decided by a touchdown or less last year. I guess what? Seven games? No, it was nine, it was games, nine games, games last, last year. year. It was six Which, and three. A ridiculous eight. amount. And so you want to have guys on the court or on the field uh, who you trust. But you have to be able to say, okay, well, in the second, in the second quarter, we're going to get enough guys yeah. in and rotate them in so that their snap counts build over the course of the year. Uh, we've talked a lot, and we did it back in 2019, and we still bring it up. But when, when Clemson came to town, Clemson's defensive linemen – we're playing half the amount of snaps of Aaron Crawford and Jason Strobridge. Mm -hmm. Why is that important? Well, one of the guys who was getting – he wasn't getting many snaps, but he was getting a decent amount coming off the bench was Tyler Davis. Mm -hmm. And what was Tyler Davis this year, right? Yeah. I mean, he's a guy that's going to be it's going to be drafted. And it's because he, he built and stacked the number of reps that he got, even though he wasn't like – Even a, as a true freshman, he played a bunch. That's yes. right. And so by the time he got to be a junior and a senior, yeah. he had a ton of experience. Yeah. And people don't like to talk about NC State, I know. <laughs> but if you look at what they've done defensively, last year specifically, they played a ton of dudes. Yeah. And so everybody talked this offseason, ah, oh, they lose Isaiah Moore, ah, oh, they lose uh, whoever the other linebacker, I forget his name. Uh, yeah, they do. Yeah. But guess what? There are guys who can step in because they've played a lot. Mm -hmm. And so it's really this compounding factor. 
And it's an issue that I'm really surprised, given Mac Brown's history and his legacy, that they haven't done a better job with, yeah. especially on the defensive side of the ball. Because when you look at what this team returns defensively, like uh, how many guys, to your point, that are reserves are going to be able to compete and earn playing time and there's not many because they haven't played a lot of snaps. Yeah, it's interesting. Jason Staples, Greg, when we talk on, on that show, he always talks about it's a dot. And then two dots is a line. And then three dots is a trend. And so I think the, the point about NC State, and I can choose any other team in the country if it will placate folks, uh, Georgia. Georgia loses a ton every year. And granted, it's a different level than Carolina, but they lose a ton every year, and they don't really have a drop off because yeah. those guys behind them have played, mm -hmm. and the talent's relative. Um, and Carolina hasn't done that. Somebody in the chat earlier asked, "When are the receivers going to start sending some letters of intent?" Good in? segue. Was well, a good segue to Javarius Green, Shelby Crest, five ten, one ninety. That letter of intent is in. Don, tell us a little bit about young Mister Green. Yeah, so Green is a kid who I think, at least from within the receiver group has probably the highest ceiling just because we, you know, I talked about the, the Atlanta guys, how much they are coached up and how much football that they um, are exposed to, you know, starting at a very young age, <clears throat> a lot of receivers and all the receivers in, in North Carolina's current class, with the exception of Javarius Green, have played a bunch of seven on seven. Green has been a baseball guy up until really about a year ago. You know, baseball he thought was going to be his path to college. He intends on playing baseball at UNC, but make no mistake about it, his focus is football at North Carolina. And once he kind of switched gears and made football the focus, his recruitment kind of um, picked up um, about a year ago, really. And so uh, UNC is one of the one of the schools that offered him last January. He took an official visit there. To Michigan State, Alabama offered him, but I think that was more of kind of like a Plan B sort of situation. He never ended up taking an official visit there, and he ended up committing to North Carolina. The thing that I that I think is most impressive about him, you know, playing for Crest, which those who've been, especially if you follow recruiting for a very long time, Crest is just an absolute powerhouse. Um, and they went undefeated until they lost in the, what was it, the, the quarterfinals of the playoffs. He, on 21.6% of his touches, he scored a touchdown this past season. So he wasn't, he really, if, if you watch on, uh, from a week-to-week -week basis, he really didn't get the ball a whole lot, but when he did, I mean, he scored one or two touchdowns a game, and I think um, he is a guy, I, you probably put him at the slot position, but I think he could play the outside position also. Um, Greg, just how important is that slot role for North Carolina? It's critically important for what what Chip wants to do. Um, I think everybody kind of knows how Phil Longo liked to use that position uh, with Daz Newsom and, and Josh Downs. Uh, and as we saw this this past year, you know, with, with some of the injuries, uh, especially to McCollum, and Kobe Pesor, they were really limited with what they could do out of that slot position. And because they had you know, good tight ends, they were able to, to make up for it. Uh, but when you talk about these modern-day spread offenses, especially when you're utilizing um, kind of the air raid principles, you're, you're running to open grass. And that's, that's the whole concept. So you're, you're giving quarterbacks easy passing lanes because you're, you're scheming up some of these plays where – the quick guys over the middle can just run to where there's an opening. Um, and so when you when you have that as an option, you can really take apart a, a defense, especially if they're trying to stop the run if you've got a good run game because those linebackers have to come downhill, and you can really just kind of throw over top of them. We haven't seen a, a ton of the screen game with Chip Lindsey yet, but I imagine you know if, if Chapman had hung around, we would see – we saw a little bit of that with him – I think we'll see more of that in the years to come. Um, and so the, the opportunity is there really for that slot position to, to thrive. And when you, when you pair that with some guys on the outside who can get vertical like a Tez Walker type, all of a sudden you're really stretching the field and that's where that slot receiver can really feast underneath. It is interesting 
you mentioned the screen game, how, I mean, Carolina would throw a bubble screen every other play, it seemed like, or one of those little tunnel screens all the time, and then they've really vanished. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't – I don't know if that's just flat out scheme or well blocking or, or you know part of it's the idea it kind of gets into the the heart of the, the air raid. But Larry Fedora was very much a guy who was short passes, long gains, um, and that's why he he really loved the Ryan Switchers of the world because you can make a very quick and easy pass, and if you set up some blocks, well if you know as they used to say with with Switzer, he's tough to tackle in a phone booth, mm-hmm. um, and if he only has to break one tackle. Well, you feel pretty good about that. And that's that's really what Carolina has lacked. And they didn't utilize Josh Downs really in, in that in that way. He just did a really good job of creating space and, and separation, you know, 10 to 15 yards down the field. And so Sam Howell was able to utilize him in that regard. Um, but having a guy that, that can move and make plays, and that's the, that's the interesting thing here um, you know, with, with Green, is when a kid has done – highlighted can, can make stuff happen in limited touches mm-hmm. that that hints at a kid having just that it ability to make something out of nothing and that's that's a key component when you're trying to get these guys isolated where they only have to make one maybe two guys miss uh, uh got more on that because it's it's interesting um you know some of the national the quarterbacks moving places and all going to to different like Will Rogers going to Washington, who loves to throw deep. Will Rogers' specialty is throwing those passes that we're talking about. Yep. But let, let me get to – I expected him to come over here and announce, Don. I'm really dif- disappointed. Uh-huh. But Malcolm Ziegler. Yeah. Letter well, maybe he would have if he wasn't already on campus. Yes, that's accurate. <laughs> yeah, we, we should have picked him up and brought him over here. Maybe we he could have picked up I actually up the have bumped into him a few times. Usually it's at – yeah, he, he was at one of Holly Springs football games, and there was somewhere else I saw him. That we bumped into each other. He is a. Uh, he's got the potential to be a good one for North Carolina. Yeah. He is a local guy. Don sort of tell everybody what Ziegler is already bringing to yeah. Carolina since he is one of the ones on campus at practice. So I think the main thing with him is that when you are, I know it's like cliche that checking the boxes, but there are box checks checks that you do to kind of project a guy for potential NFL. You know, size, speed, and and that, and there's certain requirements based off the position, and he meets those. So his measurables are definitely there. Six three, two hundred pounds. He's long. Uh, he has uh, his he, he, tremendous speed. Ten point seven six seventy six seconds in the one hundred meter dash, and when you watch him, Fuquay Arena doesn't play a whole lot of of um, passing teams. Um, so, you, but you still see that athleticism and that burst when you watch him uh, watch him play offense. They run s- some sort of like wing tee sort of thing, and and you just see when he cuts the corner and that sort of thing. Um, but then even on you know defense, there's one play. I think the, the very first play of his highlights where he's on the opposite side of the field. The ball carrier is literally down, just goes down the field, and you can kind of see. Ziegler slowly kind of walk him down and this in normal circumstances this kid would have easily have scored but Ziegler tracks him down makes a tackle you know and it wasn't even like right at the goal line it was about 10 yards before getting to the goal line and that just kind of speaks to just his speed and he has that long stride which makes it so deceptive Um, you know as I kind of mentioned before about you know he's not a kid who has he doesn't as far as I know, didn't do the whole seven-on-seven seam. So he's, and he doesn't play a whole lot of advanced uh, passing offenses. So um, he's going to require some um, development. But um, the tools are definitely there to be developed, to be really a, a great safety for North Carolina. Yep, 6'2", 198 out of Fuqua Arena. Um, if ever there was a, a young man that was destined for North Carolina, if folks aren't aware of his story, um, back I don't know how long ago, ten years ago maybe, Carolina did the have a family on the field message from the 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 parent that's in overseas in the military and Ziegler and his 
pops come out on the field. So a lot of people said, is he going to go elsewhere? Is he going to go to state? Or is he going to go somewhere else to school? Or, I mean, the man was a Carolina guy since birth, basically. Yeah. And, uh, and Georgia offered him towards the end. Yeah. I think it was like November Georgia offered him. And I immediately thought, I mean, this is a Georgia kid. This is what Georgia – I mean, Georgia specifically goes after those NFL bodies, and they don't care what type of football player you are because their their mentality is is we're going to take those measurables and we're going to basically beat it out of you to become a football player if, yeah. if, if you're not there yet. I mean, obviously, if you already are producing on the football field, that gives you a leg up there. But um, they love those NFL buys. I mean, um, Jordan Davis, who played at Georgia, was not a very good high school football player. He just wasn't. But he was a massive human being who moved well. Georgia brought him in and you know turned him into what he was a first round draft pick by the Eagles, yeah. right? I mean, and so I, a lot of people bring up why didn't North Carolina recruit Jordan Davis? Well, North Carolina did. They didn't put the pressure on him as much as Georgia did, primarily because he was a terrible high school football player, but, but that's what Georgia does. They just take the body types and then figure out the rest later. That that is where culture in your program comes in yeah is a giant thing is that you have a i think he was a three-star guy yeah went to georgia turned into a first round draft pick and then at other schools carolina you have five-star guys that people say don't that that aren't producing what yeah. they should i mean that is i think greg and i'll get you in here and and i don't say that to take a shot at anybody it's it's there for people to see is that if you're going to if you're going to recruit the big dogs, you need to push them to be at the level they're supposed to be at, and then you got to develop your three, two, three, four star guys. And Greg, I think that has been one thing. If if we can discuss that about the North Carolina football program over the years, that's one thing that I think has been a little lacking, to be honest, at least from my perspective. Well, it's it's the the pressure cooker aspect, is that when you you take a kid and you strip down the recruiting rankings when he steps on campus and says. You forget forget what you may have been before you got here, but from from here to the time you leave, uh, we're going to push you, and it's going to be hard, and we're going to coach you up, but it's going to be 50-50. We're going to push and push and push, and you've got to embrace it. Yep. Um, and that is easier said than done, and that's why it takes time to build a program, and that's why it's difficult to relay what a coach's intent is to a point to where the entire staff, not just the coaches, but the support staff and all the way down, understands what it's going to take to reach that threshold. Um, Dave Doran has kind of done that with what his team has become in state. It has taken him a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they have an idea of what they want to be. Now, they don't recruit well enough to compete with, you know, for ACC titles yet or you know, with some of the elite teams. But you kind of know what you're going to get in terms of the mentality when you walk into that program. Um, I think that's still a question mark for where we are with Mac Brown five years in. I, I got a question for you, Don. In, in fairness, it's up to the player ultimately to do it. Oh, yeah. Right? And, and so when you're watching these guys in high school, have you been on the, the trail and watched a guy – regardless of where they're ranked, and said, in your mind, that guy's going to be that guy. As and he and he turned out to be that guy. As far as as, as far as what? Seeing like a future NFL or a future high-level college player. Can you tell watching them at practice in high school, especially on the field in high school, and just talking to them in general? Yeah. I mean, I can remember going to Jadavian Clowney's practice <laughs> – and well, you you definitely pick the the free yeah of the bunch, yeah so. yeah i mean that's the one first one that kind of pops into my mind um veteran move there Thomas. because uh <laughs> well, it, well here here's the story is that i go there and i obviously need some photos and he only played two reps of the team aspect of practice and so i'm kind of frustrated because i want more photos so i said to the coach hey are you going to put him out there again he said yeah uh, I'll, I'll wait a little bit. We can't have him play too much because we can't run our offense because he blows up every single play. And so, you know, you see that, especially when he's goofing off in between 
that time and not taking it serious, but then he gets on the football field and just absolutely blows it up. But, um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that, you know, and Greg mentioned it earlier about the story about Bobby Massey, is that you do see these kids just absolutely dominant in certain situations, and then you're like, well, look who he's going up against. How serious can I take it? Is he going to be able, is that going to transition to the um, to the next level? So there's a little bit of that aspect. You know, um, I think I probably have been more wrong in those situations. I was a big uh, Chris Leak fan, and he didn't have much of a, yeah, he didn't have. Chris Leak autograph picture. It is on a Chris. Yeah, it wall. is a Chris Leak autograph picture, and he what he was he ended up at the Chicago Bears and and really didn't do much in the NFL. Had a had a you know won a national championship at Florida. Um, Elijah Hood was probably my running back guy, and you know there were some you know uh, girlfriend things that probably contributed to that situation, but um, but yeah. And I do want to give I want to give a shout out to uh, my daughter's in here. She doesn't have a real name, so she's the one who's who's kind of trolling us in that I chat. I was going to say, who is this young lady that's talking smack? And it's your child. It is my Can child. Can you cut the Wi-Fi? It, well, she's not here. <laughs> she's sending me screenshots. This is you know goofy screenshots. Yeah. Let let me reset it a little bit. We're we're two hours and forty minutes into our live show. This stuff flies. I mean, I literally. I don't know about y'all, but I literally could sit here all day doing this because we have me, like me twelve too. or thirteen questions. And all. I know, I mean, I the know company you, that we're with is, this is cannot the, get any better. Well, to 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 be fair, this is really your only adult interaction of, of the day. <laughs> yeah, so. no, you're right about that. But shout out to the two sixty or so folks that are in here. North Carolina National Signing Day, Inside Carolina's Live Signing Day, Johnny T-shirt, congruity, and all. Um, Don, your daughter wants to skip school. I'll let you handle that. You might want to get off air to do that. Greg Barnes here. That's Don Callahan. I'm Tommy Ashley. Shout out to everybody here. Greg, um, as we watch these high school letters of intent roll in, when you sort of take into account all of this North Carolina season, where are you as far as the status of this program right now? That's a deep question here as we wait the next letter of intent. That is a deep question, Tommy. Um, this is this is an interesting question, too, because we, we start talking about expectations, and that really kind of warps our, our perspective on a lot of these things. People took offense, uh, and, and I understand it wasn't Mac, who is fantastic in terms of addressing the public and, and handling the media. He gets frustrated, too, at times. But the comment about eight wins is, is good around here was probably not uh, mm. the best comment to make. However, what can, can I ask, though, like it, I think people do forget and I don't want to be a Mac Brown defender, but people do forget how bad this program was on, on not just I mean, there was good years, but there was a lot of bad years. And Mac Mac has kind of raised it a little bit. But you are Correct. missing the point of the anger. At that yes. comment, I think. Yeah, Greg's yeah, 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 yeah. Break it down. So, yeah, Larry Fedora won 19 games in a two-year stretch, and it was really the best stretch of football that Carolina's had since the the 96, 97 seasons. Two years later, he's gone, and I think kind of the the great point of that is is that Larry Fedora was paid 12 million dollars not to coach, and that speaks to the importance of of winning. Uh, that football fans and athletic departments are willing to put forth that kind of money. Now, that's chump change compared to what Texas A&M is paying Jumbo, of course. $76 million. <laughs> that's Bobby Bonilla money Yeah, to not do a damn thing. Yeah. That's what I want. I wish that, that I could get that great, with Inside Carolina. I right? know. We're going to pay you two twenty five. dollars Buck, Buck, Buck is in the chat. Is there any way that you can pay me? I wouldn't. It doesn't even have to be. <laughs> It doesn't even have to be a million dollars. You got a sweatshirt. Yeah, I mean. You are well compensated for what you do. <laughs> Tom, finish your point, Greg. We're so, being stupid. So the the fact that North Carolina won nine games last year, uh, they've, they've won eight games this year with a chance to get to nine wins. It's hard to argue that, kind of to Don's point, that that's not an elevated status for where North Carolina has traditionally been. Hopefully we can all agree on that. 
Now, is this program where everybody wants it to be? No, it's not. Because there is a lot of potential. North Carolina has recruited very well since Mac Brown has been on board. That's kind of what he does. Um, and so there's there's the hope that okay, if this is the the ground floor moving forward, Buck this said is no. the standard. Buck said no to my question. <laughs> if if eight to nine wins is the the kind of the baseline moving forward, are things taking place that needs to get North Carolina to that next level? I think the biggest question for everybody is, what does Mac Brown do about the defense? Because the defense right now is an albatross. And it has been, you know, in 2019, there was a lot of potential on that team. And I thought Jay Bateman did some good things. It's really flatlined and gotten worse since. That has to be addressed. And I think if Mac Brown kind of took the step to address that part of things, people would feel much better. The, the other component, and there's a lot here, that we can we can get into, but why don't we go ahead and get to this new news, Tommy? Yeah, we got another uh, letter of intent has come in. I think number sixteen, Khalil Conley out of Christ School in Arden, North Carolina. Don, a six foot one seventy athlete. Um, where does he project? Um, and also a three star guy, a North Carolina kid, another North Carolina signee. I think he's on campus as well. Yes. And he's one of the select group that's practicing for the bowl game. But where do you see him projecting? What's he bring? So I think he could play corner, but I think he's such an athlete that you, we probably want to wait to see where he kind of fits. I think we'll get more information on that once uh, spring practice starts and you guys are able to kind of lay all eyes on that situation. But I think initially I would start out with corner with him, but this is a kid who, who actually played quarterback at Ash, Asheville High School and you know his four years, or I'm sorry, his first three years, then transferred to Christ School, reclassified, and played what was supposed to be his senior year of high school, which turned into his junior year because he reclassified. He initially started at receiver there, and they realized during that season that he might be a better DB. So he made that transition. That got him some attention from, from, from schools, including North Carolina. And that got him the offer um, last January after you know, watching him kind of work out at, at Christ School, which have either of you, I'm assuming, have not been to Christ School because it's in the mountains, middle of nowhere. Yeah, I was going to ask you to sort of tell people what Christ School is all about. It's so way up there. It is, it is actually... Um, it's just outside of Asheville, absolutely beautiful. You know the the I mean, any school in that area, even like AC Reynolds, I like Asheville High School because it's like an older high school. But no matter where you go, you always have the mountains in the background, you know, um, the trees, all that sort of stuff. So beautiful. But you, so you have all of those elements that all those schools have. But this is like basically a mini college. And then I remember when I was walking around with the, the, the head coach there. First of all, their facilities are amazing. Like, they look literally look like college facilities when you're walking through and you have the big pictures of, of the players and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's amazing and, and kind of like a Hall of Fame sort of thing. But we're walking around, and he's like, oh, you see that kid there? He actually holds the – it was some sort of track record for cross country or whatever. And, and then he's like, oh, this kid, this. You know, it wasn't football related. It was just different – athletic um, achievements for some of these kids. So it's a school that tries to attract a lot of those kids there. And what they have been doing in football, particularly the last few years, is bringing in kids, doing the whole reclassifying thing, if that works for their situation, and um, and really kind of building a very powerful team. Now, if you look at their record, they finished four and seven, you'd be like, oh, that's not really a powerful football team. But their schedule. They play I mean, everybody. They, yeah, they traveled and they played um, some really. Imp I think they played Carrollwood in um, Florida, which was loaded with like two five star receivers and a, and a four star running back. Um, and they play some other teams. They they had to play um, Raven Gap, which we talked about earlier. They had to play Providence Day. Um, so they got beat up a bunch during the season. But they have talent. Um, I, you know, they had the you know um, the kid on. Um, at linebacker, who I, I felt like was the best player in the state, um, uh, Caden Jones was on their on their defense also. So it's a very talented team, and they definitely have the resources to kind of help their kids. Didn't those three Duke basketball players yeah. play there? Yeah, I think so. I can't call their name, but I'm pretty sure they all went up there. Yeah. 
But anyway, Khalil Conley, athlete on campus now, uh, along with a couple of receivers and a couple other guys. Let me ask you a question. That big boy is Lonnie Galloway's child? Yeah. Did you see the picture? Yeah, yeah, Hayes. Yeah. Well, let me tell you this. So he has a younger son, too, who's playing on the offensive line of Providence Day, who I think is going to be pretty big time. He, I think he's a 2027. 20, he looks like he could he can go into the gas station and buy buy a six pack <laughs> without a problem. He probably can at some of them. Yeah. Here. Yeah. But he plays on that offensive line, which has three guy three guys who have you know offers, including David Sanders, who's the top recruit for the 2025 class but anyway that picture was incredible yeah I mean that is a big young man and he's a good player he was I know um he's probably going to be discredited a little bit because his dad's on the coaching staff but I've seen this kid in plenty of camp situations and um to be a walk-on I mean that's that if we were going to relatively speaking rank and rate Walk-ons, he'd probably be a five-star walk-on, to be honest. I mean, he's, he's a kid who would be a scholarship player, probably at like a group of five school, to be honest with you. So to get that sort of kid as a walk-on, is, it would not surprise me if eventually he was put on a scholarship and he was contributing at North Carolina at some point. Uh, Greg, we sort of bounced around a little bit with some of our stuff we've been talking about. I was trying to star some questions. Uh, let me, Slagle asked this, and this, Slagle is another one of our regulars on here. So I was going to ask, since you're here, Greg, um, of course we're in the middle of signing day, but this is a relevant question as the bowl game, I guess, is a week from today, mm -hmm. I guess, um, Carolina and West Virginia. Do you expect coaches to give some younger guys some run in the bowl game, guys like Green? We mentioned Travion Green. And it seems like it would help for next season. Greg, I don't think there's any choice. Right. Uh, and and so yes, I believe we'll see some of those guys. Who, who following this team, watching this team, who do you want to see aside from Connor Harrell? We need to see a full game from Connor Harrell. Um, who do you think is, is should be the most watched for this group next week, or excuse me, a week from today? Well, I think the offensive line is kind of the the key part of it because they're they're losing so many guys. Um, and I know they got the kid coming in from from Georgia, which which will be beneficial. But Willie Lampkin, I think kind of the plan for him coming in was, yeah, if, if Gaynor comes back, which he did, he's going to be center. Lampkin can get, get some experience at guard, then move to back to center, which is where he played at Coastal. Uh, and so that that's the obvious fix there. But then after that, it's really a matter of, okay, who's going to be the, the next group of offensive linemen to really step up? Because – if you really look at North Carolina's offensive line the last couple of years, yes, they've had a lot of veteran guys, but they've played a, a ton of reps. There hasn't been a lot of the younger guys who have gotten opportunities. And so we've seen the same names time and time again. And it seems like the offensive line has, you know, the ceiling has not been as high as maybe people would hope it would be. Well, now there's going to be no choice. We're going to actually see what some of these young guys, like a Travion Green, and I know we saw a lot of Diego Pounds this year. But let's see what some of those other young guys um, have done. I know everybody's really focused on on Zach Rice for obvious reasons with him being a five-star guy. Uh, but Malik McGowan's a guy that's gotten a lot of uh, positive press from the, the coaches. You know, Jonathan Adorno's been on, on the team for a long, long time. Green's a guy that has a lot of um, uh, a lot of praise uh, – Grigsby's been another guy that's gotten a lot of praise. So I think there's potential, but it would be really beneficial for people to see, hey, this is what the offensive line most likely is going to look like moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I know some of the some of the older guys are still with the team, obviously. But to see them get some more run will be very beneficial. And then I think it's, it's also a matter of on defense, however many guys you can work into the rotation – to kind of show that, hey, there's not as big of a drop-off as maybe it seems, that will provide a lot of a lot of uh, optimism maybe going into the offseason because that's what this program needs more than anything is hope for the future. And we can dive more into that, but that in terms of kids playing, I think the more, the more that are able to see playing time in the bowl game, the better it is for offseason morale. We have got another letter of intent in – 17 
Andrew Rosinski. Great name. Great name, Don Callahan. Tell you us like, a little bit about. You like these Polish last <laughs> names. <laughs> I mean, that's another monstrous ink, right? Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> Rosinski. Uh, 66282. Just a, another big guy, another Georgia guy. What's he bringing? Well, first, can I tell you, I found the scissors in the my man kid's said bathroom. This, uh, the so, shout out. Scissors? Yeah, in the, in the kid's bathroom. So, Don is asking for scissors for Christmas so he can have a pair of no, scissors. Well, in if room. I get scissors, they will be missing almost immediately because that's one of those items in the house that we cannot just keep a hold of. All right, so, Rosinski. I mentioned earlier how Jaden Patterson made a huge, got a huge bump in the rankings during not this most recent, but the one prior rankings update. The other guy that got a big bump was Andrew Rosinski. Went from, I think it was like a mid three star guy to a, a mid, yeah, mid, mid three star guy to a four star status, which is pretty significant considering he wasn't this, um, you know, when he committed to North Carolina, it wasn't like, Georgia and Alabama and Clemson were, were recruiting him. He was another one that really kind of focused in on the academic schools and really just visited those schools in January and committed to UNC by the end of that month and was one of the earlier commitments and stuck to it, visited Chapel Hill whenever he could. Uh, and, you know, he was a guy who – there was a question in the, in the chat about Florida making a late run on – Tommy's other favorite person, Pazanski. Pazanski. Um, I know that Auburn made a, a late run on Rosinski. So, um, but uh, you know, he, they weren't interested. His family wasn't interested. They're they're really they're really high on their situation in North Carolina, like the coaching staff and that sort of thing. But this is a kid we talked about earlier about the difference between a a guard and a tackle. This is a kid who's tall. You know, what would they have them listed as? Six, six. Right at six, seven, yeah. Yeah, yeah six, seven, um, but athletic. And and also the other thing, which I didn't talk about, the flexibility. I remember watching him. If you watch him on film, he is he's yeah, clearly he's, he's six, 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 seven, but he gets down low um, and plays with really good leverage, which is so important for offensive linemen because, as we've learned, if you've played Pop Warner football, low man wins – well, it's, it's really important in the trenches. And so if you're tall, you really need the flexibility to kind of get down, get low. And he has that flexibility. And there's other aspects that obviously flexibility helps out with. But he has the length that Greg talked about earlier. He has the athleticism. I think he could develop into a quality left tackle for North Carolina. Randy Clements, mm -hmm. another guy. And, and – Bill Rosinski, the longtime voice of the Carolina Panthers, his granddad. So it's a cool, cool dynamic there. Um, you can never have too many offensive linemen in the pipeline. And back to the discussion we were having, Greg, with the offensive linemen, it seems like Carolina's had the same four or five for three or four years because they have. Yeah. And so now to the point of the bowl game, you're going to see a few different names. But starting next season, you're going to see a lot of different names on this offensive line folks are going to need that roster to find out who's that guy playing and it's just hugely important to have consistency you mentioned the number of of coaches earlier and i quite frankly thought randy clements might go with his buddy levy i think to mississippi state um but clements is, is back assumingly back next year it gives some consistency there for sure that kind of gets back into our conversation earlier about you know, why are more kids not playing? And I, I think we're going to have a, some, some answers to those questions next year. Um, and I think people look at it kind of from a uh, trepidation type angle of saying, well, clearly the backups aren't near as good as the starters. Well, if that's true, then that's a significant problem. I don't think that's the case. Mm -hmm. I think it's just a matter of you know, coaches know what they can trust wholeheartedly and don't want to deviate from that any. Mm -hmm. um, I really expect, especially along the offensive line, that for the next year or two, you're going to see these new names, see these new kids. You're going to be like, well, why wasn't that kid playing more earlier? Mm -hmm. And that's a difficult question for the coaching staff to be able to answer. But you start seeing kids like Rosinski and some of these other guys that we mentioned earlier, Grigsby and um, Travion Green. I mean, these kids look the part. And the coaching staff has really talked them up. 
and they've got good ratings coming out of high school. I think there's a lot of potential there. Yeah. Um, and that, that should bode well for the future. But we'll have to ultimately see, and hopefully starting with the bowl game next week, we'll, we'll get to see some of these kids. I think an interesting dynamic here with the offensive line, and, and this is important, I think, because if you have to mine the transfer portal for linemen, the top level ones are going to command. Uh, first of all, the top level ones are going to be wanted by all the big boys, mm -hmm. and they're going to command a ton of money. Correct. And you can get in the portal, and you can uh, get a, a receiver or a defensive back or, or something like that for relatively quote unquote relatively cheap, but you're not going to get a high flight offensive lineman in the portal without paying through the nose. And so, why is that important? It's important because you got to develop them. Yeah. And for North Carolina to be able to develop players, I mean, they got Willie Lampkin last year. And I, you could argue, I think, successfully argue that Willie was the best offensive lineman but on the here, team this year. But here's the thing with Willie is his size. But he w that's exactly my and point. And so, so schools like Georgia, Alabama, they're not even going to even look at him once they see the, the, the size. But this kind of goes to a bigger question is – a lot of fans are like, well, why North Carolina just just recruit the, the portal? The problem is, is can North Carolina get a kid like Drake May out of the portal? I don't think so. No chance. Can they get a kid like Omarion Hampton out of the portal? Mm -hmm. The best okay. chance to get – I mean, I can go on and on and on, but the best chance to get those sort of guys is to get them out of high school. Not, develop them is the key part, but also make sure that – they want to stay in North Carolina mm -hmm. and that because the, not everybody is making decisions purely off of money. You know, there are other factors in there. And if you are comfortable someplace and some places offering you a lot more money, I mean, if you if you know, the ru the rumors and everything like that are to be believed or what things people have said about the money that was being thrown at Drake May um, to leave last year, um, Clearly, there were other factors that were in play for him that made him decide to stay in North Carolina. Obviously, it's a little bit different for him because of his family ties to the program and to the school. But, you know, Hampton, you know, there was a lot of talk of just the opportunities he would have had. And I'm sure he's aware that if he would have went to the portal, he would have had a lot of opportunities. But North Carolina did a really good job of saying of, of making him feel comfortable, making the other factors outweigh the, the money potential going into the portal. Yeah, I, I mean, the thing is, is that, and, and fans, you know, this is where fandom comes in, right? It, it, it's a blend, and Greg, you can speak to this. It's a blend of uh, TV money coming into the schools and, and how that's allocated. So North Car a team like North Carolina, and I don't speak in absolutes, but in generalities, a team like North Carolina require, that's in the ACC, has to improve facilities for the most part by donors and has to have donors you know you get people's names on buildings and in rooms because they gave a lot of money these other schools and these other conferences and correct me if i'm wrong greg they get all this tv money they're able to push that tv money and the media money to the facilities and then whatever the donors and it's not totally cut and dry like this, but whatever the donors are donating can go to NIL and to be used for that. So North Carolina fans that don't like what Carolina gets in the portal, that don't like certain things, can certainly donate to an NIL collective. And I'm not advertising for it. I'm just saying it's what it is. Carolina needs that kind of those kind of donations more so than a team like Alabama does, simply because Alabama's got money to give – guys because they've got tv money i've told the story about a friend of mine whose son goes to alabama and every building on campus is brand new not just a football place but everywhere and they're like oh that's football money yeah. and so all the donations or whatever go to nil and, and talking about the portal that is the portal is is the rubber meets the road where that becomes a big factor sure and the problem for north carolina and the reason there's such a a stress point in play here is that the divide between the haves and the have-nots, talking about the Big Ten and the SEC and everybody else, is only expanding, and it is expanding rapidly. You know, projections are by the, the end of this decade, 
uh, SEC's teams are going to be pulling in double what the ACC schools will be pulling in. But I believe I was looking at it the other day because we had the conversation on the basketball board. I believe Maryland pulled in fifty-five million this year. Maryland. Maryland. And UNC was twenty million less than that. So the the issue that North Carolina has, and this is a conversation that's taking place behind the scenes, is where do you want to push your fans and your boosters for money? Because all those things you just said is exactly right, Tommy. And when you have a very small pool of money that you're you're trying to extract from, do you want that money to go to scholarships and facilities and coaching contracts? Or do you want to really push the NIL collectives and risk taking money out of that pot to pay for NIL, NIL contracts? And it is a legitimate issue, and it is a serious conversation, conversation that's taking place. Now, that's a whole part of this other conversation. Let's get back to kind of where we are with where the program is right now. And we laid out the fact that eight to nine wins is really good for this program. What has to change moving forward, for one, the most glaring issue is defense. But let's look at what's happened over the last five years. There is such a thing called momentum drag. And when, when Mac Brown came in, and this goes for every single program, when you make a new hire, regardless really of who it is, there is this immediate optimism within the fan base. You can raise money. Everybody knows it's going to take a couple years. Then you can really take off and start competing if it's to happen. Most of the time it does not happen. But with North Carolina, because Mac Brown is such a great recruiter, Carolina had three consecutive years of top 15 recruiting classes. And North Carolina, on average, and Don, correct me if I'm wrong, but typically, if you go back to the John Bunning years, you know, fringe top 25 is what Carolina has done on the recruiting trail. Mm -hmm. well, what has happened the last two years? Last year, Carolina was just outside the top 25 in their recruiting rankings. And this year, at this very moment, I believe they are number 25. So there has been a pullback a little bit of what Mac Brown has been able to do on the recruiting trail. That's that momentum drag of things not transpiring the way maybe the banner. Uh, did we lose the banner? Yeah. Um, <laughs> not continuing on the way that they have been. Exactly. When you combine that with the fact that Carolina had two elite quarterbacks in Sam Howe and Drake May, who have now departed the program, and there's not a lot to capitalize on what they did, all of a sudden there's this concern of UNC is not taking advantage of these opportunities. And now maybe we're seeing status quo. Where that gets into play with the portal, and we can get to this bit of news in just a second, but with the portal, Carolina currently does not have the money to play with the big boys in the portal. Right. They can get a couple guys. They can't maybe get the elite guys. So you have to be able to recruit well. And when I say recruit well, it's not just recruiting rankings. It's being able to pinpoint and evaluate properly get them on campus, and then coach the heck out of them so that a lot of guys on your roster are guys that other teams want. You talked about Wake Forest being a farm system. That's what you want if you're Wake Forest. You want your guys to be good enough that everybody else comes calling. That's a separate problem, but that's the first step in the process. In Carolina right now, I don't believe is in that position where they've coached up enough guys and developed them enough to where you can say, hey, we have so many guys that are coming up through the system, we can afford to lose a few in the portal, and we're still building as a program. That's the noise kind of surrounding the program rest right now, and that's what Mac Brown has to figure out how to address in the next couple of years. It is an interesting dynamic that's going on with Carolina football. We've got another NI or letter of intent drop. Is it Yanni or Johnny? Uh, um Janai. Janai Norwood. Janai. My uh, my apologies, Mr. Norwood. Interior offensive line, 6'4", 300, Eastern, Rams, Eastern Randolph out of Ramsour. Don, what's, what's the big man bring? I saw a picture with him and Mac yeah. on campus as well. He made Mac look like a, a little fella. Yeah, well, we talked about uh, size a little bit, um, and this is a kid who definitely has size, 6'4", 300 pounds. And I think one of the problems with size sometimes is that listed size and actual size 
most people take some liberties with the actual size. I mean, the, the, the tip that people will often say is you knock off two inches, knock off 10 pounds sort of thing. This is a kid who I remember going to his high school for the first time, and he definitely is a 6'4", 300 pounds. Um, but, you know, he actually holds the weight really well, but he's an impressive-looking kid. You know, he's being brought in as an offensive lineman. But I, I got to tell you, you know, just watching his film, particularly his senior footage, you know, his, his defensive line film is pretty impressive. And it wouldn't shock me if ultimately that's where he ended up. You know, he's – there's that word nimble, um, light on his feet, as Tommy likes him. And, uh, you know, and that works really well – playing that defensive tackle position, you know, uh, he's a guy that for, I just, for the life of me, don't understand why other schools didn't kind of jump in on him. I know he committed to North Carolina pretty early. And he's at a school that, I mean, it's not necessarily in the middle of nowhere, um, but it's not really, you know, um, Greensboro. It's, it's kind of right there off of 64. You know, it's a smaller school. They, they play 2A ball, or, or it might even be 1A ball. So I, I don't understand why more schools didn't recruit him, to be honest with you, because I think he's a really good player, and I think North Carolina really got a steal on this kid. Yeah, I saw him on campus earlier. I think, did I text you and say? I can't remember when it was. It was back during his recruiting process. Just a big, big young man. I, I'm not quite sure how they feed these kids when they're 15, 14, yeah. 15. Could you imagine if your son was 6'4", six, 6'5", six, 300 pounds? I'm in the poorhouse now, and my, my kid is half his size. <laughs> Legitimately half his size. It is a, it is crazy. But Norwood, Eastern Rams, Randolph, Ramsour, ranked in the 800s nationally. But if Don – let me ask you this, Don. Mm -hmm. Most important position to recruit outside of quarterback – Good defensive lineman, good offensive lineman. It's a good question. Um, I mean, if we're if we're taking out, if we're looking at it in a vacuum and taking out the fact of, you know, the hit rate, which we talked about earlier, how how few of these offensive linemen hit. Um, I think offensive line. I, I still think offensive line. Um, I mean, I, I could see the argument for defensive line. I think it's really really close. Um, I mean, maybe I'm, now I'm thinking about it, maybe I would go defensive line just because of just the impact that even a single defensive lineman can make on a um, in a game. Uh, whereas a single offensive lineman, I guess if, if you could be the best offensive lineman, it wouldn't be uh, it wouldn't matter if the guys around you aren't very good. But um, yeah, so I go defensive line. I want to come back to this because I think this is an important discussion, the offensive line, defensive line discussion. But we have another letter of intent, folks, uh, showing some angst about wide receiver letters coming in. Alex Taylor in Greensboro native. Don, tell us about Alex Taylor. Yeah, so this was actually, if you look at North Carolina's commitment list, I think this was one of the more competitive recruitments. It's, it's easy to forget about because he's been committed since um, July. But this was a kid who really, for a while there, Clemson won it pretty heavily. And then um, it filled up at the position, but still it told him that they, they would take him. Um, and he would admit to the fact that this was basically a two-school race between Clemson and North Carolina. Uh, but he also took official visits to Penn State, Virginia Tech, and NC State. And... Um, officially visit North Carolina during that final weekend. That's when he made his decision. We actually have a pretty cool you know, story we ran yesterday or Tuesday um, that probably needs to be altered a little bit because of some things that have happened since. But, oh no, yeah, we ran it Tuesday, yeah. Um, but this is a kid who uh, you know, plays basketball, and you can see the athleticism, the explosiveness on the basketball field, um, basketball court. Um, I think on the football field, you know, you um, you see that playmaking ability. You know he's a guy who can go deep, but can also you know he basically can kill a defense on all levels of the football field. He could take the screen, he could take the short pass. He's elusive. He can make the you know the the big grab, the jump ball, that sort of thing. Um, and he's just an overall athlete. And he played for what has become recently a school that is just developing talent at an unbelievable rate. Every single class, Grimsley High School, has had recruits since, I guess, you know, was it 
no, couldn't, I feel like there was somebody else. Maybe was it Travis Shaw was the first one in a, in a while. I think Travis Shaw kind of started off. Have Jamal Jarrett, wasn't he? Well, but Jamal he Jarrett was a, yeah. Jamal Jarrett was after Shaw. Mm. So so I guess it was Shaw Jarrett, and then uh, the the group of wide receivers this class. There's a there's an edge rusher for the next class, and the 26th class UNC has offered their quarterback. So Grimsley is just uh, just you know a conveyor belt of of talent a, of talent for sure. Where did Alex Taylor commit? What's that? Where did Alex Taylor commit? He committed to North Carolina. Where did he do it? He did it um, on Inside Carolina Live, in, man. Did he? Yeah, that's the one we did because. Oh, Jackson oh, that's right. That's, that's right. Yes. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I Come forgot. On, man. I must have been doing something else that day. Don is. is <laughs> I was is, carrying you that day. <laughs> <laughs> is is Alex a guy? Um, that's more possession receiver. Is he a guy that can kind of take the top off of a defense with his size and jumping ability? So I think he's he's not he's kind of like um, I don't think there's any aspect of him that is like tremendous. Like I don't think he's like this take the top off guy, but he can do that. I don't think he's like that elusive guy, but he could do that. I think he can. He's basically is good at everything, but not great at one thing. If that makes sense. Sure. And you can do a lot of different things with him, but yeah, I mean, if if, if you if you're looking at what the the the, the three wide receivers North Carolina has right now, and you're saying, okay, who do I want to give it to? Short, you probably want to do Javaris Green. Who do I want to, you know, in a you know big third down situation, who I know is gonna gonna fight for the extra yardage, probably go ship. You know what I mean? But I think overall, this is a guy who's gonna consistently contribute to um to the offense which i think is why a lot of people kind of cooled on him a little bit during his senior season because he you know he's not somebody who's going to make a bunch of big time plays he will but then you look at the end of the season and his his stats were were pretty pretty ridiculous i mean he had you know 63 catches for 1067 yards and 14 touchdowns which you you compare that I mean, it's on par with with Green, 61 catches, 1,200 yards. Ship, 60 catches, 1,000 yards. You know, um, and had roughly, you know, on average, on par with those other two with the touchdowns. Mm -hmm. So, so he he does it, uh, but he's more of like a consistency sort of guy and doesn't do it like in big chunks. So, I don't, not a real big fan of making comparisons, but in the same wheelhouse as a JJ Jones type. No, I would if if I'm looking at North Carolina's roster, I, I like him like more like a Gavin Blackwell. Okay, all right. You know that that sort of that sort of, and I know Gavin. You know, um, I guess didn't have the greatest season this year, um, but um, has flashed some at times, sort of thing, and has played a little bit. But I think in that mold, I think that's what the the best comparison for him. So North Carolina gets that I guess second receiver after Javaris Green, Alex Taylor. Comes in, North Carolina letter of intent. Let, let's get a question in while we wait for the next one. We'll save that one for a minute. Yeah, one oh, uh, <clears throat> Preston from Greensboro asked Greg, have you had the opportunity to interview the interim chancellor yet? Not yet. Uh, looks like it's probably going to be after the holiday before that's going to happen, but we will, we will do that. And that's an important conversation to have because I, I think – with the landscape of not just what's going on on Chapel Hill's campus, but really in the broader picture of the ACC with realignment, that's kind of an important uh, development in terms of you know Kevin Guskowitz leaving for Michigan State and Lee Roberts coming in. So uh, there's going to be a lot of conversation this off season about realignment. We've already started to see some news about Florida State, uh, so that that'll be something that will be. Should be a good conversation about kind of where UNC stands and where it hopes to to kind of move forward uh, when we have that conversation, hopefully next month. Let me ask you a question uh, about that, and a lot of people are very interested in that. You've covered this stuff. Sort of let folks know, not order of importance, but how much influence does chancellor at an individual school, board of trustees, Board of Governors have, state legislature have, and all this stuff, because a lot of people are convinced that certain forces and pulling and pushing against each other, just where, where, it, where lies the, I don't know if it's responsibility, but the 
I don't know if it's permission either. I'm not sure the exact word is, but where are all those places? Where are they relevant in this discussion? Yeah, in North Carolina, the state of North Carolina is, is I think, unique in that there are so many uh, powers that be in play, if you will, which makes it challenging. But really kind of where North Carolina is situated, you, you have the chancellor who's, of course, in, in charge of the university. They – the chancellor role really kind of works hand in hand with the, the university's board of trustees. And then beyond that, of course, you have the board of governors at the state level who has a lot of ties to the state legislature. So when we're talking about, you know, if we're just going to talk about from a um, <clears throat> hypothetical situation, if North Carolina decided they wanted to leave for either the, the Big Ten or the SEC, uh, that would probably take place at the chancellor board of trustees level. And then they would have to go to the board of governors to get uh, you know, permission, if you will, but really kind of be a working decision. And once you get to that level, then you get into the state, state legislature part of it, of what's best for not just UNC, but what's best for the, the University of North Carolina uh, university system as well. And then, of course, you get into you know, how does this impact NC State? How does this impact all these other schools? So there's there's a lot of hoops to jump through. But I, I would say, uh, and I don't want to put too much out there, but I would say there seems to be uh, a, a growing alignment across all these different entities of where the future lies. Um, there's a lot of work to get to that point. But more so now than there has been in the past, I think people are starting to understand what's in play, how the college landscape is changing, and what are the options that lay in front of North Carolina and some of these other schools in doing what's best for, for the school itself and for the university system. It is a discussion we will continue to have Probably forever. I, I, I fully expect to be twenty thirty six. Yeah, if it goes to twenty thirty six, I don't. I can't imagine that. But we it won't. We, we will. Uh, we will see. But uh, we'll certainly be on it. And this man beside me, to my left, has been on this NCA stuff and on all this realignment stuff since day one. Got another one, Don. Mm. This eases the angst. From the fan base, the third wide receiver is in Jordan Ship, wide receiver, Providence Day School, six two one ninety two, four star, another young man that's on campus practicing with the team. Don, you know the drill. Yeah, I mean, what we actually already talked about him earlier when I was asked who is kind of my guy for this class, and I miss I mentioned Jordan for you know, so I won't rehash all of that, but I. Um, you know, his recruitment was kind of interesting, and he gave some cool insight into the, uh, I guess, the, the, the secret side of that in the weekly scoop that we ran on Tuesday, and just when exactly he committed, and then what he kind of did afterwards, and, and then even how he continued to take official visits, and how Michigan certainly gave him some, um, some pause you know, which is natural considering two of his really good friends were committed there. And because it's Michigan, I mean, they're playing in yet another playoff, uh, undefeated again, um, but also took uh, an official visit to NC State. And, uh, you know, lastly took an official visit to North Carolina, then announced his decision during an announcement in July. That's another one we had on live. That's right. We did. Did we do? Yeah, we did that live. Yeah, yeah, as well. It's like, come on, Don Callahan just and John Bowman just <laughs> wearing it out in public. We try to get John in for this, I but know. John is just in such high demand, and we just didn't have the funds. We, we didn't have the NIL money. We got a uh, big time. Is Actually, what it is. he initially committed, and then he Keenan Jackson does, and then he decommitted. Yeah, I wonder where he do is we want to do we want to talk about that because we touched on it a little bit since we've we've gotten all the wide receivers out. Yes. Uh, Greg, <laughs> well, uh, no, well, considering that fast response, Greg, what are, what are your uh, – do you have questions, thoughts? What do you have? Uh, no, I, I really don't have any, any questions. Um, I am curious kind of – when we start talking about decommitments, mm -hmm. um, is this something you know, maybe the 
maybe the staff knew was a possibility. Um, and is it that big of a deal? So um, I think, let me answer your second question first. I don't think it's that big of a deal. And I kind of lay this out in the um, the column that's coming out later on today, is that if you look at, and I mentioned this earlier with, with Tommy a little bit, if you look at where North Carolina was at with his wide receiver board a year ago and what the expectation was, they weren't going to lose anyone to graduation. You had Tez Walker. You, f- you figure he plays a full season. You don't, you don't think the NCAA is going to get involved. You think you're going to get the waiver. You think he plays a full season and his stock skyrockets. He goes to the NFL. So you expect that. You expect that to be the only deflection, uh, defection minus typical attrition. So really, wide receiver isn't this huge need. But then you look at your in-state class, and as my column later on will kind of lay out, it's, it is the best in-state class of wide receivers in the history of North Carolina, the state of North Carolina. You know, nine um, wide receivers in the state are committed to Power 5 schools, and I think it was 11 um, or ranked in the top 100 in the wide receiver position. I think that's what the numbers were. Uh, check this the the column to to uh, to be sure, but either way, it was a very impressive group. So North Carolina obviously wanted a piece of that. They had a really good shot with a lot of these guys. They got four of them um, that they they that they really wanted, and which is guys we've already talked about: Alex Taylor, Jordan Ship, and Javarius Green. And then they had Keenan Jackson, which was really the he wasn't a top one hundred receiver. He was the, the lesser ranked of the four. And so, you know, losing him for a, a position that really, really wasn't a need is not really painful to North Carolina whatsoever. You know, and what was your first question? I completely. Was the staff aware of this coming? And I, and I would say, and I would add in t- for you to respond to it, I think it's, it's opt. And I, I'm not one of those people that says when another – guy goes to another school that they stink and all that Mm -hmm. i think that's total bs i mean if he's wearing the color of your jersey and you love him and he's great then he's not a different player when he goes to another school Mm -hmm. that being said i think this is an optic thing Mm -hmm. more so than a than a well here's the the here's the thing and this is maybe um careless of me but i look at the timeline of of yesterday okay um I was hearing yesterday, so, so there's been rumors. So to answer your first question, North Carolina was aware that there was some potential because there was rumors. There was one rumors on a message board, you know, um, what, for, for a few days, I think, if not, if not longer than that. Um, when I checked in, in the middle of the day, everything was cool. Even Michael Clark, who everybody, I think, is a fan of in, in who's watching this, he reported that he didn't think anything was going to happen. Then North Carolina beats out NC State for uh, Tyran Stewart, the JUCO cornerback. He was down to those two schools. NC State, as of a week ago, didn't really think North Carolina was a threat because North Carolina kind of snuck in that official visit after his official visit to NC State. And from my understanding, they weren't completely aware of that the whole time. I don't know when they found out about it. So, And from my understanding... NC State was pretty confident that they, that they were going to get Stewart on Monday night. Now, so let's go back to yesterday, Tuesday. You know, seems like the situation with Jackson died. Then Stewart commits to North Carolina. Then a couple hours later, I get a tip that says, hey, this is going to happen. Jackson's going to decommit from North Carolina and then going to sign with NC State on Wednesday. I'm looking at that, and this is just me speculating. I'm thinking – did NC State now have extra money, or did NC State up it because they're like, oh, we have to steal back the optics here? I mean, am I off base with just kind of – this is not me reporting anything. I'm just speculating. Maybe it's careless speculating on my part, but I'm just kind of laying out the pieces of this and just kind of thinking in my head how this could have went down. You, you know what? Have you seen The Fugitive? No, I'm not that old. The Harrison Ford? Yeah. <laughs> 
Dude, that movie's great. But <laughs> Harrison Ford's running from. <laughs> Tommy takes offense to this. Like, I what's just his name? shit on his it lawn. Came out in 1991. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> what is it? What's the guy's name that was said? Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. Harrison Ford's running from Tommy Lee Jones. They stop in the tunnel. Right. He turns around and he says, I didn't kill my wife. I do. I, I do don't that. care. Yeah. All that stuff you just asked. Uh-huh. I don't care. The bottom line is he's going to NC State. Carolina got a more pressing need in Tyron Stewart. If you want to say that was a. A thing. I mean, somebody in the chat saying some other stuff. But the bottom line is it worked out. Mm -hmm. And Carolina's got three of their top four targets at wide receiver. And other than optics, coupled with the three straight on the field, which is what people talk about, the, it worked. It worked up yeah, North Carolina. And this is what this is what people want to know, Don. So okay. this, this is your question. All right. NC State has now won nine games in four of their last seven seasons. They've won 34 games the past four years, which is impressive, with the chance to make it 35. Um, for the first couple years in, in Mac Brown's tenure, second tenure, it didn't seem like Carolina was losing many recruits to State. Mm -hmm. With State's recent success – have they become a legitimate thorn in North Carolina's side in, in this state on the recruiting trail? I I don't think so. I because if you actually look at the fact Jordan Ship, Alex Taylor, they both took official visits to NC State in 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 June. I'm just those are just the first two problem might um, NC State offered Javarius Green. And he never officially visited there. And they offered him, you know, towards towards summer. So you kind of figure, okay, maybe maybe they had a legitimate interest, but he was just like, oh, I don't know too much about you guys. Um, but the but then they they only they only get, I guess what I'm trying to lay out, and I think we can go almost, you know, player by player. If you take a player and he has offer from North Carolina to NC State, you. Know, He's more than likely to end up in North Carolina, and it's at a very, very high percentage. That's why it appears significant when NC State wins one of these recruiting battles. You know, Jonathan Paylor was probably prior to stealing Keenan Jackson. Jonathan Paylor was was the guy for this class. Um, Kevin Concepcion was the one last class, and it seems such a big deal because that's the only one that it happens for. But you look at all these other guys, and maybe I need to pull up North Carolina's commitment list and just look at all you know who has who also visited NC State and visit North Carolina, and North Carolina ended up with. I mean, it just the percentage still goes heavily in North Carolina favor. Now, is it turning a little bit? Yeah, I, I and I pointed this out, and there's a bunch of posters who kind of dog me for it. That yeah, it's they're showing a little bit of chinks in the armor that North Carolina isn't dominating in state as much as they were in the first two years of Mac Brown, but it's still at a lower point to where, you know, UNC can still I think recover. I you know I don't think I don't want to. I mean the on field results do matter and do impact things. But I don't think kids pay attention to that as much. Now, if you are Jonathan Paylor, for example, who has attended that game the past whatever, four years or whatever, then, yeah, that's going to sink in with him um, much more than others. But I think most of these kids, they're somewhere else. They, don't, they couldn't tell you who won what game. I mean, you have, you have high school kids. You had high school kids 20 years ago. I have high school kids. And so um, these kids, their, their minds are just on different things. You know what I mean? Mine went to the right school. <laughs> Everybody knows where that is. We've got another letter of intent that has dropped defensive lineman Curtis Simpson, edge rusher, 6'3", 200, out of Kings Mountain. Three-star guy, Don, uh, you know, we talked just a second ago about offensive line, defensive line. Here's a edge slash linebacker guy committed to North Carolina. Tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, so if you were to ask me a player comp for him, I think the easy one is Malachi Hamrick. You know, from the same county, you know, Cleveland County, for those who maybe you don't follow recruiting, you just follow high school football, Cleveland County is just... That's where I was born. That's right. It produces great people. Yeah. 
you know, and great football players too. So, yeah, that's where Crest and Shelby and Kings Mountain and also Burns, which, yeah, there was a year where they had um, Josh Briscoe and I think they had a quarterback or whatever, but for the most part, it's been those three other programs that have been producing kids. But anyway, um, yeah, so when you watch him, I mean, this is purely a guy who just gets after the quarterback, you know, quick first step, but he's not purely just running, you know, the, the arc of the, um, the offensive lineman. He'll go inside. Um, he's so quick off the ball that when you watch him on film, it kind of just, I don't want to say stuns, but it makes the offensive lineman, you can see, doesn't know what to do, which obviously puts the advantage in, 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 um, in Simpson's favor. But, um, you know, he's a guy, he, he's, he's, he's just a guy just going to get to the quarterback. And that's what he did. You know, um, let me pull up his stats from this past season. Um, sorry, I know this is not great. Where the hell it's are It's great you? live radio. Yeah. yeah. All right, so 21 tackles for a loss, 13 sacks in 12 games, 19 hurries. So this is, you know, considering the fact that, yes, he's not playing super talented teams outside of that those Cleveland County teams, but he's also not playing a whole lot of passing teams, and so to have those sort of numbers are pretty impressive. North Carolina needs all the help they can get in trenches. What you got, Greg? Just got a random question for you. I, I imagine this changes depending on the coaching staff. When when this current staff is is recruiting kids, is it pretty firm that hey we're recruiting you for this specific position, or is it more of hey we see you here? We also think there's potential for you to move to different positions. So they're usually very specific. Okay. But now Mac will give the kids a decision. And we saw this with Jeff Jefferson Boaz, which I thought was kind of a mistake, to be completely honest. And there was another one, another decommit, that Ooh. they gave an option to choose. Oh, you're talking about – No, see, I'm not with – name's not going to be – Well, I won't mention his name. I don't think that was a factor because I think – Mac gave the kid a choice. The kid chose a position, and then everyone blamed that for the reason yeah. why, but that wasn't the anyway, reason why. To anyway, your point. Yeah, so um, Mac will give kids the option and say, hey, we're recruiting you. What position you want to play? If that's what you want to stay, we'll keep you there. Jefferson Boaz did that. I was hoping Jefferson would move to tight end or something. I thought he could actually be a good offensive lineman, but um, with added weight, obviously. But anyway, um, so yes, um, you know, they usually kind of – I mean, and this came up on the message board the other day is talking about converting these wide receivers to DBs, which is not how it is nowadays. Maybe 15 years ago, yes, but kids are so much more advanced at their positions and they have played so much football and there's been so many eyes on them that maybe they play other positions too, but they're usually put in – to the position that best fits their skill set prior to arriving in college. And really, nowadays, that doesn't change unless it's just not working out. And just before you are about to hang it up or you're about to transfer out or whatever, you make a position change, you know, and, and see if that works. But really, guys come in one position and that's what they play. I think that speaks too to some of the specialization in youth sports that we see now. Because mm -hmm. when we were in school, you know, people played both sides of the ball, mm -hmm. and you'd play any variety of positions. Mm -hmm. um, and not just football, but in a lot of these other sports. I mean, I know your, your daughter plays. But it's like there's so much focus on maximizing potential, yeah. not only in just one sport, but at one position in that sport. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of gets away. You know, it used to be you would look for kids that play multiple sports and play basketball and baseball, and maybe it's just me – yelling at the clouds, but it just seems like those kids are, are not as uh, abundant as maybe they used to be. It, it's interesting talking about the multiple sports. Is there, there have been several of these guys, and, of course, I've mentioned Caleb Cost already. They're baseball players. Yeah. And, and uh, so you've got some sort of some sort of a dual sport aspect of it, but you're right. I mean, the specialization, this is definitely yelling at clouds. It's just ridiculous. Well, um, I think the thing is is that – I think you're still seeing kids play multiple sports, but I think th th it's two things. It's one, that kids don't play, and this is more yelling at clouds, 
kids don't play outside now. Yeah. So the way that they get practice is by training. And right. so when you go to training, you have to, you're training with a specific goal. You're training with a specific position in mind. You're not playing street you know, or you know, tackle football in the yard sort of thing where you're basically doing a bunch of different things, which is what, because I, I don't remember when I was growing up, and yeah, I'm old, but it wasn't that long ago. I don't remember p- kids going off and being, oh, I got training tonight, can't hang out. No, we would play, you know, tackle football. So you got called inside. Yeah. And one of the conversations we had on the basketball board this summer was that there's this growing, you know, category of people who – are really into the training aspect and they're pretty much of yeah you know summer pickup for north carolina basketball used to be a thing it's really not beneficial anymore they should be focused on individual drills to train to get better and actually doing pickup doesn't help as much and it's kind of like wait a minute like yeah, you see how that's worked out yeah <laughs> so I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting conversation let me sure. see I, I can play pickup against nba players or mm-hmm. former nba players or i can go train with a trainer um, with nobody guard me yeah. And nobody doing anything. I think it's interesting to the point about playing multiple sports. Guys play multiple sports still now in high school, mm-hmm. but when they're training or yeah. they're spending their time in the summer's training, they're training for their, their specialty sports. Yes, and, yes. And, it's and some of that, I think, is just that sports in general, I think that we really have gotten better overall as a you know society to where – especially with like men's sports, boys' sports, like you have got to be training whatever sport that is. If you want to stay competitive, you have got to be training year round. Sure. And if you're not, you're going to, you're going to fall behind. You, you know, I have a daughter who, who plays, you know, basketball. And I mean, I, I think that she might not have made varsity if she did not train year round yeah. for basketball. And that's girl sports where the competition isn't the, the pool of, of competition is not nearly as deep. I mean, boys is probably tenfold. Yeah, I mean, but but you look at it is, and then how much burnout do you get? Yeah, how much burnout do you get? A guy come to and we'll circle it back to Carolina or whatever college sports. You you get somebody that's done that their whole life. They get to college and they're just like tired of it. Yeah, and they don't love football or they don't love. Well, yeah, whatever. because it becomes a it becomes work. It's a job. Yeah, because yeah. you're basically when you're training, you have a set time you got to go. You're probably, you know. There's certain days where you want to relax. It's not fun because you are doing like your test with certain Mm -hmm. tests by somebody who's kind of barking at you and all that sort of stuff. Whereas when we were growing up, you know, we're we're trying to get everybody out there and and try to you know pick teams and it's fun. And there's no real rules. There's no adults. No one telling us what to do. And and it it didn't care if it didn't matter if you kids were really good or not. If you, you needed to field a team in the street. Then like we little Joey who yeah. couldn't walk straight, like, he was fine to play quarterback. Yeah, for. I mean we right. would he play. He could go deep. Just yeah, go to the car, and, uh, hang a left right. at the car. Yeah, I mean we would. I remember growing up, and I grew up in the city, and you would have a bunch of different ages, and obviously you would make things even or whatever, but you know, and certain kids would always have to go up against certain kids just because they were the only kids in that age group or whatever. But it, it is what it is. We do have another one, don't we, Tommy? We do. Uh, Zion Ferguson, defensive back out of Gainesville. This is interesting. Okay. Um, we talked about flips and decommitments and all. Zion Ferguson might fit that mold, but his letter of intent signed with North Carolina. Sort of tell us about him. Yeah, so this was a kid who bec- – he, he's. we talked about the, the Atlanta area kids and the defensive backs in partic- particular. Um, he's been on the scene, quote-unquote, for – for what seems like forever and North Carolina like a lot of other schools offered him really really early on so he was really um, accustomed to the recruiting process and schools and everything like that so I guess it was the summer before his junior season took a bunch of visits and including one to North Carolina and then early that fall committed to LSU and so he was firmly committed and then come around um, North Carolina was sending out invites to its uh, UNC Duke basketball game, which for the first time in a few years, because the, the dead period wasn't always, they didn't always have a dead period in, in February. And sometimes that home game for North Carolina falls in February, sometimes it falls in March. This past year, it fell in March. They were able to use that to lure him to Chapel Hill. His family, his mother, is uh, I think his mother went to Hillside High School. His grandmother lives in Durham. Um, so 
place to stay. They go there. They go to the UNC Duke um, basketball game. The next day was the first day of spring practice. They attend that game. And he says, hey, you know, I might come back for um, an official visit. Now, I'm thinking, and I think a lot of people are thinking, you know, this kid playing games. And I think really, to be honest, I mean, he kept the communication lines open, but I don't think anybody ever knew how serious he really was, um, you know, because there was even some talk that maybe he would never officially visit, but he does. And he visits during that final weekend of June, which I've talked about about the, the with the, um, the wide receivers visiting that weekend. And um, he's still an LSU commit right after the visit. I talked to him, and, and I, bl- I believe we did an interview, and he said, I'm about to decommit, and I'm about to do something else later. I said, okay. I said, you, what, what are we going to do here? And he said, well, I'm going to do something, and then you call me right afterwards. I'll pick up the phone for you. So he announced his decommitment. Of course, I knew what he was going to do because it was pretty obvious. <laughs> he announced his, his commitment to North Carolina, which also happened to be during the Showtime camp, so talk about a day of, of juggling. And so, yeah, so he he uh, um, he committed. To, he switched his commitment to North Carolina. Six foot one sixty five, Gainesville, Georgia. When you see Gainesville, you think Florida, but Gainesville, Georgia, uh, sort of level of uh, what do I call it? Competition. Yes. Level yeah, of I mean, competition it's, for him out there in Georgia. That's another one of the Georgia boys. Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's you know that Atlanta area. They play the Atlanta area schools, so it's it's one of the most competitive areas in the nation and one of the most advanced areas when you're talking about offenses and uh, particularly passing offenses and the types of quarterbacks you're going to see, the receivers you're going to see. You know, um, as I mentioned before, you know, he's one of those guys who has been trained to play the DB position since he was probably in middle school. So he's, he's going to be um, as polished as you'll, you'll find um, coming out of um, coming out of high school, just because of that, you know, um, had a great senior season. I think it was something like um, I think it was like five picks, returned three of them for for um, for touchdowns. You know, he's definitely that very very confident cornerback. Um, you know, uh, you know, plays with the swagger sort of thing. Great kid to talk to too. You know, so I think he'll bring a lot to the secondary. Zion Ferguson becomes number 22 in class of 24. handful more left. Greg, what you got? Don, just looking at the, the list here, Carolina's signed or is signing eight kids from Georgia mm-hmm. and just one from Virginia. Yeah. Is that a uh, noticeable shift in focus? Well, I think – so there's a couple elements here. One, I mean, George is always going to have more talent than Virginia. Sure. So, so that's a really big in play here. Then if you look at just the changes on North Carolina's uh, coaching staff, and I know that Coach Warren has been here for two seasons, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, he, I mean, he's from, he's from Georgia. He's known as a coach who has um, – Really, really, really strong ties to that area. I remember when he first was hired by Fedora, um, yeah, I think it was like a couple weeks into him being hired, I went to a high school in Georgia, and I was talking to a high school coach, knew all about him, I had nothing but positive things to say about him. Um, so, you know, just to kind of randomly pick a coach sort of thing, or maybe it was just coincidence. But, uh, but he has a really good reputation in, in that state. And then you look at what North Carolina has lost from his coaching staff, Dre Bly. Clearly, everyone knows, 757 guy. He was a big part on why North Carolina landed all those guys from Virginia. I mean, he was, it was a huge part in, the, in landing those guys from Virginia. He's no longer on staff. And um, maybe there are, I don't even know, I don't know if we want to call them burnt bridges. I don't know what we want to call it, but the whole Tony Grimes, Dion Glover, uh, you know, it's a little bit of live by the sword, die by the sword sort of situation. That that was beneficial for a while for North Carolina. You know, you got to wonder if that's maybe not helping North Carolina now in that area. But it really, I mean, there hasn't been this huge amount of – there hasn't been any guys I could think of off the top of my head that North Carolina really wanted from that area within the past couple of classes. So it's hard to really kind of gauge, but, you know, but that yeah. could be a factor. Tommy – 
in the previous two classes, Carolina signed 13 kids out of Virginia, just just one in this class. I know it's a it's a fascinating thing to look at, and I think Don's point is Bly not there, and, and how many of those Virginia guys are left on the roster? You know, yeah, a lot of them have exited this. Well, who's left? Oh, Zach Rice. Zach Rice is left. And who else? Is there anyone else? Mm, I guess he, you can look at it. We had to look at it. it, I it it's just, but I mean, it's, it's cyclical, right? It, yeah. it, and, and quite frankly, I mean, if you're going to the SEC, you might as well start recruiting Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Petaway's gone, Green's gone, Chapman's gone, Holloway's gone. Uh, Bryson Jennings is gone, but is, he, he was he was more Richmond area, but right? Yeah. Uh, Travion, but he's life Christian. Yeah, and that's more of Richmond area. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's interesting. Georgia has well, a. And, and it's, so it's crazy though the, the mass of talent in a state like Georgia can support Georgia, mm -hmm. even though they recruit nationally. Yeah. But can support Alabama and Auburn and Florida and all those schools down there, and then there's enough talent left over to have quality guys going all over the country yeah. and Carolina's reaping some benefits there. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's why North Carolina recruits Georgia. But I think it's imp also important to mention, like, a school like Alabama, I mean, the state of Alabama is still pretty, you know, pretty talented state, so they don't exclusively go into Georgia. They, they do try to get some of the better players out of Georgia, but, I mean, to your point, I mean, yes, there there is – it is overflowing with, with talent. I think I did this one time before with you. Okay. Um <coughs> Well, I'll do it after this. We've got another one to announce. Okay. Cruz Law becomes 23. Linebacker Cruz Law, 23, letter of intent in to Carolina brother as well. A package deal. Yeah. Don, tell us about the laws. Yeah, so North Carolina was a strong player for him from – basically when they offered him during his junior season when he came up for a visit, and then he returned again in January. Um, but then I think North Carolina really kind of sees the recruitment once his brother, who was a catcher at Vanderbilt but played football in high school. And Vanderbilt, you guys know better than me, from a baseball standpoint, very good in baseball, right? Right. Um, so to, to be a catcher there, I would imagine you, you have to be a pretty high-level baseball player. And so he decides to enter the portal because he wants to play football. And I think and, – and he wants to play football with his, his brother, Cruz. And so once the two brothers kind of got together and were looking at options, it really – they kind of – I know that there was another school involved, but really kind of narrowed down to Vanderbilt – and North Carolina, I feel like there was another school. Uh, I don't have it in my notes right here. But, you know, from that point, it just seemed pretty pretty logical where this was going because it's not common for someone to enter the portal and go and visit places and then come back. Yes, there have been people who go to the portal and then go and then come back to the program, but usually they don't visit places first. Um, but anyway, so they took a couple of official visits together, and after the official visit to North Carolina – committed to the Tar Heels. And in as Tommy said, it was it was a package deal and that played a big role in Cruz's decision. But Cruz as a player, I mean, this is a kid who won uh, Mr. T Mr. Football in Tennessee, led his team to the state championship. He played obviously he played defense, but his um his offensive numbers um were pretty impressive. Um you know, he, he didn't carry the ball a whole lot just 56 times, but has 14 touchdowns on 56 rushes, which is pretty significant. 90 tackles. He actually was pulled a lot on defense because of um, – well, he was pulled a lot in general. Um, they didn't want to use him too much. But in when things were, I guess, uh, most competitive in games, he was going both ways. Yeah, he is uh, an athlete that can do a lot of different things. Great name, by the way. Cruz Law, Nashville, Tennessee. Wonder does he sing some country music? Greg, what you got here? I wanted to go back and ask Don about the Georgia, North Carolina high school talent comparison, but Greg, get in here. Well, kind of along the same lines. I just wanted to 
kind of pick your brain a little bit, Don, looking at the, the state rankings. Carolina's got two of the top ten uh, in Ziegler and Ship, and then four of the top 25, mm -hmm. which they had two of the top ten last year, and I believe it was four of the top 25 as well. Of course, year before, had three of the top five with Shaw and, and Hampton and, and Hamrick. Um, kind of what's your opinion on that? Is, is that? is that adequate? Is Carolina getting enough of the talent that they need in the surrounding footprint? Or is that an area that North Carolina needs to shore up more? I, th I think that they do need to have more success in state. And I think that when we talk about Mac Brown's classes, the first couple classes and how highly ranked they were, and now where we're back to kind of sort of, we're still, I think we're still better than Bunning and, and all that. Um, but um, we're, you know, fringe top 25 class range. The difference is the in-state, the in-state classes, you know, what they're doing in-state. And some of that is, I mean, all of these are these guys fits, you know, academically and all of that. And then also you add in the NIL stuff, which is now a factor. But also, you know, coaches do, new coaches do get that bump, that initial bump, you know, because you don't, you can, it's so easy to sell the, the vision when you, when you don't have a track record to look back on, you know, and um, you can sell hope. Yes, you can sell, it's easier to sell hope mm -hmm. when they, they can't look back. Um, and so there's been a little bit of a of adjustment to that, but yeah, I think that, and I think Mac Brown will will say, hey, you know, they probably do need to l do a little bit better um, in state. Now with each of these situations, how many of these guys did North Carolina truly truly want? I mean, I think definitely definitely um, Jonathan Paler um, and, and Caden Jones, another one, but he went to Alabama. You know, they never offered Bryce Young. Um, you know, so and and I I don't think they were ever thrilled with with uh, Jaden Davis to be completely honest, so it's, you know, it's a little bit of just fit too and and academics and and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, I mean, you would like to see a little bit better success. And kind of starting to work back to to Tommy's question about Georgia, but North Carolina is also one of those states where it seems like because you know there's been such a population rush over the last decade or two. The talent level has increased. Yeah. Has it increased enough during your time covering recruiting in this state to where you can still find some really good players outside of the top 25 to make up for some of these lapses in the meantime? Still still noting that you need the high-end guys maybe to compete for titles, but there is, a, there is, a, is there enough in the 25 to 50 range where you can still put together a really good roster? I think once you start to get into outside of that top 25, I do think you're starting to get into group of five player level in the state of North Carolina, whereas obviously that's not the case in Georgia. And I think maybe that was what you were talking about, Tommy, because we did – I think we did do – like we played a game of just looking at just their their rating number. Yeah, what, and, what is and like – And what they would be rated in Georgia and vice versa. Yeah, I remember – and that's what I was going to is, is a top ten – a number 10 guy in North Carolina – where would he be in Georgia? Things yeah, like yeah. that. There, yeah. There's a big difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Georgia's way, way, way deeper. Do you have any questions? That, cause I, I know a, we haven't gotten to a whole lot I have a ton. There's some in-game questions. Um, we're not going to do that yet. Emily asks, when does spring training start? Spring practice is usually March-ish, mid-March. Early, early March. Early March through mid-April. The spring game is usually around – if it's not Masters weekend, it's usually the weekend after uh, mid-April. What is that? I will ignore the Jeez. hysteria over there. Tyler Woods asks, Greg, why does Heels for Life not solicit the average fan like we see other schools doing? Seems like there's a real lack of effort to collect small sums from the average Joe. I don't know. I, I they don't, don't have a – Go ahead. No, I mean, what were you going to say? <laughs> I was going to say other teams, and I don't want to keep mentioning the team in West Raleigh, but they do like a 39 to 20. Donate $39.20 to 
to the cause right now. And that's a good way to, you know, if you get a thousand little donations, that's a good way. I don't see Carolina utilizing those type things. Right, and I, I think if you go back to you know, Clemson, Ipte, who I, I pay ten a year, and what what Clemson did from the very beginning is they really sought out everybody within the fan base and said, "Hey, every little bit you can give will help." Carolina just has not taken that approach for whatever reason, and you know, different ways work. That has not been kind of their approach, and I also think some of this, and this is just me spitballing here. I haven't I haven't talked, I haven't asked that question. To hills for life but kind of gets back to what we were talking about earlier of there's only so many funds and that's one of my issues with where college football is right now in college basketball is i think everybody's gotten around to the point of you understand that players deserve some portion of the proceeds but what's happening is is that schools and conferences are having to keep going back to the same well, which is the fan base and boosters, to fund all these things. And so, you know, do you want boosters to fund coaching salaries and buyouts and facilities, like a brand new locker room facility, or do you want that money to go to NIL? Mm -hmm. And that is a very difficult conversation that you're having to pick and choose. Um, I would assume Part of that's kind of in the conversation of, okay, what do we really need to prioritize? Right. Um, and knowing that the collective is separate from the university and the athletic department. Uh, it's a good question, though, and it's, you know, it, it's something worth asking. So we, we should put that on the list. Yeah, I mean, and it goes back to ultimately what I was talking about earlier, the money. Uh, I mean, if you get $80 million from TV, then that's – 40 more million than Carolina gets from TV, and the donors have to, to match that or to get into that. We've got another one. And, and when we, we throw out the 40 million difference there, Tommy, it's important to note that North Carolina brought in uh, a record revenue year before last, which is the most recent financial data that we have, of 120 million for the athletic department. So 40 million represents 33% of that. So it's a significant amount of money. Yeah, and, and you cannot. And a lot of people talk about, well, North Carolina will just go to the SEC or the Big Ten or whatever and be a middling program. No, it, possibly, but they're going to get a ton more money. We've got another one. Yeah, what before you, you get in that, uh, time-wise, I am good. I am your guys to do whatever you please for however long you need to do it. But I know that are you, you're you doing the I'm, – I'm good. Okay. I'm with you. I'm just making sure we can. I've, we got a, I've got a few more minutes left in me. So okay. Greg Barnes has got a few more minutes in the clock, uh, and we will stick here. We will ride it all the way. I'm out. just making sure I know time. Do you really have to go soon? Yeah, we are down a car, which I can uh, tell that story, but we have enough other stuff to talk about. Let's talk about <laughs> Daniel Anderson, uh, defensive end linebacker out of Germantown High School. Uh, a lot of superlatives on his Twitter page. Don, tell us about him. So he's another guy who I can come with a quick player comp for, and that is a guy we talked about. And so you hate to kind of throw this sort of um, label on him, but uh, Cayman Rucker, you know, a guy who is undersized um, but thick, thickly built, um, and just, you know, just fires off the line of scrimmage. You know, to say that, you know, he has a motor is just not, doing it justice and he just overwhelms offensive linemen on his way to getting to the uh to the quarterback but he, but he's not just purely a pass rusher i mean that that sort of um you know his mentality his his motor allows him to make a ton of plays in the backfield you know you, we said it a million times you cannot have enough guys like this yeah I mean, and this he brings it in. So Daniel Anderson becomes uh, committed at it or signed at him to the list. I will throw the banner up here again just to reset for folks. And we've been hovering around 300 people. We were four hours, four hours in here talking about North Carolina signing. It Daniel. went quick. I looked and I was like 11 o'clock, and then I was like, oh crap, did Tommy had to leave? And no, I, I'm gonna we're gonna ride it out. We've got a few more names to get to on here. But Daniel Anderson joins his cl fellow classmates. I believe we've got two more known 
guys yes, to go. Where we, yeah, what number wise? How many unknown? How many player X's do we have, Don? Yeah, do we have a bunch of X's and Y's? <laughs> no, no player X's, but well, say um, it louder for people in the back, please. <laughs> We got some questions. Well, it's surprising though. that that's still a thing, but not to bring back the whole Keenan Jackson thing, but I mentioned this earlier, how it almost kind of felt a little bit like old time signing day with the last minute sort of, yeah. to, you know, I'm almost like unprepared to kind of handle it mentally because I'm just so used to signing days being so easy. You know, you prepare ahead of time and then you just run whatever. But last night I was up, I, I worked over the weekend and, and, you know, really for, for the past month and, and actually before that, you know, preparing for today. Um, but my goal was to have everything done um, so I didn't have to do a whole lot yesterday. And then, you know, I'm up late last night kind of rewriting things and, and fixing some things. Greg, we have somebody has chimed in in the chat. They said you can stay. Oh, man. So, we got the boss. So now he cannot leave. <laughs> <laughs> he cannot he was trying. He was trying to get out of here. <laughs> this is probably. He just, he just texted and said, <laughs> dang on it. I'm trying to get the heck out of here. <laughs> um, it, it's been fun. But, yeah, four hours in, a couple more commitments. Let me, let me ask you a question, Don. Okay. And this might be a Greg question, too, and it's something I'm interested in. And it's not Carolina-related, but it's signing day. Dylan Raola commits yeah. to Nebraska. Yeah. Four high schools. Yeah. Three different commitments. Uh -huh. I guess he's going to sign with Nebraska. He's got family ties there. When you look at that stuff, how often do those guys stick? Or well, how often there do those was, guys turn out and, to be And good? I want to give credit to whoever did it, and I believe it was Rivals, but I could be wrong. They did a story that kind of looked back on, on players who had com made commitments, you know, and decommitments and everything, and their hit rate was lower than guys who – made only a single commitment and the more decommitments you made the lower your hit rate was and if you think about it there are there are some parallels you can kind of draw I mean I don't know ex exactly why we would say that is but it makes sense right Greg yeah I agree uh, just there's a lot to be said for loyalty um, and and knowing what you want and and focusing on it and those types of things uh, so, yeah, it's not surprising. I'd, I'd like to be able to put my finger on a little bit more. But I'm sure there's a lot of psychology that, that kind of focuses on that and circles around it. What's even more strange is that he didn't just – it wasn't like – because you see a lot of these kids in certain areas like the Atlanta area, Charlotte area, where they'll attend a, a bunch of different schools just because they're transferring around to get better situations, to be with certain coaches and everything. This kid didn't transfer around a county. He literally transferred across country, and he transferred to Beaufort, which we were talking about earlier. That's where uh, Tyshawn White was, uh, you know, played high school ball. I thought to be closer to Georgia, where he was committed to, and then he ends up switching to Nebraska, which, you know, there was some buzz about just because the family connection. His dad, his dad, yeah, it was his dad who played there, right? Um, mm -hmm. And but I guess you know Nebraska got their money together, I guess. I mean, I can certainly understand him going to play. But it's just, and I say fascinating a lot, but just like you commit to three different colleges. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason why Brandon Willis, nobody's ever heard of him again. Yeah. The the other part of this, though, <laughs> it, Mac Brown has touched on this in the past, but with the portal existing and we're seeing so many kids enter the portal, what Mac has said is that, you know, in the recruiting game, what some schools will do is sell a kid on whatever they need to sell him on to get his signature. And it used to be you'd have to sit out a year. So even if what you told a kid wasn't exactly true, you know, there was incentive for them to stay if they wanted to play. Well, now that's done. Yep. And now if, if you lie to a kid and he gets on campus and sees it, well, he can just leave. And as Mac has said, what they've really tried to do, understanding how the portal factors in now, is don't embellish whatsoever. Yeah. Say, this is what we can sell you in terms of, you know, UNC provides a world-class education. You're going to get these opportunities. This for 40 years. This is what your playing time potentially looks like. But to go beyond that is setting yourself up for some of these kids to leave. Well, that, that's why I think, I do think Mac Brown has a recipe to be successful beyond the eight wins in North Carolina because of, you being honest with these kids, 
retaining them and you know, and then just going that route the development there's been some question there but there have been some guys who have developed you know Drake May Sam Howell Marion Hampton there have been some receivers we could point to yeah. yeah you know there have been some guys who developed maybe the development as every fan will be ready to admit it may be a little lacking, but if you got that there, you got that development, which probably has to do with the playing time thing we talked about is, is probably a role in there. There, there is, I think that's the recipe that could succeed at North Carolina retention. And, and so you just basically focus on recruiting high school kids, developing them, retaining them, and then, you know, just using the portal to kind of plug some holes, even with some undersized guys. But this is where, Wake Forest has always been a recruit, mm -hmm. develop, mm -hmm. play old guys. Mm -hmm. The transfer portal and now the unlimited transfers that are in now and NIL to a certain extent are going to blow that model up. But if you can re I, I retain. But but can Wake Forest yeah, wait, legitimately? Wake Forest, can but North Carolina, Carolina could because especially with their approach to the NIL is – we're not going to – and who knows what actually really happens. But if we take Mac Brown on his word, and I have no reason not to, but he, he says his approach is the legal way. This is what our guys make. We're not going to promise you anything. If you come here, you'll make something, and this is what the guys at your position make. And so that's why I think it was easy for North Carolina to lose – I mean, I'm sorry, to retain a guy like Omarion Hampton. Yeah. And I think you know, because there is money – it's just I think maybe the boosters are more willing to give it to people who have proven it and not right. because some of these SEC schools I mean they're there's I'm sure there's already some dead money out there. Well, you see Texas A&M and that yeah. class two years ago. Yeah, it's all they, gone. They're hemorrhaging those guys, yeah. and they're right. probably still getting paid. Yeah. So, so two two points here. I think Don's exactly right in terms of retention. If you have if you treat a kid right and you have a good locker room, even if he's being tempted to go elsewhere. If you can say, look, you know what you have here. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, – we have some funds. Maybe we can't pay you what Ohio State or Bama can pay you. But there's enough to satisfy what you need. You know what you've got. That's one part of it. It's always better and easier to retain than to pitch to somebody who hasn't been in your program. But this gets back to what we talked about a little while ago with where the program is. We said pretty much as soon as Mac Brown took the job in November of 2018, this can work if he has uh, cutting edge, progressive coordinators who can do a lot of the grindy day-to-day uh, -day X's and O's. And you let Mac Brown do what he does best, yep. which is talk to the media, which is talk to boosters, which is build uh, – build this program to where it can be something you're proud of. Yep. That gets back to the defensive side of the thing conversation of like, okay, is that coordinator in place right now in Gene Chizik, the guy that you need on that side of the ball to maximize the potential of this program. Uh, but people are saying, Hey, you know, it's time for Mac Brown to go. I know it's a very small subset of the, the fan base. I understand the frustration, but Mac Brown is a Hall of Famer, and he understands how to be the CEO of a program. And I, I really think it can work with him still in place, regardless of his age, mm -hmm. as long as you have the right pieces in place around him. Yeah, the, the key point there is get those right pieces. Correct. Well, yeah. I think the key point— Because if you don't have one—if if we knock that a leg of this table, yeah. it's going to fall over. Well, I think the other thing is—, is I think for me, and I know that we everyone has a feeling, and if you guys want to throw out your feelings on this. I'm going to throw out the next commitment. Um, but will Mac Brown make the decision to get rid of Gene Chizik, who he seems to have, you know, a very strong relationship with, almost as strong as mine with Tommy? Let's go to uh, – look, I would throw you under the bus for a couple <laughs> million dollars without question. Let's go to uh, the – Penultimate, big word alert. SAT -E. word. Luke Masterson. I did not do well on the on the whatever it is. <laughs> I never took the ACT. Brentwood, Tennessee, big fella, six seven two seventy five. I saw him when he was on his recruiting visit. Okay. And uh, just a, another giant kid. Yeah. Left tackle, defensive line, according to his Twitter 
you know, equally important and relevant to the discussion we're having about retaining people, 4.28 GPA to Franklin Road Academy, Don, Luke Masterson. Yeah, I mean, he is definitely, he's listed at 6'6". I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if he's actually more closer to 6'7". Um, I mean, he's a towering kid. Uh, when I saw him most recently, I felt like he gotten taller since I saw him the first time. But, uh, you know, this is a kid who, who has the skill set to play that left tackle position. You know, tall, long, athletic. I think the difference between him and um, – now I'm going blank on his name. Um, the other offensive tackle uh, who, uh, who committed earlier who, – who signed earlier. Rosinski. Rosinski is um, – while Rosinski has the the flexibility and all that, I think that um, Masterson is more uh, has that that mean streak, has that big pop when he is uh, delivering a block on a defender. Definitely is um, you know plays angry out there on the football field. Yeah, we've talked about the trenches. It's important to get, retain, develop, and. Masterson's one of those guys. Um, got football in his blood. He is a a, a Tennessee native that will come over to Chapel Hill with the opportunity to to make some hay with Randy Clements. It'll be interesting to see how it all shakes out. Um, let's get to some more questions in the chat. I've got them starred here. Um, I'll go ahead and ask this. Can, one. Let me throw out just um, what we're talking about retention stuff. I do think the retention starts with the type of players you bring in. And this is another kid who his top five at one point, Duke, Georgia Tech, UNC, Vanderbilt, Wake Forest, all schools with academic reputations. It, it will be harder for a school like Alabama or Georgia to pry that, that sort of kid away from no matter how good he is and how much money you're throwing at him if he's thinking, if I just graduate from North Carolina with this degree – how much money I'm going to make beyond my football career. Because yeah. a lot of those kids like that are thinking well beyond their football career. And it's interesting. We, you talked about Drake. You talked about Sam Howell. You talked about Omari and Hampton. What are they? They are North Carolina yeah. kids. Yeah. And, and that also matters, which is why the, the recruiting North Carolina and stepping up and yes. recruiting North Carolina in this era is transferred. That makes it easier for Florida, attention. You know? yeah. yeah. I mean, if I'm born and bred in North Carolina, I want to stay in North Carolina. Yeah. You know, so I, yeah. I if, if Drake May was a kid from Georgia or even South Carolina, was he a, probably leaves this time last yeah, year. Where was Jordan Addison from without looking? Uh, you know, Who? he left Pitt. Oh, um, and went to Southern Cal, for instance. I was feel one like of he the, was. He might have been. He might have been a, a Pens Western Pennsylvania well, guy. If he was a Pennsylvania guy. That's crazy. But anyway, the point being is that you recruit your home state if you're North Carolina. You recruit kids like Masterson, and, and you retain them when they start to get it. Don, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you this question from Tyler Woods. Let me put this up here. Get back to the questions. Tyler Woods asked. Well, Carolina tried He's from Maryland, by the way, Jordan and See, no ties <laughs> to Pittsburgh and ends up in Southern Cal with a bag. Uh, Don, Tyler Woods asks, will UNC try to fill Keenan Jackson's spot at wide receiver via portal or high school, or are they good? I think we've they, covered that Yeah, Yeah, they're, they're good. They're good. So they are good there. Tyler, good question. Anthony Wade says, since I was Scoop MVP, can I get one of those stickers? Yes. <laughs> I told you to send me an address. I'll try to drop one. Do you have a bunch of the stickers? I got a pile of them. Oh, okay. Shout out to Michelle again for that. Um, Alan Tindall asks, are anybody coming through the portal able to play in the bowl game? They cannot play in the bowl game. Um, portal guys and the recruits are only allowed to practice, practice. I believe, in shorts and helmets. Maybe maybe pad maybe shoulder pads. Yeah, basically they're shells. They're just working shells, right? Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. Doing some uh, cardio, that type of stuff. So they're getting acclimated to what it's going to be. And like. they could travel, right? And can they dress? I don't think they. I don't know. It's a good question because Amari yeah. Campbell and Michael like Short last year were, were they. I, I felt know. like they. I mean, I don't know. I probably. That's one of the benefits of the game being in Charlotte. Is yeah. That, I mean, anybody who wants to travel can. Yeah. 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 Steve Blakely, Stephen Blakely asks, any Storm Ducks in this class as far as the defensive back? Now, I'm not quite sure. What's the definition of a Storm Duck? I don't know. A guy that had potential that stayed injured, a guy that played well when he was healthy. Freshman All-America as a 
first year player and then and then just couldn't stay he, available i mean well, he, i i think he was a scheme fit guy and didn't fit in chiswick's scheme but that's just me know. well speak that speak the yeah. truth to that because some people say why would he leave I think he was a guy who was most comfortable getting his hands on the receiver and Chiswick's defense because it's basically bend, don't break, make it as simple as possible for the defenders, let's keep everything in front of us sort of mentality. They want the, they want the DBs off of the receivers because they're trying to prevent the big play, and, and that didn't fit to Storm Duck's abilities. Greg Barnes. Greg, am I wrong? I think you're exactly right. Greg okay. Barnes, die by a thousand cuts or just get it over don't, with? Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need to hear, folks. Uh, <laughs> we'll get to that question from Slagle later. Um, X these out. Don Callahan, Garrett Chapman asks, who, the, who are the top linebacker signees? you got a couple in here. Who who would you sort of – Do we have to pick one? Is that what, what well, the question he, is? He, the question has an S on it, so I'll let you get with a couple. Well, there's only three, so if I pick two, then we'll leave the one out. Let me just pick, let pick me just, one. Let me just pick one. I like Ashton Woods a lot, and for the reasons I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, being so young, playing for top, top – I mean, Walton High School in Marietta, Georgia, is one of the top programs. Same program that um, the two DBs came from. Um, oh God! Now am I going blank? Um, I'm gonna have to go dig, dig them out. Uh, too many names, and this is gonna Marcus Allen and Derek Allen. Um, they played for that school. Uh, North Carolina has recruited that school pretty heavily. Everyone recruits that school pretty heavily. So it's it's a a school that produces a lot of talent, and to go there to be the leading tackler there. At such a young age, considering you know um, the bloodlines and that sort of thing, you know I, I think he's he's a guy who I expect to have a really good career at North Carolina. Uh, Garrett Chapman again, working on chat MVP. If their staff changes in the next thirty days, how many signees could possibly jump? That goes back to so, well, here's here's what yeah, and this used is, to be when they signed, they were locked in. Yes, yes, and so it, but it it still is. There still is a process, whether it's just a thought process, but there's still paperwork that needs to be done if you're going to leave. So it makes it harder, whereas if you decide, I don't want to go there and haven't signed your letter of intent, there's nothing you got to do. So there is still a process there. But this is why, like, the lack of patience from fans, which I know is, is you know, maybe redundant, you know, because that's what I think all fans are, have a lack of patience. But to me... If Mac Brown intends on making coaching staff changes, it is so much smarter to do that after the bowl game. There is no benefit other than maybe maybe you have better options. I don't know if that's really, you know, super true. But I mean, the thing is if you fire a coach, you know, before signing day, you could potentially rock the boat with not just the guys who are signing, but also potential portal guys. And it, it does make it easier to kind of lock those guys in if they're signed and enrolled. And one thing that we haven't talked about, which will be talked about in my column a bunch, 21 of these 27 signees will be on campus in January enrolled, which is the prior – That is unbelievable. The prior record was 14 for North Carolina. Wow. So um, it – yeah, so I think, I mean, Greg, am I – and then the other thing is is that you have a full staff to help you coach the bowl game, which I know bowl games are not as important anymore. Am I off base with this? Am Because I, I think every fan who's like, why hasn't Mac done anything, I just think they're being ridiculous. Well, I think Mac certainly agrees with you. Yeah, um, well, if you kind of look is good. that a good thing or bad <laughs> thing, though, Greg? <laughs> well, he's a Hall of Famer. That's right. Um, <laughs> but he has a long track record of, of any moves that he makes takes place in January. Uh, after, after the bowl game and those types of things. And I, I think we have to kind of get past the notion of bowl games being more than just exhibition opportunities, yeah. except for the the key ones, you know, yeah. New Year's Six and the, and the college football playoff, obviously. Um, and as we talked about earlier, hopefully you can use it as an opportunity to get a lot of younger guys some, some time to really get things started for the next year. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's that that big of a deal. I mean, if it's a situation like last year where Phil Longo 
you know, left right after the season ended, well, sure, you can go ahead and fill spots. Um, but continuity is important. And, you know, I, I think I think North Carolina, stature-wise, is in a position where they can uh, they can still get good coaches if they just, you know, if Mac Brown decides to, to go in that direction in January or after the bowl game. So I, I know there's concern people saying, hey, well, this guy's already been taken and he's already moved from this school to that school, therefore he's off the table. That's not necessarily the case. You can still, you know, if you have a good product to sell and you've got the money, you can still pretty much get the coaches that you want that, that are in your, your wheelhouse, if you will, regardless of if a change has already been made. Last high school letter of intent is in. Davion Gauss, a.k.a. Bullet. Don Callahan, tell us about the running back. So we uh, still have one more, though, right? The Juco. Yeah, but he's. I said high school. Okay. I'm just I'm – just. I got this. All right. So um, <laughs> the thing with Gauss is that – Gauss is – Gauss, my bad. Is that um, he played for one of the – I mean, USA Today has Shamana Madonna ranked number two in the nation um, for in high school football, and um, they just absolutely they played the most impressive schedule I've ever seen. St. Francis Academy, which is in the D.C. area, they played it played against Michael Merdinger's um, school, um, Cardinal Gibbons, uh, Burgeon Catholic from New Jersey, American Heritage, Miami Central. I mean, these are super impressive teams, and um, it, oh, the um, Clearwater Central Catholic, which is a, a team that, that had a lot of a lot of talent, and in most cases, absolutely blew them out. You know, just look at these scores; is absolutely ridiculous. You know, and I mean, Virgin Catholic, sixty-one twenty-one, they beat them, and so as you can imagine, there was a lot of games where. Um, Goss played maybe a half and was pulled, you know, so his stats aren't super impressive when you kind of just look on the surface, 88 carries for 991 yards and 14 touchdowns, but he averaged 11.3 yards per carry. I think he's exactly what coach Porter wants in a running back. You know, he's not, he doesn't have that home run speed and he's not a super, super power back, but he, but he's more of like a, that bowling ball type who has good vision, who will, you know, who will break a couple of tackles and get to the second level and kind of fire up the offense with just running over guys. You know, you, we see it all the time with those, those, those collisions where the running back comes up on top by lowering his shoulder. That's the type of running back that uh, I think he is. It is, uh, he, he wraps the high school Letters of intent at the moment, <laughs> number 26. Of course, y you mentioned playing at nearly the highest level of high school football, yeah. so North Carolina gets their guy. Um, let me put this back up here. The full list is now running at the bottom of your screens, folks. We are four and a half hours in to our live <laughs> yeah, does It, it doesn't feel like – It doesn't really, no. other than – What about you, Greg? Greg, you just got here. <laughs> I need some more coffee, but other than that, yeah, there's a pot back there still going. But it is a, uh, it, it's been a fun time. We've got a, a few more questions here, and we'll keep. Well, rolling. I do. So I, I so is Tyron Stewart coming in? Does he sign a letter of intent? How does that work? With you um, think? they do, um, or they used to at one point. North Carolina hasn't signed a JUCO in. I'm trying to remember the last JUCO North Carolina signed. Uh, what's his name? Sherrod. Was Sherrod um, Peace? Bahasic? Was he not a JUCO? Uh, yes, he was. That, so that was the last one. Yeah. All so right. That so, was recent. I was like yeah. yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> Vlasic's no longer on the team. Um, <laughs> but my question was the running back situation for Greg because I actually, as you'll see in my um, my superlatives later on when when we post it, I listed Goss as the um, immediate contributor mostly because I'm looking at the running back situation. Obviously, you have Hampton, but there's Really no clear number two. I think North Carolina wants to go to, right? And uh, that was British Books. He's gone. They've lost two others from that depth chart. Am I wrong in going that route with a running back? No, certainly not. I, I think they really do want uh, two guys. And that's one of the reasons I was a little surprised that, that Petaway didn't factor in more. I guess he just didn't fit exactly what Chip Lindsay wanted. And, you know, Caleb Hood – 
was that guy last year for Phil Longo until he got hurt. Um, but, you know, you lose Elijah Green, you lose Petaway, of course, British Brooks uh, is, is exhausted his eligibility. So you lose a lot of what was a very deep position group. So clearly there's opportunity there for Goss to come in. And, uh, you know, if he is successful, and you mentioned, you know, these guys coming in early. There's a lot of benefit to that. The first is typically in the old times, the old times, mm-hmm. you know, five years ago, <laughs> in spring ball, if you had a lot of seniors or some transfers, you didn't really have enough guys, number one, to practice special teams, but two, to have legitimate scrimmages. Yeah. Well, they didn't last year, did they? I felt like that was an issue last year. Well, it was, yeah, it was an issue last year. And part of that was kind of the transfers out. So it still could be an issue. But having that many more kids come in, now you can at least put together a decent scrimmage, which I think is beneficial for the guys. And then more than anything, of course, it gives them eight months to really get up to speed and strength and conditioning to be able to potentially contribute. Because now with so many people coming in from the portal across the country, if you're coming in and in the summer as a true freshman, yeah, you're behind. Like it is really, yeah, it's yeah. really tough to kind of get up to speed that quickly. Guess who came in in the summer though, last year or two years ago? Who? Marion. And what did he do last year? Nothing. Right. To yeah. your point. Yeah. And, and then that's um, shows you what a year, or yeah. at least the spring aspect of and being there. Well, right. And to build on that, let's say he comes in January of last year. What did North Carolina, where did they really struggle last year? Running back. Running the ball. People healthy and doing yeah. it. And, of course, he had – he didn't have a terrible freshman campaign. Right. Um, but he had some limitations. And then, of course, after a year it's of been, it. It's been fantastic. So. Yep. So, we've got some questions here. Um, do we want to set a time – I was going to say 12. You want to do 12? Are you cool 12, Greg? Yep. Let's right. push it to 12. Do we need to so ask so Amber first? She's already – I've got a text and we got a YouTube comment, so I think I'm good. Okay. So uh, I don't Greg's want you, been given permission. I don't want you getting spanked when you get home, Greg. This is uh, – there's a lot. To say. I could go elsewhere with that. But, um, you know, there's some benefits of being retired. So I'm, I'm at your leisure, Don Callahan. Here we go. Uh Don, who's the most underrated commit in this class? One for offense, one for defense. You sort of said that over the course yeah, of the show. Yeah, so I said, so I said um, Ryan Ward for offense. Um, you know, so that was overall. So let me, let me look since I'm doing this on the spot here, and I don't want to underrate it. So um, I mean, I think I mean easy one, and this is the first one I saw was Daniel Anderson. You know, and I think it's because the same sort of thing, because the player comp I gave him. You know, he's a guy who was never going to be highly recruited because he's lacks the ideal height for the, the position. You need a coaching staff who's going to be cool with that. He's going to know how to use a kid like that. Um, and so I, but he, but he's a ball player, and so I think that he, um, I think that he is, uh, he would be my pick for that selection. But, Tommy, you have some news over there. Yep. Number 27, here it comes. Tyran Stewart, Don and I did a short YouTube video about his commitment, uh, I guess, a couple of days ago. Yeah, yesterday. And uh, time flies, folks. Don, tell us about what Stewart brings. Like I said, you know he's from East Mississippi Community College. Tommy thought LCU. he giggled like a little schoolgirl when like, he realized that. He was so excited. The, I was so happy for him. Look, on the, on the deal with that, <laughs> the first season of that was good. Yeah. The, the rest of the football seasons were trash. The basketball, last chance you, uh-huh. great stuff. Highly I didn't watch the basketball. I watched all the football. I didn't think they were trash. I mean, it was just it's hard to replicate. That, that dude yelling all the time and cussing. I can't, I can't uh, get with that. Uh, it's about to okay. Run. All right. So, um, <laughs> you know, this is a guy who – this past season really kind of, you know, just took off. I mean, he didn't get a whole lot of looks out of high school, went the JUCO route to kind of improve his stock. He's a Mississippi kid, went to, obviously went to East Mississippi, as Tommy pointed out. Um, 6'1", 180 pounds, very long. You watch his highlights, it's just a bunch of plays where he's just swatting the ball away. He had a dozen pass deflections and a pair of interceptions. I mean, he is exactly what... Charlton Warren looks for in a cornerback. You know the press corner. You're talking about what we mentioned earlier about Storm Duck. 
you know, he's a guy who definitely, when you watch his film, plays a lot better when he's up on the receiver and able to get his hands on the receiver and kind of manipulate and control the receiver, um, you know, as he goes through his route and keep his, keep his hands on him, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, he, he was a guy who, from his recruitment standpoint, I mean, really, a, a month ago, we knew nothing about him. UNC didn't offer him until earlier this month. Because of East Mississippi's schedule, which went all the way until last a week ago, last Wednesday, they played in a, um, in a championship game. Last Wednesday, they lost. He wasn't able to take any recruiting visits, so he, he's, he did back-to-back trips, one to NC State. Fortunately, he didn't gotta have to go too far to go to North Carolina. NC State thought he had him in the bag. Someone in the chat, I can't verify this, but someone in the chat did say that there was a belief that he committed to NC State on Sunday and then switched his commitment to North Carolina on Monday. That kind of does match up with some of the other stuff I was hearing. NC State felt pretty confident in getting him. Um, North Carolina also did. Obviously, North Carolina's confidence was truthful, and he committed to the Tar Heels on Tuesday and signed on Wednesday. He will add to Charlton Warren and Jason Jones' defensive back room some, some experience, some age, uh, I guess, with age. Well, I, I, have qu- I have questions for you guys on this. Uh, on this guy? Well, just in general on this but so he's coming in he's a corner and I know if you talk to a lot of people they talk about the safety situation being the more dire need and I think North Carolina probably is still going to try to address that through the portal but I mean this is a guy this is not a high school kid so it's important to recognize this kid is coming in and he mentioned it he's coming in with the intents of playing and not unrealistic you know oblivious high school kid thinking he's going to play and then doesn't even see the field at all this is a legitimate like he is ready physically mentally how does if we were to say this kid's going to play for North Carolina next season how does this secondary kind of shake out you want to get I I mean from my perspective Carolina assuming Eliza Hussey is is still there which Mm -hmm. that's the belief Carolina needs to figure out a way to get him over the corner Mm -hmm. Um, because I think he provides you a lockdown corner I think Marcus Allen is another guy that we didn't really talk about a lot uh, because he didn't get challenged a lot. Tayon Holloway was the one that was picked on the most. He he moved on in the portal. Monty Chapman, Virginia Tech, number nine. Um, that I remember when he ran out there the first game of the season, people thought it was Tez Walker um, because they wear the same. But I, you know, I think safety is the most in, is in dire need at North Carolina. I mean, Will Hardy's played some. He was. He was not healthy at all this year. Um, Biggers is gone, I guess. Don Chapman's gone. We've talked about Stick Lane, I think, is a quality thing. How good is DeAndre Boykins returning a- at the star position? Greg, wh- what do you think here? I think I think the corners are fine for North Carolina. I think Stewart bolsters that one. I think there are issues there more in the middle. Yeah, I agree with everything Tommy said there. And just to kind of lay it out to, to put the starkness in view, I mean, these are the guys that North Carolina is losing that played a lot of reps last year. Monty Chapman, Gio Biggers, uh, Don Chapman, DJ Jones, Teon Holloway, and then, of course, Derek Allen, who transferred to Georgia Tech, really didn't provide much. That's a lot of bodies and guys who played a lot of snaps. Now we can talk about their effectiveness. <laughs> but I'm always one that believes it starts up front. And if your defensive line is not consistently productive, you're going to get exposed on the back end. Um, so you've got to replace those guys, which means there's a lot of playing time. We know Ant Lane's coming back. But, again, he's the smaller guy. Is he a guy – that you can count on being your number one option at one of the safety positions. Mm -hmm. That remains to be seen. Will Hardy shown potential, but as you mentioned, he was hurt pretty much all year. Can he step into a key role uh, and do what you need him to do? We don't know that. And then even when you start talking about cornerback, Holloway I think was a big loss Mm -hmm. because even even though he may not have been your – 1A or 1B guy at cornerback, he played a lot of snaps. And I thought he he showed potential. Um, he had some some youthful mistakes, which is to be expected. But I think he was a guy that down the road could be a re- very 
solid I, quarterback. I, I agree one. with that. Yeah, I and I think I, I think that South Carolina game happened at a bad time for yeah. him. Why? Because yeah. that guy was good, Xavier Leggett. Yeah. yeah. He was going to toast a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. But he's cooking a young guy, and so you got confidence issues right out of the gate, which is never a good thing. Yeah. But I do agree, Holloway, for all his troubles, uh, I think that's a loss. So, so now when we start looking about looking at what's coming back that we have our, our known quantities – I think Marcus Allen certainly fits in that mold. Elijah Huzzy, Huzzy for sure. Um, DeAndre Boykins looked good at times last year. Mm-hmm. And you would think he slots into the, the starting position at the start, but he's been gone a year. And then Ant Lane as a, as a reserve. And that's it. That's it. Yep. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. If As a guy coming in who's not a true freshman in the high school sense – um, I think there's there's playing time available. And it, it does. It gets back to your point of where does Elijah Huzzy slot? Do they keep him or do they keep him where they want him at cornerback? And that changes the, the calculus there a little bit because now you've got Huzzy and Allen who are known contributors, and maybe that factors into what Stewart wants to do um, or where they want him. But if you want to keep him at star, maybe you move Boykins to safety. Yeah, I think there's going to be a lot of toying around in the spring to see where some of these guys slot. Yeah, you got to get the best guys on the field um, one way or another. And, and I think Huzzy, I think Huzzy's another one of those guys that wore down over the course of the season. Yeah. Playing a ton of the, – the star position can be a really, really physical position. Yeah. Um, especially the way Carolina plays it. You know, Boykins has his limitations. Fully healthy, he has his limitations. Jason Staples would talk about those a lot. Um, you know, Stick Lane, you know, of all his limita- his limitations are something he can't help, and, and that's size. And so I think it'll be interesting to see where Stewart comes in. Can Stewart play that third corner slash slot spot? Because if he could, and then you could go Huzzy, Marcus Allen, and then Stewart in there, I think, I think that is really good. I think where Huzzy goes or where Huzzy plays ultimately is the key here. But also, you got to get the safeties up to speed as well. I mean, a lot of people in the chat said Malcolm Ziegler can play right away. I mean, that's a tough ask. Yeah, I and maybe maybe I mean maybe they throw him out there. I I don't know if he's ready because as I mentioned, he's not. I think. As far as ready, you're probably looking at some of these other guys. Ziegler, I think, still needs to develop. And maybe maybe that happens. I mean, he's already on campus and already practicing with the team, and so maybe that happens then. But I, I think that um, – I don't know if, if he's ready for that yet. He definitely has the ceiling to be an unbelievable safety for North Carolina, but I think he's going to need some time to develop. Uh, just to kind of tie it back – you traditionally, and I don't know if this necessarily applies to Stewart, but Warren loved to target tall corners, and the thinking being, we'll try them at corner. If they don't work a corner, we'll move them to safety. It's an easy transition. You can't go vice versa. I don't know if this applies to a Juco kid, so it's going to be interesting to see, but that could be in play here. But if you're thinking they add a safety through the portal – and depending on who that is, that makes the safety position look a lot better. And then you potentially have four guys to rotate at those three, you know, corner, including the star position in there. You know, but you, you can, as you mentioned, you can rotate DeAndre and, um, and Huzzy at that star position and just kind of, you know, and then play Huzzy some at corner. You know what I mean? And just kind of mm-hmm. rotate that out to kind of keep guys fresher. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to have bodies there, too, and you have to have capable bodies because a lot of people say, like, for instance, North Carolina's wide receiver room. I mean, look how deep this room is. They can go seven or eight deep and blah, blah, blah. And then by the end of the season, yeah, they were play. they were playing the same three guys, yeah. 70, 80 snaps. I think the same thing. You don't rotate as much in the defensive backfield, but you need – three, four, five guys, and you need guys that can cover. And and that's an important thing because Carolina's, or at least under Gene Chiswick, would put safeties in position that they had they needed to cover. And 
you know, it worked some, it didn't. I mean, I, I'll never forget the App State game two years ago. I was in the end zone there watching that game, and there wasn't anybody covering anybody. And the safeties, I mean, granted, it all goes back to the defensive line, but, I mean, it, you got to have guys that can at least match up a little bit back there, and it helps. Which goes to uh, to the question somebody said, Tyler Woods asked, is Stewart a corner or safety? Well, that's the – that's the figuring out process. Yeah, so I think I think if we if we have to label him, he's a corner. But I think that we're going to see some figuring things out this spring into the summer on how the secondary ultimately looks. Yeah, the they're other, talking about Caleb Cost too. So Caleb Cost will get a shot at the star here. Yeah, in the bowl and game. then also you know the other thing that we haven't mentioned that they talked about a lot is Trey Miller, who was a yeah. guy that I actually had, not this class, obviously, last class I had as my immediate contributor, which never, which which I failed with. But um, the reason why, you know, he was injured in my in my defense. But um, the, uh, the reason why I liked him was because he had played at a bunch of different high schools mm -hmm. at a high level. Mm -hmm. um, he played at IMG for, you know, it was a spring, but those practices at IMG, are you, the competition you're seeing is way better than what you're going to get on a typical Friday night. And um, he also played in Oklahoma and played at one of the bigger schools in Alabama um, and was a true cover corner. And I know I noticed yesterday that they were talking a bunch about him getting a, a lot of reps during uh, the bowl game, which I think would be pretty you know, a good thing. Is this current? Was that, were they current tweets? Yeah. Um, which goes back to the question I asked earlier: Why would you go to Florida? But anyway, uh, but um, well, so my, my my speaking of which, my question to you guys though is: How much of this stuff matters if we don't know who the coordinator is and potentially the position coaches and all that yeah. sort of stuff? I don't know. I, I mean, that's there's there's a lot of dynamics in college football now, um, Carolina specifically because of the coaching. And who's going to be the guy uh, coordinating all this? And also, who going to be the player? Because the portal is still a thing. Which somebody asked, is Carolina done in the portal? I, I do not think so. No, they they hope to add more to it. And I think there's always, I think um, maybe we hear some. There's not a whole lot of guys that they're currently pursuing. But with each bowl game. The expectation is additional guys go in after the bowl game, and then there's obviously there's some situations where guys wait until they actually get done with classes and or start the spring semester or whatever. And then there's guys who could do the stick lane thing where they need to graduate and they need that spring semester to graduate, so they wait until May to enroll. So there's still some other opportunities here, and there's definitely some needs that they're targeting. I think we have more than enough data available, and North Carolina fans should know this better than most. If you, if you retain coaches for the purpose of keeping players, I can't think of a situation where that has ever proven beneficial. Yeah. I mean, Carl Torbush was kept because the players wanted him to stay back in 98. Mm -hmm. um, I, you've got to have your coaching staff in place. They have to be effective for you to have success. Do players matter? Of course they matter. But if the infrastructure is not in place, they really don't matter. Yeah. You have to have to have a plan in place. You have to have the coaches there to execute the plan and then you find players to fit into that plan. It can't work any other way. I I agree. I, I mean, the point about it, you know, players can revolt and coaches can be removed. But players can also unite and coaches can be kept. And it never works out really either way. You yeah. Know, so but um, I will say that nowadays, like coaching changes with the transfer portal and the, the sped up calendar, like, you know, the the situation that uh, what's his name is walking into at Texas A&M um, with all those losing all those guys to the portal. I mean, it's just. It's, it's a total it's crap nuts. show. Yeah. But the thing is, what the portal taketh, the portal can giveth. Yes. As well, it works both ways, yeah. especially at a place like Texas A and M. Yeah, you would hope. I just don't know if the portal is as deep and plentiful as a lot of people think it is. You know, there there clearly are some. You can get some really good players out of the portal. I just don't know if it's deep enough. Like, 
Deion Sanders, I think, has learned is that, you know. Don't get me started on Deion. <laughs> I mean. Had I knew that would be a guy that you well, didn't like. Well, I just, no. I mean, I think the thing is. I got like, his autograph, too. He's, uh. Oh, he did great. He won four games with a team that won one. There was no nothing about that team was the well, same. Well, but the, the moral of that story is you cannot build your lines unless you, you – you cannot get a decent offensive line or defensive line out of the portal unless yeah. you're the big dogs. Well, even so, I don't think that you can – You can't build them. You can get you, one or two. Yeah, you can get one or two. You can plug a hole. You can supplement. But it yeah. also shows you that um, – uh oh, what does that mean? It also shows you that um, the – the cutoff? It could mean that the – I have to record. In, never mind. We won't get into all that. Um, but, uh, I mean, Travis Hunter might be the best player in college football. And then Shador is a really good player also. But you have r two really good players, and it just doesn't matter because your offensive and defensive lines are terrible. Are terrible. And we're talking a lot about – Defensive backs and safeties and corners mm -hmm. for North Carolina. And if, if the defensive line doesn't perform better next year, even with the schedule, I think there's I think there's probably six wins that are built in next year on Carolina's schedule. If that defensive line's not figured out, um, will it even matter? Because it certainly didn't matter to have a quote-unquote generational quarterback to, yeah. to step over I haven't even edge. looked at the schedule next year. And uh, – let me ask you a couple more of these questions. Tony Smith, this is a little fun hypothetical question. Who's a better prospect? Uh, Tony Smith asked Don, Steve, or oh, excuse me, Jordan Shipp <coughs> or Andre Green? Um, I mean, I, I don't know if that's a fair question at this point. I mean, I still probably would go with Andre Green. I still kind of believe in him. I think he has the speed, you know, the, the big playability and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I think right now we're looking at a situation where you know he he couldn't you know he couldn't get it figured out in North Carolina for whatever reason. Um, so purely from a prospect standpoint, and I'm just considering what I know of of each of them coming out of high school, their film, what they did, their intangibles. I still would go with Andre Green. That doesn't mean that Jordan Ship. I'm a huge Jordan. You're not going to find a bigger Jordan Ship fan other than his mom who we were kind of talking, we were debating on if I was a bigger fan than her. But I, I did say I think you are a bigger fan than me. But um, besides that, you're not going to find a bigger Jordan Chip fan than myself. But, I mean, I think you know, there was a reason why Andre Green was, was so heavily coveted by a lot of different schools, including Clemson, which, who does a pretty good job recruiting receivers. So given that you were a big fan of Culliver last year uh -huh. and you feel similar, I guess, about Shep, it sounds like you, you feel pretty confident in this wide receiver room moving forward. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, to be honest, I've always felt pretty confident about this wide receiver room, and I was kind of, you know, surprised a little bit, but I guess it was the right move in hindsight by the fact that they took two out of the portal last year. Um, but I guess it makes sense because uh, clearly they were seeing what they were seeing in practice with Andre Green and, and, and some of the others. But, yeah, I mean, I, I think it goes back to opportunity. And the few opportunities Culliver has received, he has shined. And so I think the more opportunities he's going to get, the more we're going to see that. I mean, because he, similar to Ziegler, very raw, didn't run true routes. But basically, he played at Maiden High School, small school. They played against schools that had no idea how to defend the pass. And so it was a lot of, um, you know, chuck and duck sort of football going on out there. And he is just – he just out athleted everybody all the time on Friday nights. Play a lot of DB, you know. But definitely the talent is there. Needs to develop. So I, I think pretty highly of him. Ship I think is yeah. I mean I think to be honest, if Ship plays any next season, I think he's going to make an impact. I just think I, I just that kid's mentality is just on a completely different level. And so I, I, he's a kid who especially he's probably too young for this. But like in the high school level. Man, if I need a freaking first down, I'm looking to him. I just feel like he's going to – whatever it is, whether it's making a tough grab or fighting for the extra yardage, my confidence is in him and doing what needs to be done. And the, the other question I have for you, sticking on the, the wide receiver front, um, we talk about, you know, like the Carolina State games, for example, really not mattering that much to recruits. 
guess my question is what does matter? And what I'm basing that on is <coughs> Carolina's had these stud wide receivers. Chris Culliver didn't play very much this past year. But you look at that UNC NC State game, and State didn't have near the <coughs> personnel wide receiver that Carolina has. Yet Kevin Concepcion, they built that offense around yeah. him. Yeah, and that's something that happened throughout the season, not just immediately. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. They uh, Toward the end of the year, he became the guy for that offense. How much does that type of thing factor in on the recruiting trail when a young guy like that is like – the primary option for an offense the way Concepcion was for Robert and I. So I, I still think I, I still think that the three most important factors for recruits, one location, because we do we do not we don't see kids from North Carolina very often going to schools in California. Okay. And so basically the closer you are to his to a school, the more likely you are to go to that school. Um, comfort and this goes into the coaching staff and how how frequently you visit the school, that sort of thing. I mean, we all have done the whole college. Well, Tom, I, I guess, Tommy, you probably just picked North Carolina and that was it. But I think most people, they go through the process. It was ordained. They, they, they visit schools, and there's just certain schools you feel comfortable at, you know. Um, and then the other aspect is perception of that school. And we mm -hmm. talked about it earlier, and Tommy and I talked about it a lot in our podcast – like a school like Miami who hasn't done squat in God knows how many, how many years still has that prestige. Florida, even though they're fans, what were you showing? The, uh, well, it was brutal today, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah they're going nuts. The but they, uh, they, did they fire someone? My expectations were low, but holy. Uh, yeah. But um, <laughs> they're, they still, there's still that perception of, of Florida. So th those are the three items that I think matter most. Now, to answer your question, yeah, I think it. I think it makes it easier for NC State, you know. And and could this have factored in with Keenan Jackson? Sure. I think there were some other, you know, potential money things or whatever. That's the kind of the word on the street. I don't. I am not reporting that. I'm just, you know, relaying what I've read elsewhere that seems to have some a little bit of validity at least. Um, but you know, to say to, if you are NC State's coaches, and I actually got into this. Um, debate with someone on the message board you know we will play you and they're and they're saying well North Carolina will pass well we played look at what Casey did this past year look at what Chris Culliver did look at Chris Culliver's ranking look at Casey's ranking who played more and all this sort of stuff who do you think is more likely to play now some, the, the person responded and said something oh well because they had Tez Walker blah blah well yeah, that actually works against North Carolina because if you think about it, then they say, well, yeah, they had someone ahead of them, but they brought that guy in. So, um, and that's what's going to be interesting, I think, with um, the portal stuff and high school stuff, um, which I don't think has really been a factor yet, but some of these schools using that against some other schools. But in general, is, do I think a kid is going to choose? No, I, I think those three other items outweigh everything else, but I do think that um, it's definitely a tool that could help. Well, I mean, it also matters, like, uh, Carolina's got a pretty good running back. Yeah. And there was running backs available in the portal. Yeah. And those running backs don't want to come to Carolina to be second fiddle to a stud. Um, and, and a lot of people say, well, why didn't so-and-so play more? Well, who you take off the field? Yeah. And, and so it's all that all that kind of stuff you have to work out. Don, I'm going to ask you one last question, and then we can wrap this up. It's oh, man, it's almost five, noon. Uh, we're going on five hours. Yeah, where's the Bojangles lunch? We've had yeah. the breakfast. Last question in the chat um, that I'm going to take. What is your overall summary for this class for North Carolina? I mean, the, the first couple things is, I guess, the size. I mean, it's, it, it's a very large class. It's um, the largest class in, like, 15 years, I think, for North Carolina, which is – it's even more surprising considering that we're in the transfer portal era where people are expecting you to build through the portal, which I don't think will ever be the case. The, the amount of signees, you know, the, the 21, uh, I mean, the, the amount of early enrollees, the 21 guys who are going to be on campus, I think is going to be significant. And if North Carolina can kind of stick to their approach, improve the development, that sort of stuff is going to help out. I think, you know, all of the positions are addressed and in a large amount of number, obviously, because the class is so large, you know, five offensive linemen, six DBs, three um, wide receivers, two tight ends three linebackers, you know, four uh, defensive linemen. 
you know, and a partridge in a pear tree. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, it is, um, they really addressed everything. In a lot of those situations, they, they, they recruited guys that fit their, what they want. You know, we talked about retention. We talked about st- it starts with the guys you bring in. They, they brought in academic guys who have good rankings. Some of them might not be four stars. Some of them are just high three stars. High three stars by 24-7 sports definition when they're doing these evaluations are all-conference players. If you had a team full of all-conference players, you're, you have a really good shot to win the conference. I mean, you know, Wake Forest, now I know they're being, you know, pillaged now, but, you know, they would win a lot of games with, a, with no four stars. I mean, there are a lot of teams that win games with no four stars. And so North Carolina, um, they took the approach of well, let's get guys that, that we, can, we can hold on to and um, that are really good football players and trust our evaluations. Some of those evaluations have already, at least if, you know, I know rankings or whatever, but Jaden Patterson – and Andrew Rosinski, two of the guys that we talked about getting the rankings jump. Those weren't highly recruited guys. Those were highly ranked guys when North Carolina took them. Those guys both were bumped up later to four-star status. Jordan Ship, he had a little bit more buzz, same sort of situation, bumped up eventually to four-star status. So North Carolina's evaluations have been kind of bearing out. There are guys like um, I mentioned um, uh, Ryan Ward. Alabama offered him late in the process. You know, I, I mentioned Rosinski. Um, Auburn tried to steal him at the last minute. Georgia offered Malcolm Ziegler. We, you know, Keenan Jackson. I mean, he was apparently wasn't the first guy that the NC State tried to pluck off North Carolina's you know list. He was the only guy, I guess, that would actually jump. You know, so um, you know, so so I, I think um, overall, I think it, it's going to be really interesting to follow this class to see if North Carolina's evaluations uh, end up being true because ultimately the rankings don't matter really won't matter next year for these guys. But in, in three years, it's going to be interesting to see how much of their evaluations came to fruition. Any thoughts from you guys? Uh, Greg, go ahead, and then I'll wrap it up. I can't say it any better than, than what Don just said, <laughs> so no, I'll leave it there. I'm, I'm not going to do that because I like talking over Don I'll, as much chance as I get. Recruit them, develop them, retain. and retain them now. Yeah. And, and that's the important aspect of college sports. North Carolina gets 27 – new enrollees on top of whatever they get out of the portal of course the johnson and johnson brothers and, and more out of the portal coming uh, blasky the ol from georgia it's just an incredible time in college sports and college football coaches trying to sign them coaches trying to develop them and like i said you got to retain them it's not as easy as it looks sometimes that has been the theme of the five hour show today Shout out to Don for hosting us here at the Man Tower. It is now a beautiful – I think the sun's actually setting now. We've we've, (laughs) we've seen it rise and it sets. Shout out to the – in excess of 300 people that have been in here, most of the chat is all about you guys. That's why we do this is for the Inside Carolina readership and viewers. Um, Shout out to Johnny T-Shirt and Congruity for being sponsors of everything we do. Programming note, uh, Mac will go over to the signing day stuff at 1.30. Um, stay tuned for all the coverage from that. And then there'll be a post game basketball podcast tonight as well after Carolina What's and that? Oklahoma. Myself, John Bowman, Dewey Burke, and Justin Jackson doing the post game podcast after that. Also, there'll be a game plan at some point in the next few days with Greg Barnes, Jason Staples, and myself handling that. And then, of course, Inside Carolina Live ahead of the bowl game next Wednesday at 5.30 from Charlotte. Somebody asked about West Virginia fans. One thing West Virginia people do is they travel. Yeah. And they come straight down, I believe, 77 from West Virginia. And I remember remember 2008, there were so many of those people. Um, I expect it fully to be that way in Charlotte. Chad Scott, former Tar Heel coach and player, is coaching over there in West Virginia. He, uh, He will make the trip back to North Carolina. It's going to be an interesting game, but Carolina... Gets their signees done. Inside Carolina gets their signing class show done. Don Callahan. It's all about you, brother. Get some sleep. Yeah. I appreciate you guys coming out. I'm glad.